Section sixty two of Budenbrokes by Thomas Mann. Translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part six, chapter ten. Tony returned to her bedchamber after dinner. During the meal, her mother had told her that Thomas was aware of her expected arrival, and she did not seem particularly anxious to meet him the consul came at six o'clock he went into the landscape room and had a long talk with his mother how is she he asked how does she seem oh tom i'm afraid she's very determined she's terribly wrought up and this word if i only knew what it was he said i will go up and see her yes do tom but knock softly so as not to startle her and be very calm will you her nerves are upset that is the trouble she has with her digestion she has eaten nothing do talk quietly with her he went up quickly skipping a step in his usual way he was thinking and twisting the ends of his moustache but as he knocked his face cleared he was resolved to handle the situation as long as possible with humor a suffering voice said come in and he opened the door to find frau permanader lying on the bed fully dressed the bed curtains were flung back the down quilt was underneath her back and a medicine bottle stood on the night table she turned round a little and propped her head on her hand looking at him with her pouting smile he made a deep bow and spread out his hands in a solemn gesture well dear lady to what are we indebted for the honour of a visit from this personage from the royal city of oh give me a kiss tom she said sat up to offer him her cheek and then sank back again well how are you my dear boy quite unchanged i see since i saw you in munich you can't tell much about it with the blinds down my dear and you ought not to steal my thunder like that either it is more suitable for me to say he held her hand in his and at the same time drew up a chair beside the bed as i so often have that you and tilda oh for shame tom how is tilda well of course madame krausemintz sees she doesn't starve which doesn't prevent her eating for the week ahead when she comes here on thursday she laughed very heartily as she had not for a long time back in fact then she broke off with a sigh and asked and how is business oh we get on mustn't complain thank goodness here everything is as it should be oh tom i don't feel much like chatting pleasantly about trifles pity one should preserve one's sense of humour quand même all that is at an end tom you know all you know all he repeated he dropped her hand and pushed back his chair goodness gracious how that sounds all what all lies in that all my love and grief i gave thee eh? no listen she was silent she swept him with an astonished and deeply offended glance yes i expected that look he said for without that look you would not be here but dear tony let me take the thing as much too lightly as you take it too seriously you will see we shall compliment each other very nicely too seriously thomas i take it too seriously yes for heaven's sake don't let's make a tragedy of it let us take it in a lower key not with all is at an end and your unhappy antonia don't misunderstand me tony you well know that no one can be gladder than i that you have come I have long wished you would come to us on a visit by yourself without your husband so that we could be en famille together once more but to come now like this my dear child i beg your pardon but it was foolish yes let me finish 
Perminator has certainly behaved very badly, as I will give him to understand pretty clearly. Don't be afraid of that. As to how he has behaved himself, Thomas, she interrupted him, raising herself up to lay a hand upon her breast, so far as that goes, I have already given him to understand that, and not only given him to understand, I can tell you, I am convinced that further discussion with that man is entirely out of place. And she let herself fall back again, and looked sternly and fixedly at the ceiling. He bowed, as if under the weight of her words, and kept on looking down at his knee, and smiling. Well, then, I won't send him a stiff letter. It is just as you say. In the end, it is, after all, your affair, and it is quite enough if you put him in his place. It is your duty as his wife. After all, there are some extenuating circumstances. There was a birthday celebration, and he came home a little bit exalted, so to speak, and was guilty of a false step, an unseemly blunder. Thomas, said she, I do not understand you. I do not understand your tone. You, a man with your principles? But you did not see him. You did not see how drunk he looked. He looked ridiculous enough, I'm sure. But that is it, Tony. You will not see how comic it was. But probably that is the fault of your bad digestion. You caught your husband in a moment of weakness, and you have seen him make himself look ridiculous. But that ought not to outrage you to such an extent. It ought to amuse you a little, perhaps, but bring you closer together as human beings. I will say that I don't mean you could have just let it pass with a laugh and said nothing about it, not at all. You left home. That was a demonstration of a rather extreme kind, perhaps, a bit too severe, but, after all, he deserved it. I imagine he is feeling pretty down in the mouth. I only mean that you must get to take the thing differently, not so insulted, a little more politic point of view. We are just between ourselves. Let me tell you something, Tony. In any marriage, the important thing is on which side the moral ascendancy lies. Understand? Your husband has laid himself open, there's no doubt of that. He compromised himself and made a laughable spectacle. Laughable, precisely because what he did was actually so harmless, so impossible to take seriously. But, after all, his dignity is impaired, and the moral advantage has passed over to you. If you know how to use it wisely, your happiness is assured. If you go back, say in a couple of weeks, certainly I must insist on keeping you for ourselves as long as that, if you go back to Munich in a couple of weeks, you will see... I will not go back to Munich, Thomas. I beg your pardon, he asked, putting his hand to his ear and screwing up his face as he bent forward. She was lying on her back with her head sunk in the pillow, so that her chin stood out with an effect of severity. Never, she said, and she gave a long, audible outward breath, and cleared her throat, also at length and deliberately. It was like a dry cough, which had of late become almost a habit with her, and had probably to do with her digestive trouble. There followed a pause. Tony, he said suddenly, getting up and slapping his hand on the arm of his chair, you aren't going to make a scandal. She gave a side glance and saw him all pale, with the muscles standing out on his temples. Her position was no longer tenable. She bestirred herself and, to hide the fear she really felt of him, grew angry in her turn. She sat up quickly and put her feet to the floor. With glowing cheeks and a frowning brow, making hasty motions of the head and hands, she began. Scandal, Thomas. You want to tell me not to make a scandal when I have been insulted and people spit in my face? 
is that worthy of a brother you will permit me to ask circumspection tact they are very well in their place but there are limits tom i know just as much of life as you do and i tell you there is a point where the care for appearances leaves off and cowardice begins i am astonished that such a stupid goose as i am have to tell you this yes i am a stupid goose and i should not be surprised if permanator never loved me at all for i am an ugly old woman very likely and babette is certainly prettier than i am but did that give him a right to forget the respect he owed to my family and my upbringing and all my feelings you did not see the way he forgot himself tom and since you did not see it you cannot understand for i can never tell you how disgusting he was you did not hear the word that he called after me your sister when i took my things and went out of the room to sleep on the sofa in the living-room but i heard it and it was a word that a word oh it was that word let me tell you thomas that caused me to spend the whole night packing my trunk to wake erica early in the morning and to leave the place rather than to remain in the neighbourhood of a man who could utter such words and to such a man as i said before i will never never return not so long as i have any self-respect or care in the least what becomes of me in my life on this earth and will you now have the goodness to tell me what this cursed word was yes or no never thomas never would i permit that word to cross my lips i know too well what i owe to you and to myself within these walls then it's no use talking with you that may easily be i am sure i do not want to discuss it any further what do you expect to do get a divorce yes tom such is my firm determination i feel that i owe it to myself my child and my family that is all nonsense of course he said in a dispassionate tone he turned on his heel and moved away as if his words had settled the matter it takes two to make a divorce my child do you think Permanator will just say yes and thank you kindly? The idea is absurd. Oh, you can leave that to me, she said, quite undismayed. You mean he will refuse on account of the seventeen thousand marks current. But Grunlich wasn't willing either, and they made him. There are ways and means, I'm sure. I'll go to Dr. Giesecke. He is Christian's friend, and he will help me. Oh, yes, of course, I know it was not the same thing then. It was incapacity of the husband to provide for his family. You see, I know my way about in these affairs. Dear me, you act as if this were the first time in my life that I got a divorce. But even so, Tom, perhaps there is nothing that applies to this case. Perhaps it is impossible. You may be right. But it is all the same. My resolve is fixed let him keep the money there are higher things in life he will never see me again either way she coughed again she had left the bed and seated herself in an easy chair resting one elbow on its arm her chin was so deeply buried in her hand that her four bent fingers clutched her under lip she sat with her body turned to the right staring with red excited eyes out of the window the consul walked up and down sighed shook his head shrugged his shoulders he paused in front of her fairly wringing his hands you are a child tony a child said he in a discouraged almost pleading tone every word you have spoken is the most utter childish nonsense will you make an effort now if i beg you to think about the thing for just one minute like a grown woman don't you see that you are acting as if something very serious and dreadful had happened to you as if your husband had cruelly betrayed you and heaped insults on you before all the world do try to realize that nothing of the sort has happened 
not a single soul in the world knows anything about that silly affair that happened at the top of your staircase in Calfinger Street. Your dignity, and ours, will suffer no slightest diminution if you go calmly and composedly back to Permanator, of course with your nose in the air. But, on the other hand, if you don't go back, if you give this nonsense so much importance as to make a scandal out of it, then you will be wounding our dignity indeed. She jerked her chin out of her hand and stared him in the face. That's enough, Thomas Booten broke. Be quiet now. It's my turn. Listen so you think there is no shame and no scandal so long as people don't get to hear it ah no the shame that gnaws at us secretly and eats away our self-respect that is far far worse are we budenbrooks the sort of people to be satisfied if everything looks tip-top as you say here on the outside no matter how much mortification we have to choke down inside our four walls. I cannot help feeling astonished at you, Tom. Think of our father and how he would act to-day, and then judge as he would. No, no, clean and open dealings must be the rule. Why, you can open your books any day for all the world to see, and say, here they are, look at them. We should all of us be just the same. I know how God has made me. I am not afraid. Let Julken Mullendorf pass me in the street and not speak if she wants to. Let Fifi Budenbroek sit here on Thursday afternoons and shake all over with spite, and say, well, that is the second time, but of course both times the men were to blame. I feel so far above all that now, Thomas, farther than I can tell you i know i have done what i thought was right but if i am to be so afraid of julken mullendorf and fifi budenbroek as to swallow down all sorts of insults and let myself be cursed out in a drunken dialect that isn't even grammar to stop with a man in a town where i have to get used to that kind of language and the kind of scenes i saw that night at the top of the stairs where i have to forget my origin and my upbringing and everything that i am and learn to disown it altogether in order to act as if i were satisfied and happy that is what i call undignified that is what i call scandalous i tell you she broke off buried her chin once more in her hand and stared out of the window he stood before her, his weight on one leg, his hands in his trousers' pockets. His eyes rested on her, unseeing, for he was in deep thought, and slowly moving his head from side to side. Tony, he said, you're telling the truth. I knew it all along, but you betrayed yourself just now. It is not the man at all it is the place it isn't this other idiotic business it is the whole thing altogether you couldn't get used to it tell the truth thomas she cried it is the truth she sprang up as she spoke and pointed straight into his face with her outstretched hand her own face was red she stood there in a warlike pose one hand grasping the chair gesticulating with the other and made a long agitated passionate speech that welled up in a resistless tide the consul stared at her amazed scarcely would she pause to draw breath when new words would come gushing and bubbling forth yes she found words for everything she gave full expression to all the accumulated disgust of her munich years unassorted confused she poured it all out one thing after another she kept nothing back it was like the bursting of a dam an assertion of desperate integrity something elemental a force of nature that brooked no restraint it is the truth 
she cried say it again thomas oh i can tell you plainly i am no stupid goose any longer i know what i have to expect i don't faint away at my time of life to hear that dirty work goes on now and then i've known people like thierry trishka and i was married to bendix grunlich and i know the dissipated creatures there are here in this town i am no country innocent i tell you and the affair with babette wouldn't have made me go off the handle like that just by itself no thomas the thing was that it filled the cup to overflowing and that didn't take much for it was full already and had been for a long time a long time it would have taken very little to make it run over and then this happened the knowledge that i could not depend on parmenader even in that way that put the top on everything it knocked the bottom out of the cask it brought to a head all at once my intention to get away from munich that had been slowly growing in my mind a long time before that tome for i cannot live down there i swear it before god and all his heavenly hosts how wretched i have been thomas you can never know when you were there on a visit i concealed everything for i am a tactful woman and do not burden others with my complainings nor wear my heart on my sleeve on a weekday i have always been rather reserved but i have suffered tom suffered with my entire being with my whole personality so to speak like a plant a flower that has been transplanted into a foreign soil if i may make such a comparison you will probably find it a most unsuitable one for i am really an ugly old woman but i could not be planted in a more foreign soil than that and i would just as lief go and live in turkey oh we should never be transplanted we northern folk we should stick to the shore of our own bay we can only really thrive upon our native soil you all used to laugh at my taste for the nobility yes in these years i have often thought of what somebody said to me once in times gone by a very clever man your sympathies are with the nobility he said shall i tell you why because you yourself belong to the nobility your father is a great gentleman and you are a princess a gulf lies between you and the rest of us who do not belong to the governing classes yes tom we feel like the nobility and we realize the difference we should never try to live where we are not known where no one understands our worth for we shall have nothing but chagrin and be laughed at for our arrogance yes they all found me ridiculously arrogant they did not say so but i felt it every minute and that made me suffer too do you think i feel arrogant tom in a place where they eat cake with a knife and the very princes speak bad grammar and if a gentleman picks up a lady's fan it is supposed to be a love affair get used to it to people without dignity morals energy ambition self-respect or good manners lazy and frivolous stupid and shallow at the same time no never never as long as i am a budenbroke and your sister eva ivers managed it but eva is not a budenbroke and she has a husband that amounts to something it was different with me you think back tom from the very beginning i come from a home where people work and get things accomplished and have a purpose in life and i go down there to permanator and he sits himself down with my dowry oh that was genuine enough that was characteristic but it was the only good thing there was about it and then i was going to have a baby that would have made everything up to me and what happens it dies i don't blame permanator for that of course i don't mean that god forbid he did everything he could and he didn't go to the cafe for several days but after all it belonged to the same thing it made me no happier as you can well believe but i didn't give in and i didn't grumble i was alone 
and misunderstood and pointed at for being arrogant but i said to myself you yielded him your consent for life he is lumpy and lazy and he caused you a cruel disappointment but his heart is pure and he means well and then i had to bear the sight of him in that last unspeakable minute and i said to myself he understands you no better and respects you no more and no less than the others do and he calls you names that one of our workmen up here wouldn't throw at a dog i knew then that nothing bound me to him any more and that it was an indignity for me to stay when i was driving from the station this afternoon i passed nielsen the porter and he took off his hat and made me a deep bow and i bowed back to him not arrogantly not a bit i waved my hand just the way father used to and here i am you can do what you like you can harness up all your workhorses but you can never drag me back to munich again and to-morrow i go to giesecke thus she spoke and finishing sank back exhausted in her chair and stared again out of the window tom was alarmed shaken stupefied he stood before her and found no words he raised his arms up shoulder high drawing a long breath then he let them fall against his thighs well that's an end of it he said his voice was calm and he turned and went toward the door her face wore now the same expression the same half pouting half injured smile as when he entered tom she said with a rising inflection are you vexed with me he held the oval doorknob in one hand and made a gesture of weary protest with the other oh no not at all she put out her hand and tipped her head on one side come here tom your poor sister has had a hard time life is hard on her she has much to bear and at this minute she has nobody in all the world he came back he took her hand but wearily indifferently not looking at her face suddenly her lip began to quiver you must go on alone now she said there's nothing good to be looked for from christian and i am finished failed gone to pieces i can do no more i am a poor useless woman dependent on you all for my living i could never have dreamed tom that i should be no help to you at all now you stand quite alone and upon you it depends to keep up the honor and dignity of the family may god help you in the task two large clear childish tears rolled down over her cheeks which were beginning to show very faintly the first signs of age end of section sixty two Section sixty three of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann. Translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part six. Chapter eleven. Tony lost no time. She went resolutely about her affair. In the hope of quieting her, of bringing her slowly to a different frame of mind, the consul said but little he asked only one thing that she should be very quiet and stop entirely in the house and erica as well perhaps it would blow over the town did not need to know the family thursday afternoon was put off on some pretext but on the very next day she wrote to dr giesecke and summoned him to meng street she received him alone in the middle corridor room on the first floor where a fire was laid and she had arranged a heavy table with ink and writing materials and a quantity of foolscap paper from the office they sat down in two easy chairs dr giesecke said tony 
she folded her arms flung back her head and looked at the ceiling while she spoke you are a man of experience both professionally and personally i can speak openly with you and thereupon she revealed to him the whole story about babette and what had happened in her sleeping chamber dr giesecke regretted being obliged to explain to her that neither the affair on the stairs nor the insult she had undoubtedly received the precise nature of which she hesitated to divulge was sufficient ground for a divorce very good she said thank you and then at her request he gave an exposition of the existing legal grounds for divorce and an even longer discourse after it which had for its subject matter the law touching dowry rights she listened with open mind and strained attention and then with cordial thanks dismissed dr giesecke for the time being she went downstairs and demanded audience of her brother in his private office thomas she said please write to the man at once i do not like to mention his name as far as the money goes i am perfectly informed on that subject let him speak me he shall never see again whatever he decides if he agrees to a divorce we will ask him to give an accounting and restore my dose if he refuses we need not be discouraged for as you probably know permenader's right to my dose is legally speaking a property right we grant that but on the other hand thank goodness i have certain material rights on my side the consul walked up and down with his hands behind his back his shoulders twitching nervously tony's face as she uttered the word dose was too unutterably self-satisfied he had no time heaven knew he had no time let her have patience and wait and bethink herself a hundred times his nearest duty was a journey to hamburg indeed he must go the very next day for the purpose of a personal interview with christian christian had written for help for money which would have to come out of the frau consul's inheritance his business was in frightful condition he was in constant difficulties yet he seemed to amuse himself royally and went everywhere to theatres restaurants and concert halls to judge from the debts now coming to light which he had been able to pile up on the credit of his family name he had been living far far beyond his means and they knew in meng street and at the club yes the whole town knew who was responsible it was a certain female a certain aline Poufogl, who lived alone with her two pretty children christian was not the only hamburg business man who possessed her favors and spent money on her in short tony's intentions in the matter of her divorce were not the only dark spot in the consul's sky and the journey to hamburg was pressing besides it was altogether likely that they would hear from herr permenader the consul went to hamburg and came back angry and depressed no word had come from munich and he felt obliged to take the first step he wrote wrote rather coldly with curt condescension to this effect antonia during her life with permenader had been subjected to great disappointments that would not be denied without going into detail it was evident that she could never find happiness in this marriage her wish that it should be dissolved must be justified to the mind of any reasonable person and her determination not to return to munich was entirely unshakable and he put the question as to what were herr permenator's feelings in view of the facts which he had just stated there were more days of suspense and then came herr permenator's reply he answered as no one had expected him to answer not dr giesecke nor the frau consul nor thomas nor antonia herself he agreed quite simply to a divorce 
he wrote that he deeply regretted what had happened but that he respected antonia's wishes as he saw that he and she had never hit it off if it were true that she had suffered during those years through him he begged her to forget and forgive as he would probably never see her and erica again he sent them both his hearty good wishes for all happiness on this earth and he signed himself alois permanader in a postscript he offered to make immediate restitution of the dowry he had enough without it to lead a life free from care he did not require to have notice given for business there was none to wind up the house belonged to him and the money was ready any time tony felt a slight twinge of shame and was almost inclined for the first time to admit that herr permanader's indifference to money matters might have something good about it now it was dr giesecke's turn again he communicated with the husband and a plea of mutual incompatibility was set up as ground for the divorce the hearing began tony's second divorce case she talked about it night and day and the consul lost his temper several times tony was in no state to share his feelings she was entirely taken up with words like tangibilities improvabilities accessions productivity dowry rights and the like which she used in season and out of season with marvellous fluency her shoulders slightly raised one point in dr giesecke's long disquisitions had made a great impression on her it had to do with treasure found in any piece of property that had constituted part of a dowry which was to be regarded as a component part of the dowry to be liquidated if the marriage came to an end about this treasure which was of course non-existent she talked to every soul she knew ida jungmann uncle eustace poor clotilde the broad street budenbrokes and they when they heard how matters stood just folded their hands in their laps and looked at each other in speechless joy that this satisfaction too had been vouchsafed them theresa weichbrot was told of it erica had gone to stay at the pension again and madame kettelson too though this last for more than one reason understood not a single word then came the day when the divorce was pronounced when the last formalities were gone through and tony asked thomas for the family papers and set down this last event with her own hand yes it was done all that remained was to get used to it she did it gallantly she bore with unscathed dignity the tiny dagger thrusts of the ladies from broad street she met the hagenstroms and mullendorfs on the street and looked with chilling indifference straight over their heads and she quite gave up going into society the more easily that it had for some years past forsaken her mother's house for her brother's she had her own immediate family the frau consul tom and gerda she had ida jungmann and her motherly friend sesame weichbrot and she had erica upon whose future she probably built her own last secret hopes and upon whose aristocratic upbringing she expended much care and thought thus she lived and thus time went on later in some way that was never quite clear there came to certain members of the family knowledge of that word the desperate word which had escaped from herr permanader on that never-to-be-forgotten night what was it then that he had said go to the devil you filthy sprat-eating slut and thus tony budenbroek's second marriage came to an end End of section 63
Section sixty four of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann. Translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part seven, chapter one. A christening, a christening in Broad Street. All, everything is there that was dreamed of by Madame Permanader in the days of her expectancy. In the dining room, the maid servant, moving noiselessly so as not to disturb the services in the next room, is filling the cups with steaming hot chocolate and whipped cream. There are quantities of cups crowded together on the great round tray with the gilded shell-shaped handles and anton the butler is cutting a towering layer cake into slices and mamselle jungmann is arranging flowers and sweets in silver dessert dishes with her head on one side and both little fingers stuck out soon the company will have seated themselves in the salon and sitting-room and all these delicacies will be handed round it is to be hoped they will hold out since it is the whole family which has gathered here in the broader if not quite in the broadest sense of the word for it is through the ouverdiques connected distantly with the kistenmachers and through them with the mullendorfs and so on one simply must draw the line somewhere but the ouverdiques are represented and indeed by no less a personage than the head of the family the venerable dr caspar ouverdique reigning burgomaster more than eighty years old he came in a carriage and mounted the steps leaning on his staff and thomas budenbroke's arm his presence enhances the dignity of the occasion and beyond a question this occasion is worthy of every dignity for within in the salon there is a flower-decked small table serving as an altar with a young priest in black vestments and a stiff snowy ruff like a millstone round his neck reciting the service and there is a great strapping particularly well-nourished person richly arrayed in red and gold bearing upon her billowing arms a small something half smothered in laces and satin bows an heir a first-born son a budenbroke do we really grasp the meaning of the fact can we realize the thrill of that first whisper that first little hint that travelled from broad street to mengstrasse or frau permanader's speechless ecstasy as she embraced her mother her brother and very gently her sister-in-law and now with the spring the spring of the year eighteen sixty one he has come he the heir of so many hopes whom they have expected for so many years talked of him longed for him prayed to god and tormented dr grabo for him at length he has come and looks most unimposing his tiny hands play among the gilt trimmings of his nurse's waist his head in a lace cap trimmed with pale blue ribbons lies sidewise on the pillow turned heedlessly away from the preacher he stares out into the room at all his relatives with an old knowing look those eyes under their long lashed lids blend the light blue of the father's and the brown of the mother's iris into a pale indefinite changeful golden brown but bluish shadows lie in the deep corners on both sides of the nose and these give the little face which is hardly yet a face at all an aged look not suited to its four weeks of existence but please god they mean nothing for has not his mother the same and she is in perfectly good health and anyhow he lives he lives and is a son which was the cause four weeks ago for great rejoicing he lives and it might have been otherwise the consul will never forget the grip of good dr grabo's hand as he said to him four weeks ago when he could leave the mother and child give thanks to god my dear friend there wasn't much to spare the consul has not dared to ask his meaning 
he put from him in horror the thought that his son this tiny creature yearned for in vain so many years had slipped into the world without breath to cry out almost almost like antonia's second daughter but he knows that that hour four weeks ago was a desperate one for mother and child and he bends tenderly over gerda who reclines in an easy chair in front of him next his mother her feet in patent leather shoes crossed before her on a velvet cushion how pale she still is and how strangely lovely in her pallor with that heavy dark red hair and those mysterious eyes that rest upon the preacher in half-veiled mockery herr andreas prinxheim pastor marianus succeeded thus young to the headship of st mary's after old cooling's sudden death he holds his chin in the air and his hands prayerfully folded beneath it he has short curly blond hair and a smooth shaven bony face with a somewhat theatrical range of expression from fanatical zeal to an exalted serenity he comes from franconia where he has been for some years serving a small lutheran community among catholics and his effort after a clear and moving delivery has resulted in exaggerated mannerisms an r rolled upon his front teeth and long obscure or crudely accented vowel sounds he gives thanks to god in a voice now low and soft now loud and swelling and the family listen frau permanator clothed in a dignity that hides her pride and her delight erica grunlich now almost fifteen years old a blooming young girl with a long braid and her father's rosy skin and christian who has arrived that morning and sits letting his deep-set eyes rove from side to side all over the room pastor tubertius and his wife have not shrunk from the long journey but have come from riga to be present at the ceremony the ends of zivert tubertius's long thin whiskers are parted over his shoulders and his small gray eyes now and then open wider and wider most unexpectedly and grow larger and more prominent till they almost jump out of his head clara's gaze is dark and solemn and severe and she sometimes lifts her hand to a head that always seems to ache but they have brought a splendid present to the Budenbrooks, a huge brown bear stuffed in a standing position a relative of the pastor's shot him somewhere in the heart of russia and now he stands below in the vestibule with a card tray between his paws the krugers have their son jurgen visiting them he is a post-office official in rostock a quiet simply dressed man where jacob is nobody knows but his mother who was an overdeek she poor weak woman secretly sells the household silver to send money to the disinherited son and the ladies budenbroke are there deeply rejoiced over the happy family event which does not prevent fifi from remarking that the child looks rather unhealthy a view which the frau consul born stuving and likewise friederica and henrietta feel bound to endorse but poor clotilde lean gray resigned and hungry is moved by the words of pastor prinxheim and the prospect of layer cake and chocolate the guests not belonging to the family are herr friedrich wilhelm marcus and sesame weichbrot now the pastor turns to the godparents and instructs them in their duty eustace kruger is one consul budenbroke refused at first to ask him why invite the old man to commit a piece of folly he says he has frightful scenes with his wife every day over jacob their little property is slowly melting away out of pure worry he is even beginning to be careless in his dress 
but you know what will happen if we ask him he will send the child a heavy gold service and refuse to be thanked for it but when uncle eustace heard who was to be asked in his place stefan kistenmacher had been mentioned he was so enormously piqued that they had to ask him after all the gold mug he presented was to thomas's great relief not exaggeratedly heavy and the second godfather it is this dignified old gentleman with the snow-white hair high neckband and soft black broadcloth coat with the red handkerchief sticking out of the back pocket sitting here bent over his stick in the most comfortable armchair in the house it is of course burgomaster dr uverdeek it is a great event a triumph good heavens how could it have come about he is hardly even a relative the budenbrokes must have dragged the old man in by the hair in fact it is rather a feat a little intrigue planned by the consul and madame perminator at first it was merely a joke born of the great relief of knowing that mother and child were safe a boy tony cried the consul he ought to have the burgomaster for godfather but she took it up in earnest whereupon he considered the matter seriously and agreed to make a trial they hid behind uncle eustace and got him to send his wife to her sister-in-law the wife of uverdeek the lumber dealer she accepted the task of preparing the old father-in-law then thomas budenbroek made a visit to the head of the state and paid his respects and the thing was done now the nurse lifts up the child's cap and the pastor cautiously sprinkles two or three drops out of the gilt-lined silver basin in front of him upon the few hairs of little budenbroek as he slowly and impressively names the names with which he is baptizing him justus johann kaspar follows a short prayer and then the relatives file by to bestow a kiss upon the brow of the unconcerned little creature teresa weichbrot comes last to whom the nurse has to stoop with her burden in return for which sesame gives him two kisses that go off with small explosions and says between them you good child three minutes later the guests have disposed themselves in salon and living-room and the sweets are passed even pastor prinxheim the toes of his broad shiny boots showing under his black vestments sits and sips the cool whipped cream off his hot chocolate chatting easily the while and wearing his serene expression which is most effective by way of contrast with his sermon his manner says as plainly as words see how i can lay aside the priest and become the jolly ordinary guest he is a versatile an accommodating sort of man to the frau consul he speaks rather unctuously to thomas and gerda like a man of the world and with frau perminator he is downright jocose making jokes and gesturing fluently now and then whenever he thinks of it he folds his hands in his lap tips back his head glooms his brows and makes a long face when he laughs he draws the air in through his teeth in little jerks suddenly there is a stir in the corridor the servants are heard laughing and in the doorway appears a singular figure come to offer congratulations it is grobleben grobleben from whose thin nose no matter what the time of year there ever hangs a drop which never falls grobleben is a workman in one of the consul's granaries and he has an extra job too at the house as boots every morning early he appears in broad street takes the boots from before the door and cleans them below in the court at family feasts he always appears in holiday attire presents flowers and makes a speech in a whining unctuous voice with the drop pendant from his nose 
for this he always gets a piece of money but that is not why he does it he wears a black coat an old one of the consul's greased leather top boots and a blue woolen scarf round his neck in his wizened red hand he holds a bunch of pale colored roses which are a little past their best and slowly shed their petals on the carpet he blinks with his small red eyes but apparently sees nothing he stands still in the doorway with his flowers held out in front of him and begins straightway to speak the old frau consul nods to him encouragingly and makes soothing little noises the consul regards him with one eyebrow lifted and some of the family frau perminator for instance put their handkerchiefs to their mouths i be a poor man your honour and ladies and gentlemen but i've a feeling hurt and the happiness of my master comes home to me it do seein's he's always been so good to me and so i've come your honour and ladies and gentlemen to congratulate the herr consul and the frau consul and the whole respected family from a full heart and that the child may prosper for that they desire from god and man for such a master as consul budenbroke there aren't so many he's a noble gentleman and our lord will reward him for all splendid grobleben that was a beautiful speech thank you very much grobleben who are the roses for but grobleben has not nearly done he strains his whining voice and drowns the consul out and i say the lord will reward him him and the whole respected family and when his time has come to stand before his throne for stand we all must rich and poor and one'll have a fine polished hardwood coffin and t'other an old box yet all on us must come to mother earth at the last yes we must all come to her at the last to mother earth to mother oh come come grobleben this isn't a funeral it's a christening get along with your mother earth and these be a few flowers concludes grobleben thank you grobleben thank you this is too much what did you pay for them man but i haven't heard such a speech as that for a long time wait a minute here go out and give yourself a treat in honour of the day and the consul puts his hand on the old man's shoulder and gives him a taller here my good man says the frau consul and i hope you love our blessed lord i be lovin him from my heart frau consul that's the holy truth and grobleben gets another taller from her and a third from frau perminator and retires with a bow and a scrape taking the roses with him by mistake except for those already fallen on the carpet the burgomaster takes his leave now and the consul accompanies him down to his carriage this is the signal for the party to break up for gerda budenbroek must rest the old frau consul tony erica and mamselle jungmann are the last to go well ida says the consul i have been thinking it over you took care of us all and when little johann gets a bit older he still has the monthly nurse now and after that he will still need a day nurse i suppose but will you be willing to move over to us when the time comes yes indeed herr consul if your wife is satisfied gerda is content to have it so and thus it is settled in the act of leaving however and already at the door frau perminator turns she comes back to her brother and kisses him on both cheeks and says it has been a lovely day tom i am happier than i have been for years we budenbrokes aren't quite at the last gasp yet thank god and whoever thinks we are is mightily mistaken now that we have little johann it is so beautiful that he is christened johann it looks to me as if quite a new day will dawn for us all end of section sixty four
Section sixty five of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann. Translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part seven. Chapter two. Christian Budenbroek, proprietor of the firm of H. C. F. Burmeister and Company of Hamburg, came into his brother's living room, holding in his hand his modish grey hat and his walking stick with the nun's bust. Tom and Gerda sat reading together. It was half past nine on the evening of the christening day. Good evening said christian oh thomas i must speak with you at once please excuse me gerda it is urgent thomas they went into the dark dining-room where the consul lighted a gas jet on the wall and looked at his brother he expected nothing good except for the first greeting he had had no opportunity to speak with christian but he had looked at him during the service and noted that he seemed unusually serious and even more restless than common in the course of pastor prinksheim's discourse he had left the room for several minutes thomas had not written him since the day in hamburg when he had paid over into his brother's hands an advance of ten thousand marks current on his inheritance to settle his indebtedness just go on as you are going he had said and you'll soon run through all your money as far as i am concerned i hope you will cross my path very little in future you have put my friendship to too hard a test in these three years why was he here now something must be driving him well asked the consul i'm done christian said he let himself down sidewise on one of the high-backed chairs around the dining-table and held his hat and stick between his thin knees may i ask what it is you are done with and what brings you to me said the consul he remained standing i'm done repeated christian shaking his head from side to side with frightful earnestness and letting his little round eyes stray restlessly back and forth he was now thirty-three years old but he looked much older his reddish-blond hair had grown so thin that nearly all the cranium was bare his cheeks were sunken the cheek-bones protruded sharply and between them naked fleshless and gaunt stood the huge hooked nose if it were only this he went on and ran his hand down the whole of his left side very close but not touching it it isn't a pain you know it is a misery a continuous indefinite ache dr drugemuller in hamburg tells me that my nerves on this side are all too short imagine on my whole left side my nerves aren't long enough sometimes i think i shall surely have a stroke here on this side a permanent paralysis you have no idea i never go to sleep properly my heart doesn't beat and i start up suddenly in a perfectly terrible fright that happens not once but ten times before i get to sleep i don't know if you know what it is i'll tell you about it more precisely it is not now the consul said coldly am i to understand that you have come here to tell me this i suppose not no thomas if it were only that but it is not that alone it is the business i can't go on with it your affairs are in confusion again the consul did not start he did not raise his voice he asked the question quite calmly and looked sidewise at his brother with a cold weary glance no thomas for to tell you the truth it is all the same now i never really was in order even with the ten thousand as you know yourself they only saved me from putting up the shutters at once the thing is i had more losses at once in coffee and with the failure in antwerp that's the truth so then i didn't do any more business i just 
sat still but one has to live so now there are notes and other debts five thousand taller you don't know the hole i'm in and on top of everything else this agony oh so you just sat still did you cried the consul beside himself his self-control was gone now you let the wagon stick in the mud and went off to enjoy yourself you think i don't know the kind of life you've been living theatres and circus and clubs and women you mean aline yes thomas you have very little understanding for that sort of thing and it's my misfortune perhaps that i have so much you are right when you say it has cost me too much and it will cost me a goodish bit more for i'll tell you something just here between two brothers the third child the little girl six months old she is my child you fool you don't say that thomas you should be just even if you are angry to her and why shouldn't it be my child and as for aline she isn't in the least worthless and you ought not to say she is she is not at all promiscuous she broke with consul holm on my account and he has much more money than i have that's how decent she is no thomas you simply can't understand what a splendid creature she is and healthy she is as healthy he repeated the word and held up one hand before his face with the fingers crooked in the same gesture as when he used to tell about maria and the depravity of london you should see her teeth when she laughs i've never found any other teeth to compare with them not in valparaiso or london or anywhere else in the world i'll never forget the evening i first met her in the oyster-room at ulick she was living with consul holm then well i told her a story or two and was a bit friendly and when i went home with her afterwards well thomas that's a different sort of feeling from the one you have when you do a good stroke of business but you don't like to hear about such things i can see that already and anyhow it's over with i'm saying good-bye to her though i shall keep in touch with her on account of the child i'll pay up everything i owe in hamburg and shut up shop i can't go on i've talked with mother and she is willing to give me the five thousand taller to start with so that i can put things in order and i hope you will agree to it for it is much better to say quite simply that christian budenbroek is winding up his business and going abroad than for me to make a failure you think so too don't you i intend to go to london again thomas and take a position it isn't good for me to be independent i can see that more and more the responsibility whereas in a situation one just goes home quite carefree at the end of the day and i liked living in london do you object during this exposition the consul had turned his back on his brother and stood with his hands in his pockets describing figures on the floor with his foot very good go to london he said shortly and without turning more than halfway toward his brother he passed into the living-room but christian followed him he went up to gerda who sat there alone reading and put out his hand good night gerda well gerda i'm off for london yes it's remarkable how one gets tossed about hither and yon now it's again into the unknown into a great city you know where one meets an adventure at every third step and sees so much of life strange do you know the feeling one gets it here sort of in the pit of the stomach it's very odd End of section 65section sixty six of budenbrooks by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part seven chapter three 
James Mullendorf, the oldest of the merchant senators, died in a grotesque and horrible way. The instinct of self-preservation became very weak in this diabetic old man, and in the last years of his life he fell a victim to a passion for cakes and pastries. Dr. Grabo, as the Mullendorf family physician, had protested energetically, and the distressed relatives employed gentle constraint to keep the head of the family from committing suicide with sweet bake-stuffs. But the old senator, mental wreck as he was, rented a room somewhere in some convenient street like Little Groping Alley or Anglesvik or Behind the Wall, a little hole of a room whither he could secretly betake himself to consume sweets. And there they found his lifeless body, the mouth still full of half-masticated cake, the crumbs upon his coat and upon the wretched table. A mortal stroke had supervened and put a stop to slow dissolution. The horrid details of the death were kept as much as possible from the family, but they flew about the town and were discussed at length on the bourse, in the club, and at the Harmony, in all the business offices, in the assembly of burgesses, likewise at all the balls, dinners, and evening parties, for the death occurred in February of the year 62, and the season was in full swing. Even the Frau Consul's friends talked about it on the Jerusalem evenings in the pauses of Leah Gerhardt's reading aloud. The little Sunday school children discussed it in awesome whispers as they crossed the Budenbroke entry, and Herr Stutt in Belfounder Street went into ample detail over it with his wife, who moved in the highest circles. But interest could not long remain concentrated upon the past and even with the first rumor of the old man's death the great question had at once sprung up who was to succeed him what suspense what subterranean activity a stranger intent on the sights of the medieval town would have noticed nothing but beneath the surface there was unimaginable bustle and commotion as one firm and unassailable honest conviction after another was exploded and slowly slowly the while divergent views approached each other passions are stirred ambition and vanity wrestle together in silence dead and buried hopes spring once more to life and again are blasted old kurtz the merchant in baker's alley who gets three or four votes at every election will sit quaking at home on the fatal day and listen to the shouting but he will not be elected this time either he will continue to take his walks abroad displaying outwardly his usual mingling of civic pride and self-satisfaction but he will bear down with him into the grave the secret chagrin of never having been elected senator james mullendorf's death was discussed at the budenbroke thursday dinner-table and frau permanader after the proper expressions of sympathy began to let her tongue play upon her upper lip and look across artfully at her brother the budenbroke ladies marked the look they exchanged piercing glances and with one accord shut their eyes and their lips tightly together the consul had for a second responded to the sly smile his sister gave him and then given the talk another turn he knew that the thought which tony hugged to her breast in secret was being spoken in the street names were suggested and rejected others came up and were sifted out henning kurtz in baker's alley was too old they needed new blood consul Huneus, the lumber dealer whose millions would have weighted the scale heavily in his favor was constitutionally ineligible as his brother already sat in the senate Consul Eduard Kistenmacher, the wine dealer, and Consul Hermann Hagenstrom were names that kept their places on the list, but from the very first was heard the name of Thomas Budenbroek, 
and as election day approached it grew constantly plainer that he and hermann hagenstrom were the favored candidates hermann hagenstrom had his admirers and hangers-on there was no doubt of that his zeal in public affairs the spectacular rise of the firm of strunk and hagenstrom the showy house the consul kept the luxurious life he led the pate de foie gras he ate for breakfast all these could not fail to make an impression this large rather overstout man with the short full reddish beard and the snub nose coming down flat on his upper lip this man whose grandfather nobody knew not even himself and whose father had made himself socially impossible by a rich but doubtful marriage this man had become a brother-in-law of the hunaeuses and the mullendorps had ranged his name alongside those of the five or six reigning families in the town and was undeniably a remarkable and a respected figure the novel and therewith the attractive element in his personality that which singled him out for a leading position in the eyes of many was its liberal and tolerant strain his light large way of making money and spending it again differed fundamentally from the patient persistent toil and the inherited principles of his fellow merchants this man stood on his own feet free from the fetters of tradition and ancestral piety and all the old ways were foreign to him his house was not one of the ancient patrician mansions built with senseless waste of space in tall white galleries mounting above a stone-paved ground floor his home on sand street the southern extension of broad street was a modern dwelling not conforming to any set style of architecture with a simple painted facade but furnished inside with every luxury and planned with the cleverest economy of space recently on the occasion of one of his large evening parties he had invited a prima donna from the government theatre to sing after dinner to his guests among them his witty art-loving brother and had paid her an enormous fee for her services hermann hagenstrom was not the man to vote in the assembly for the application of large sums of money to preserve and restore the town's medieval monuments but it was a fact that he was the first absolutely the first man in town to light his house and his offices with gas yes if consul hagenstrom could be said to represent any tradition whatever it was the free progressive tolerant unprejudiced habit of thought which he had inherited from his father old hinrik and on this was based all the admiration people undoubtedly felt for him thomas budenbroek's prestige was of a different kind people honored in him not only his own personality but the personalities of his father grandfather and great-grandfather as well quite apart from his own business and public achievement he was the representative of a hundred years of honorable tradition and the easy charming way indeed with which he carried the family standard made no small part of his success what distinguished him even among his professional fellow-citizens was an unusual degree of formal culture which wherever he went aroused both wonder and respect in about equal degrees on thursdays at the budenbrooks the coming election received only brief and passing comment in the presence of the consul whenever it was mentioned the old frau consul discreetly averted her light eyes but frau permanader now and then could not refrain from displaying her astonishing knowledge of the constitution she had gone very thoroughly into the decrees touching the election of a member of the senate precisely as once she thoroughly informed herself on the laws governing divorce 
she talked about voting chambers ballots and electors she weighed all the possible eventualities she could recite verbatim and glibly the oath taken by the voters she spoke of the free and frank discussion which the constitution ordains must be held over each name upon the list of candidates and vivaciously wished she might be present when hermann hagenstrom's character was being pulled to pieces a moment later she leaned over and began to count the prune pits on her brother's dessert plate tinker tailor soldier sailor finishing triumphantly with senator when she came to the last pit but after dinner she could not hold in any longer she took her brother's arm and drew him into the bow window oh tom tom suppose you are really elected if our coat of arms is put up in the senate chamber at the town hall i shall just die of joy i know i shall i shall fall dead at the news you'll see now tony dear have a little self-control a little dignity i beg of you you are not usually lacking in dignity am i going around like henning kurtz we amount to something even without the senator and i hope you won't die whichever way it turns out and the agitations the consultations the struggles of opinion took their course consul peter dulman the rake with the business now entirely ruined which existed only in name and the twenty-seven-year-old daughter whose inheritance he was eating up played his part by attending two dinners one given by thomas budenbroek and the other by hermann hagenstrom and both times addressing his host in his loud resounding voice as senator but sigismund gosch old gosch the broker went about like a raging lion and engaged to throttle anybody out of hand who wasn't minded to vote for consul budenbroek consul budenbroek gentlemen ah there's a man for you i stood at his father's side in forty eight when with a word he tamed the unleashed fury of the mob his father and his father's father before him would have been senator were there any justice on this earth but at bottom it was not so much consul budenbroek himself whose personality fired gosch's soul to its innermost depths it was rather the young frau consul gerda arnoldson not that the broker had ever exchanged a word with her he did not belong to her circle of wealthy merchant families nor sit at their tables nor pay visits to them but as we have seen gerda budenbroek had but to arrive in the town to be singled out by the roving fancy of the sinister broker ever on the lookout for the unusual with unerring instinct he divined that this figure was calculated to add content to his unsatisfied existence and he made himself the slave of one who had scarcely ever heard his name since then he encompassed in his reveries this nervous exceedingly reserved lady to whom he had not even been presented he lifted his jesuit hat to her on the street to her great surprise and treated her to a pantomime of cringing treachery gloating over her the while in his thoughts as a tiger might over his trainer this dull existence would afford him no chance of committing atrocities for this woman's sake ah if it only would with what devilish indifference would he answer for them its stupid conventions prevented him from raising her by deeds of blood and horror to an imperial throne and thus nothing was left but for him to go to the town hall and cast his vote in favor of her furiously respected husband and perhaps one day to dedicate to her his forthcoming translation of lope de vega End of section 66
Section 67 of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann. Translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part 7, Chapter 4 every vacant seat in the senate must according to the constitution be filled within four weeks three of them have passed and this is election day a day of thaw at the end of february it is about one o'clock and people are thronging into broad street they are thronging before the town hall with its ornamental glazed brick facade its pointed towers and turrets mounting toward a whitish gray sky its covered steps supported on outstanding columns its pointed arcades through which there is a glimpse of the market-place and the fountain the crowd stands steadfastly in the dirty slush that melts beneath their feet they look into each other's faces and then straight ahead again and crane their necks for beyond that portal in the council room in fourteen armchairs arranged in a semicircle sit the electors who have been chosen from the senate and the assembly and await the proposals of the voting chambers the affair has spun itself out it appears that the debate in the chambers will not die down the struggle is so bitter that up to now not one single unanimous choice has been put before the council otherwise the burgomaster would at once announce an election extraordinary rumors nobody knows whence nobody knows how come from within the building and circulate in the street perhaps herr kaspersen the elder of the two beadles who always refers to himself as a servant of the state is standing inside there and telling what he hears out of the corner of his mouth through his shut teeth with his eyes turned the other way the story goes that proposals have been laid before the sitting but that each of the three chambers has turned in a different name namely hagenstrom kistenmacher and budenbroek a secret ballot must now be taken with ballot papers it is to be hoped that it will show a clear plurality for people without overshoes are suffering and stamping their feet to warm them the waiting crowd is made up of all sorts and conditions there are seafaring characters with bare tattooed necks and their hands in the pockets of their sailor trousers green porters with their incomparably respectable countenances and their blouses and knee-breeches of black glazed calico drivers who have clambered down from their wagons of piled-up sacks and stand whip in hand to wait for the decision servant maids in neckerchiefs aprons and thick striped petticoats with little white caps perched on the backs of their heads and market baskets hanging on their bare arms fish and vegetable women with their flat straw baskets even a couple of pretty farm girls with dutch caps short skirts and long flowing sleeves coming out from their gaily embroidered stay bodies mingled among these burghers shopkeepers who have come out hatless from neighboring shops to exchange their views sprucely dressed young men who are apprentices in the business of their fathers or their fathers friends and schoolboys with satchels and bundles of books two laborers with bristling sailor beards stand chewing their tobacco behind them is an excited lady craning her neck this way and that to get a glimpse of the town hall between their powerful shoulders she wears a long evening cloak trimmed with brown fur which she holds together from the inside with both hands her face is well covered with a thick brown veil she shifts her feet about in the melting snow god kurtz bain't gettin it this time nother be he says the one laborer to the other no ye mutton head tis certain he bain't there's no more talk o him the votin's between hagenstrom budenbroek and kistenmacher tis all about they now tis whether which one o the three be ahead o the others eh 
so tis yes they do say so then i'm minded they be choosin hagenstrom yes marty so they'll be choosin hagenstrom you can tell that to your grandmother and therewith he spits his tobacco juice on the ground close to his own feet the crowd being too dense to admit of a trajectory he takes hold of his trousers in both hands and pulls them up higher under his belt and goes on hagenstrom he's a great pig he be so fat he can't breathe through his own nose if so be it's all over with kurtz then i'm for budenbroke tis a very shrewd chap so tis so tis but hagenstrom he's got the money that bain't the question tis no matter of riches and then this budenbroke he be so devilish fine with his cuffs and his silk tie and his sticking out moustaches hast seen him walk he hops along like a bird ye ninny that bain't the question no more'n the other they say his sister of put away two men already the lady in the fur cloak trembles visibly eh that sort of thing what do we know about it likely the consul he couldn't help it hisself the lady in the veil thinks to herself he couldn't indeed thank god for that and presses her hands together inside her cloak and then adds the budenbroke partisan didn't the burgomaster his own self stand godfather to his son can't ye tell something by that yes can't you indeed thinks the lady thank heaven that did do some good she starts a fresh rumour from the town hall running zigzag through the crowd has reached her ears the balloting it seems has not been decisive eduard kistenmacher indeed has received fewer votes than the other two candidates and his name has been dropped but the struggle goes on between budenbroke and hagenstrom a sapient citizen remarks that if the voting continues to be even it will be necessary to appoint five arbitrators a voice down in front at the entrance steps shouts suddenly heine sihas is selected hurrah for heine sihas heine sihas be it known is an habitual drunkard who peddles hot bread on a little wagon through the streets everybody roars with laughter and stands on tiptoe to see the wag who is responsible for the joke the lady in the veil is seized with a nervous giggle her shoulders shake for a moment and then give a shrug which expresses as plainly as words is this the time for tomfoolery like that she collects herself again and stares with intensity between the two laborers at the town hall but almost at the same moment her hands slip from her cloak so that it opens in front her figure relaxes her shoulders droop she stands there entirely crushed hagenstrom the word seems to have come from nobody knows where down from the sky or up from the earth it is everywhere at once there is no contradiction so it is decided hagenstrom hagenstrom it is then one may as well go home the lady in the veil might have known it was ever thus she will go home she feels the tears rising in her throat this state of things has lasted a second or two when there occurs a shouting and a backward jostling of the throng it runs through the whole assemblage as those in front press back those behind and at the same time something red appears in the doorway it is the coats of the beadles kaspersen and ulefeldt they are in full dress uniform with white riding breeches three-cornered hats yellow gauntlet gloves and short dress swords they appear side by side and make their way through the crowd which falls back before them they move like fate silent resolved inexorable not looking to right or left with gaze directed toward the ground they take according to instructions the route marked out by the election and it is not in the direction of sand street 
they have turned to the right they are going down broad street the lady in the veil cannot believe her eyes however all about her people are seeing just what she sees they are pushing on after the beetles and saying to each other it isn't hagenstrom it's budenbroek and a group of gentlemen emerge from the portal in excited conversation and hurry with rapid steps down broad street to be the first to offer congratulations then the lady holds her cloak together and runs for it she runs indeed as seldom lady runs her veil blows up revealing her flushed face no matter for that and one of her furred galoshes keeps flapping open in the sloppy snow and hindering her frightfully yet she outruns them all she gains the house at the corner of baker street she rings the alarm bell at the vestibule door fire murder thieves she shouts at the maid who opens they're coming catherine they're coming takes the stairs and storms into the living-room her brother himself sits there certainly a little pale he puts down his paper and makes a gesture almost as if to ward her off but she puts her arms about him and repeats they're coming tom they're coming you are the man and hermann hagenstrom is out that was friday on the following day senator budenbroek stood in the council hall in the seat of the deceased james mullendorf and in the presence of the city fathers there assembled and the delegation of burgesses he took the oath i will conscientiously perform the duties of my office strive with all my power for the good of the state faithfully obey the constitution honorably pursue the public weal and in the discharge of my office regard neither my own advantage nor that of my relatives and friends i will support the laws of the state and do justice on all alike whether rich or poor in all things where secrecy is needful i will not speak and especially will i not reveal what is given me to keep silent so help me god End of section 67section 68 of budenbrooks by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part seven chapter five our desires and our performance are conditioned by certain needs of our nervous systems which are very hard to define in words what people called thomas budenbrooks vanity his care for his personal appearance his extravagant dressing was at bottom not vanity but something else entirely it was originally no more than the effort of a man of action to be certain from head to toe of the adequacy and correctness of his bearing but the demands made by himself and by others upon his talents and his capacities were constantly increased he was overwhelmed by public and private affairs when the senate sat to appoint its committees one of the main departments the administration of the taxes fell to his lot but tolls railways and other administrative business claimed his time as well and he presided at hundreds of committees that called into play all the capacities he possessed he had to summon every ounce of his flexibility his foresight his power to charm in order not to wound the sensibilities of his elders to defer constantly to them and yet to keep the reins in his own hands if his so-called vanity notably increased at the same time if he felt a greater and greater need to refresh himself bodily to renew himself to change his clothing several times a day all this meant simply that thomas budenbroek though he was barely thirty-seven years old was losing his elasticity was wearing himself out fast when good dr grabo begged him to relax a little he answered oh my dear doctor i haven't reached that point yet 
by which he meant that he still had an interminable deal of work to do before he arrived at the goal and could settle back to enjoy himself the truth was he hardly believed himself in such a condition yet it drove him on it left him no peace even when he seemed to rest as he sat with the paper after dinner a thousand ideas whirled about in his brain while the veins stood out on his temples and he twisted the ends of his moustaches with a certain still intensity of passion he concentrated with equal violence whether the subject of his thought was a business manoeuvre a public speech or a decision to renew his entire stock of body linen in order to be sure that he had enough for a while at least if such wholesale buying afforded him passing relief and satisfaction he could indulge himself in it without scruple for his business at this time was as brilliant as ever it had been in his grandfather's day the repute of the firm grew not only in the town but round about and throughout the whole community he continued to be held in ever greater regard his talents were admitted on all hands with admiration or envy as the case might be while he himself wrestled ceaselessly at times despairingly to evolve an order and method of work which should enable him to overtake the flights of his own restless imagination thus when in the summer of eighteen sixty three senator budenbroke went about with his mind full of plans for the building of a great new house it was not arrogance which impelled him he was driven by his own inability to be quiet which his fellow burghers would have been right in ascribing to his vanity for it was another manifestation of the same thing to make a new home and a radical change in his outward life to pack up to reinstall himself afresh to weed out all the accumulations of bygone years and set aside everything old or superfluous all this even in imagination gave him feelings of freshness newness spotlessness stimulation all of which he must have craved indeed for he attacked the plan with great enthusiasm and already had his eye on a suitable location there was a property of considerable extent at the lower end of fisher's lane the house gray with age in bad repair was offered for sale on the death of its owner an ancient spinster the relic of a forgotten family who had dwelt there alone on this piece of land the senator thought to build his house and he surveyed it with a speculative eye when he passed the spot on his way to the harbor the neighborhood was pleasant enough good burgher houses the most modest among them being the narrow little facade opposite with a small flower shop on the ground floor he threw himself into the affair he made a rough estimate of the expense involved and though the sum he fixed provisionally was by no means a small one he felt he could compass it without undue effort but then he would suddenly have the thought that the whole thing was a senseless folly and confess to himself that his present house had plenty of room for himself his wife their child and their servants but the half-conscious cravings were stronger and in the desire to have them strengthened and justified from outside he first revealed his plan to his sister well tony what do you say to it the whole house is a sort of bandbox isn't it and the winding stair is really a joke it isn't quite the thing is it and now that you've had me made senator in a word don't you think i owe it to myself ah in the eyes of madame permanator what was there he did not owe to himself she was full of practical enthusiasm she crossed her arms on her breast and walked up and down with her shoulders raised and her head in the air of course you do tom goodness gracious yes what possible objection could there be and when you have married an arnoldson with a hundred thousand taller to boot 
i'm very proud to be the first you've told it to it was lovely of you and if you do do it tom why you must do it well that's what i say it must be grand hmm. well yes i agree with you i'm willing to spend something on it i'll have folked and we'll go over the plans together folked has a great deal of taste the second opinion which thomas called in was gerda's she praised the idea unreservedly the confusion of moving would not be pleasant but the prospect of a large music room with good acoustic properties impressed her most happily as for the old frau consul she was quite prepared to think of the new house as a logical consequence of all the other blessings which had fallen to her lot and to give thanks to god therefore accordingly since the birth of the heir and the recent election she gave freer expression to her motherly pride and had a way of saying my son the senator which the broad street budenbrooks found most offensive these aging spinsters felt that all too little shadow set off the sunshine through which thomas's outward life ran its brilliant course it was no great consolation at the thursday family gatherings to pour contempt on poor good-natured clotilde as for christian christian through the good offices of mr richardson his former chief had found a situation in london whence he had lately telegraphed a fantastic desire to marry fraulein puvogel an idea upon which his mother had firmly set her foot christian now belonged quite simply to jacob kruger's class and was as it were a dead issue they consoled themselves to some extent with the little weaknesses of the old frau consul and frau permenader they would bring the conversation round to the subject of coiffures the frau consul was capable of saying in the blandest way that she always wore her hair very simply whereas it was plain to any one gifted by god with intelligence and certainly to the mrs budenbroek that the immutable red blonde hair under the old lady's cap could no longer by any stretch be called her hair still more gratifying was it to get cousin tony started on the subject of those nefarious persons who had formerly had an influence on her life tiri trishka grunlich permenader hagenstrom tony when she was egged on to it would utter these names into the air like so many little trumpetings of disgust with her shoulders well up they had a sweet sound in the ears of the daughters of uncle gotthold they could not dissimulate and they would accept no responsibility for omitting to say that little johann was frightfully slow about learning to walk and talk they were really quite right it was an admitted fact that hanno this was the nickname adopted by the frau senator for her son at a time when he was able to call all the members of his family by name with fair correctness was incapable of pronouncing the names frederica henrietta and fifi so that anyone could understand what he said and at fifteen months he had not taken a single step alone the misses budenbroek shaking their heads pessimistically declared that the child would be halt and tongue-tied to the end of his days they later admitted the error of their gloomy prophecy but nobody in fact denied that hanno was a little backward his early infancy was a struggle for life and his family was in constant anxiety at birth he had been too feeble to cry out and soon after the christening a three-day attack of cholera infantum was almost enough to still forever the little heart set pumping in the first place with such difficulty but he survived 
and good dr grabo did his best by the most painstaking care and nourishment to strengthen him for the difficult period of teething the first tiny white point had barely pricked through the gum when the child was attacked by convulsions which repeated themselves with greater and greater violence until again the worst was to be feared once more the old doctor speechlessly pressed the parents hands the child lay in profound exhaustion and the vacant look in the shadowy eyes indicated an affection of the brain the end seemed almost to be wished for but hanno regained some little strength consciousness returned and though the crisis which he had survived greatly hindered his progress in walking and talking there was no longer any immediate danger to be feared the child was slender of limb and rather tall for his age his hair pale brown and very soft began to grow rapidly and fell waving over the shoulders of his full pinafore-like frocks the family likenesses were abundantly clear even now from the first he possessed the budenbroke hand broad a little too short but finely articulated and his nose was precisely the nose of his father and great-grandfather though the nostrils would probably remain more delicate but the whole lower part of his face longish and narrow was neither budenbroke nor kruger but from the mother's side of the house this was true of the mouth in particular which when closed began very early to wear an anxious woe-begone expression that later matched the look of his strange gold-brown blue-shadowed eyes so he began to live brooded over by his father's reserved tenderness clothed and nurtured under his mother's watchful eye prayed over by aunt antonia presented with tops and hobby-horses by the frau consul and uncle justus and when his charming little perambulator appeared on the streets it was looked after with interest and expectation madame deco the stately nurse had attended the child up to now but it had been settled that when they moved into the new house not she but ida jungmann should move in with them and the latter's place with the old frau consul be filled by somebody else senator budenbroke carried out his plans he had no difficulty in obtaining title to the property in fisher's lane the broad street house was turned over to gosh the broker who dramatically declared himself prepared to assume the task of disposing of it stefan kistenmacher who had a growing family and with his brother edouard made good money in the wine business bought it at once herr vogt undertook the new building and soon there was a clean plan to unroll before the eyes of the family on thursday afternoons when they could in fancy see the facade already before them an imposing brick facade with sandstone caryatides supporting the bow window and a flat roof of which clotilde remarked in her pleasant drawl that one might drink afternoon coffee there the senator planned to transfer the business offices to his new building which would of course leave empty the ground floor of the house in main street but here also things turned out well for it appeared that the city fire insurance company wanted to rent the rooms by the month for their offices which was quickly arranged autumn came and the gray walls crumbled to heaps of rubbish and thomas budenbroke's new house rose above its roomy cellars while winter set in and slowly waned again in all the town there was no pleasanter topic of conversation it was tip-top it was the finest dwelling-house far and wide but it must cost like the deuce the old consul would never have spent money so recklessly thus the neighbors the middle-class dwellers in the gabled houses 
looking out at the workmen on the scaffoldings enjoying the sight of the rising walls and speculating on the date of the carpenter's feast it came at length and was celebrated with due circumstance up on the flat-topped roof an old master mason made the festal speech and flung the champagne bottle over his shoulder while the tremendous wreath woven of roses green garlands and gay-colored leaves swayed between standards heavily in the breeze the workmen's feast was held at a neighboring inn at long tables with beer sandwiches and cigars and senator budenbroke and his wife and his little son on madame decaux's arm walked through the narrow space between the tables and bowed his thanks at the cheers they gave him when they got outside they put little hanno back into his carriage and thomas and gerda crossed the road to have another look at the red facade with the white caryatides they stood before the flower shop with the narrow door and the poor little show window in which only a few pots of onions stood on a green glass slab Eitherson, the proprietor, a blond giant of a man in a woolen jacket, was in the doorway with his wife. She was of a quite different build, slender and delicate, with a dark, southern looking face. She held a four or five year old boy by one hand, while with the other she was pushing a little carriage back and forth in which a younger child lay asleep and she was plainly expecting a third blessing iverson made a low awkward bow his wife continuing to push the little carriage back and forth looked calmly and observantly at the frau senator with her narrow black eyes as the lady approached them on her husband's arm thomas paused and pointed with his walking-stick at the great garland far above them you did a good job iverson said he no herr senator that's the wife's work she's the one for these affairs oh said the senator raised his head with a little jerk and gave for a second a clear friendly look straight into frau iverson's face then without adding a word he courteously waved his hand and they moved on their way end of section sixty eight section sixty nine of budenbrooks by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part seven chapter six one sunday at the beginning of july senator budenbroke had moved some four weeks before frau perminator appeared at her brother's house toward evening she crossed the cool ground floor paved with flags and decorated with reliefs by torvaldsen whence there was a door leading into the bureau she rang at the vestibule door it could be opened from the kitchen by pressing on a rubber bulb and entered the spacious lobby where at the foot of the steps stood the bear presented by tubertius and clara here she learned from anton that the senator was still at work very good anton she said i will go to him yet she did not go at once into the office but passed the door that led into it and stood at the bottom of the splendid staircase which as far as the first story had a cast-iron balustrade but at the distance of the second story became a wide pillared balcony in white and gold with a great gilt chandelier hanging down from the skylight's dizzy height very elegant said frau perminator softly in a tone of great satisfaction gazing up into this spacious magnificence to her it meant quite simply the power the brilliance and the triumph of the budenbroke family but now it occurred to her that she was not in fact come upon a very cheerful errand and she slowly turned away and passed through the door into the office 
thomas sat there quite alone in his place by the window writing a letter he glanced up raised an eyebrow and put out his hand to his sister evening tony what's the good word oh nothing very good tom oh your staircase it's just too splendid why are you sitting here writing in the dark it was a pressing letter well nothing very good eh come out into the garden a little it is pleasanter out there as they crossed the entry a violin adagio came trillingly down from the story above listen said tony and paused a moment gerda is playing how heavenly what a woman she isn't a woman she's a fairy how is hanno tom just having his supper with young man too bad he is so slow about walking oh that will come tom that will come are you pleased with ida why not they crossed the flags at the back leaving the kitchen on the right went through a glass door and up two steps into the lovely scented flower garden well the senator asked it was warm and still the fragrance from the meat beds and borders hung in the evening air and the fountain surrounded by tall pale purple iris sent its stream gently plashing heavenward where the first stars began to gleam in the background an open flight of steps flanked by low obelisks led up to a gravelled terrace with an open wooden pavilion a closed marquee and some garden chairs on the left hand was the property wall between them and the next garden on the right the side wall of the next house was covered with a wooden trellis intended for climbing plants there were a few currant and gooseberry bushes at the sides of the terrace steps but there was only one tree a large gnarled walnut by the left-hand wall the thing is this answered frau permanader with some hesitation as the brother and sister began to pace the gravel path of the forepart of the garden tiburtius has written clara questioned thomas please don't make a long story of it yes tom she is in bed she is very bad the doctor is afraid of tuberculosis of the brain i can hardly speak the words here is the letter tiburtius wrote me and enclosed another for mother which we are to give her when we have prepared her a little it tells the same story and there is this second enclosure to mother from clara herself written in pencil in a shaky hand and tiburtius wrote that she herself said that this was the last she should write for it seems the sad thing is she makes no effort to live she was always longing for heaven finished frau permanader and wiped her eyes the senator walked at her side his hands behind his back his head bowed you are so quiet tom but you are right what is there to say just now too when christian lies ill in hamburg for this was in fact the state of things christian's misery in the left side had increased so much of late that it had become actual pain severe enough to make him forget all smaller woes he was quite helpless and had written to his mother from london that he was coming home for her to take care of him he quit his situation in london and started off but at hamburg had been obliged to take to his bed the doctor diagnosed his ailment as rheumatism of the joints and he had been removed from his hotel to a hospital any further journey was for the time impossible there he lay and dictated to his attendant letters that betrayed extreme depression yes said the senator quietly it seems as if one thing just followed on another she put her arm for an instant across his shoulders but you mustn't give way tom this is no time for you to be downhearted you need all your courage yes god knows i need it 
what do you mean tom tell me why were you so quiet thursday afternoon at dinner if i may ask oh business my child i had to sell no very small quantity of grain not very advantageously or rather i had to sell a large quantity very much at a loss well that happens tom you sell at a loss to-day and to-morrow you make it good again to get discouraged over a thing of that kind wrong tony he said and shook his head my courage does not go down to zero because i've had a piece of bad luck it's the other way on i believe in that and events show it but what is the matter with it then she asked surprised and alarmed one would think you have enough to make you happy tom clara is alive and with god's help she will get better and as for everything else here we are walking about in your own garden and it all smells so sweet and yonder is your house a dream of a house hermann hockenstrom's is a dog kennel beside it and you have done all that yes it is almost too beautiful tony i'll tell you it is too new it jars on me a little perhaps that is what is the matter with me it may be responsible for the bad mood that comes over me and spoils everything i looked forward immensely to all this but the anticipation was the best part of it it always is everything gets done too slowly so when it is finished the pleasure is already gone the pleasure is gone tom at your age a man is as young or as old as he feels and when one gets one's wish too late or works too hard for it it comes already weighted with all sorts of small vexatious drawbacks with all the dust of reality upon it that one did not reckon with in fancy it is so irritating so irritating oh yes but what do you mean by as old as you feel why tony it is a mood certainly it may pass but just now i feel older than i am i have business cares and at the directors meeting of the buchan railway yesterday consul hagenstrom simply talked me down refuted my contentions nearly made me appear ridiculous i feel that could not have happened to me before it is as though something had begun to slip as though i haven't the firm grip i had on events what is success it is an inner an indescribable force resourcefulness power of vision a consciousness that i am by my mere existence exerting pressure on the movement of life about me it is my belief in the adaptability of life to my own ends fortune and success lie with ourselves we must hold them firmly deep within us for as soon as something begins to slip to relax to get tired within us then everything without us will rebel and struggle to withdraw from our influence one thing follows another blow after blow and the man is finished often and often in these days i have thought of a turkish proverb it says when the house is finished death comes it doesn't need to be death but the decline the falling off the beginning of the end you know tony he went on in a still lower voice putting his arm underneath his sister's when hanno was christened you said it looks as if quite a new life would dawn for us all i can still hear you say it and i thought then that you were right for i was elected senator and was fortunate in my business and this house seemed to spring up out of the ground but the senator and this house are superficial after all i know from life and from history something you have not thought of often the outward and visible material signs and symbols of happiness and success only show themselves 
when the process of decline has already set in the outer manifestations take time like the light of that star up there which may in reality be already quenched when it looks to us to be shining its brightest he ceased to speak and they walked for a while in silence while the fountain gently murmured and a whispering sounded from the top of the walnut tree then frau permanator breathed such a heavy sigh that it sounded like a sob how sadly you talk tom you never spoke so sadly before but it is good to speak out and it will help you to put all that kind of thoughts out of your mind yes tony i must try to do that i know as well as i can and now give me the enclosures from clara and the pastor it will be best won't it for me to take over the matter and speak to-morrow morning with mother poor mother if it is really tuberculosis one may as well give up hope End of section 69section seventy of budenbrooks by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part seven chapter seven you don't even ask me you go right over my head i have done as i had to do you have acted like a distracted person in a perfectly unreasonable way reason is not the highest thing on earth please don't make phrases the question is one of the most ordinary justice which you have most astonishingly ignored let me suggest to you my son that you yourself are ignoring the duty and respect which you owe to your mother and i answer you my dear mother by telling you that i have never for a moment forgotten the respect i owe you but that my attributes as a son became void when i took my father's place as head of the family and of the firm i desire you to be silent thomas no i will not be silent so long as you fail to realize the extent of your own weakness and folly i have a right to dispose of my own property as i choose within the limits of justice and reason i could never have believed you would have the heart to wound me like this and i could never have believed that my own mother would slap me in the face tom why tom frau permanator's anguished voice got itself a hearing at last she sat at the window of the landscape room wringing her hands while her brother paced up and down in a state of high excitement and the frau consul beside herself with angry grief sat on the sofa leaning with one hand on its upholstered arm while the other struck the table to emphasize her words all three wore mourning for clara who was no longer of this earth and all three were pale and excited what was going on something amazing something dreadful something at which the very actors in the scene themselves stood aghast and incredulous a quarrel an embittered disagreement between mother and son it was a sultry august afternoon only ten days after the senator had gently prepared his mother and given her the letters from clara and tubertius the blow fell and he had the harder task of breaking to the old lady the news of death itself he travelled to riga for the funeral and returned with his brother-in-law who spent a few days with the family of his deceased wife and also visited christian in the hospital at hamburg and now two days after the pastor had departed for home the frau consul with obvious hesitation made a certain revelation to her son one hundred and twenty seven thousand five hundred marks current cried he and shook his clasped hands in front of him if it were the dowry even if he wanted to keep the eighty thousand marks though considering there's no heir even that but to promise him clara's whole inheritance 
right over my head without saying i yes or no thomas for our blessed lord's sake do me some sort of justice at least could i act otherwise tell me could i she who has been taken from us and is now with god she wrote me from her deathbed with faltering hand a pencilled letter mother she wrote we shall see each other no more on this earth and these are i know my dying words to you with my last conscious thoughts i appeal to you for my husband god gave us no children but when you follow me let what would have been mine if i had lived go to him to enjoy during his lifetime mother it is my last request my dying prayer you will not refuse it no thomas i did not refuse it i could not i sent a dispatch to her and she died in peace the frau consul wept violently and you never told me a syllable everybody conceals things from me and acts without my authority repeated the senator yes thomas i have kept silent for i felt i must fulfil the last wish of my dying child and i knew you would have tried to prevent me yes by god i would have you would have had no right to for three of my children would have been on my side i think my opinion has enough weight to balance that of two women and a degenerate fool you speak of your brother and sisters as heartlessly as you do to me clara was a pious ignorant woman mother and tony is a child and anyhow she knew nothing about the affair at all until now or she might have talked at the wrong time eh and christian oh he got christian's consent did tubertius who would have thought it of him do you know now or don't you grasp it yet what he is this ingenious pastor he is a rogue and a fortune hunter sons-in-law are always rogues said frau permanader in a hollow voice he is a fortune hunter what does he do he travels to hamburg and sits down by christian's bed he talks to him yes says christian yes tubertius god bless you have you any idea of the pain i suffer in my left side ah oh, the idiots the scoundrels they joined hands against me and the senator perfectly beside himself leaned against the wrought-iron fire-screen and pressed his clenched hands to his temples this paroxysm of anger was out of proportion to the circumstances no it was not the hundred and twenty-seven thousand marks that had brought him to this unprecedented state of rage it was rather that his irritated senses connected this case with the series of rebuffs and misfortunes which had lately attended him in both public and private business nothing went well any more nothing turned out as he intended it should and now had it come to this that in the house of his fathers they went over his head in matters of the highest importance that a pastor from riga could thus bamboozle him behind his back he could have prevented it if he had only been told but events had taken their course without him it was this which he felt could not have happened earlier would not have dared to happen earlier again his faith tottered his faith in himself his luck his power his future and it was nothing but his own inward weakness and despair that broke out in this scene before mother and sister frau permanator stood up and embraced her brother tom she said do control yourself try to be calm you will make yourself ill are things so very bad tubertius doesn't need to live so very long perhaps and the money would come back after he dies and if you want it to it can be altered can it not be altered mamma the frau consul answered only with sobs oh no no 
said the consul, pulling himself together, and making a weak gesture of dissent. Let it be as it is. Do you think I would carry it into court and sue my own mother, and add a public scandal to the family one? It may go as it is he concluded and walked lifelessly to the glass door where he paused and stood but you need not imagine he said in a suppressed voice that things are going so brilliantly with us tony lost eighty thousand marks and christian beside the setting up of fifty thousand that he has run through with has already had thirty thousand in advance and will need more as he's not earning anything and will have to take a cure at unhausen and now clara's dowry is permanently lost and her whole inheritance besides for an indefinite period and business is poor it seems to have gone to the devil precisely since the time when i spent more than a hundred thousand marks on my house no things are not going well in a family where there are such scenes as this to-day let me tell you one thing if father were alive if he were here in this room he would fold his hands and commend us to the mercy of god End of section seventy. Section seventy one of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann, translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part seven, chapter eight. Wars and rumors of war, billeting and bustle. Prussian officers tread the parquetry floors of Senator Budenbrooks' bel etage, kiss the hand of the lady of the house and frequent the club with christian who is back from unhausen in meng street mademoiselle ziverine riquen ziverine the frau consul's new companion helps the maids to drag piles of mattresses into the old garden house which is full of soldiers confusion disorder and suspense reign troops march off through the gate new ones come in they overrun the town they eat sleep fill the ears of the citizens with the noise of rolling drums commands and trumpet calls and march off again royal princes are fated entry follows entry then quiet again and suspense in the late autumn and winter the victorious troops return again they are billeted in the town for a time are mustered out and go home to the great relief of the cheering citizens peace comes the brief peace heavy with destiny of the year eighteen sixty five and between two wars little johann played unconscious and tranquil with his soft curling hair and voluminous pinafore frocks he played in the garden by the fountain or in the little gallery partitioned off for his use by a pillared railing from the vestibule of the second story played the plays of his four and a half years those plays whose meaning and charm no grown person can possibly grasp which need no more than a few pebbles or a stick of wood with a dandelion for a helmet since they command the pure powerful glowing untaught and unintimidated fancy of those blissful years before life touches us when neither duty nor remorse dares to lay upon us a finger's weight when we may see hear laugh dream and feel amazement when the world yet makes upon us not one single demand when the impatience of those whom we should like so much to love does not yet torment us for evidence of our ability to succeed in the impending struggle ah only a little while and that struggle will be upon us and they will do their best to bend us to their will and cut us to their pattern to exercise us to lengthen us to shorten us to corrupt us great things happened while little hanno played 
the war flamed up and its fortunes swayed this way and that then inclined to the side of the victors and hanno budenbroek's native city which had shrewdly stuck to prussia looked on not without satisfaction at wealthy frankfort which had to pay with her independence for her faith in austria but with the failure in july of a large firm of frankfort wholesale dealers immediately before the armistice the firm of johann budenbroek lost at one fell swoop the round sum of twenty thousand thaler End of section 71section seventy two of budenbrooks by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part eight chapter one when herr hugo weinschenk in his buttoned-up frock-coat with his drooping lower lip and his narrow black moustaches which grew in the most masculine way imaginable right into the corners of his mouth with both his fists held out in front of him and making little motions with his elbows at about the height of his waist when herr hugo weinschenk now for some time director of the city fire insurance company crossed the great entry in meng street and passed with a swinging pompous stride from his front to his back office he gave an impressive impersonation of an energetic and prosperous man and erika grunlich on the other hand was now twenty years old a tall blooming girl fresh colored and pretty full of health and strength if chance took her up or down the stairs just as herr weinschenk passed that way and chance did this not seldom the director took off his top hat displaying his short black hair which was already graying at the temples minced rather more than ever at the waist of his frock coat and greeted the young girl with an admiring glance from his bold and roving brown eye whereat erika ran away sat down somewhere in a window and wept for hours out of sheer helpless confusion fraulein grunlich had grown up under theresa weichbrod's care and correction her thoughts did not fly far afield she wept over herr weinschenk's top hat the way he raised his eyebrows at sight of her and let them fall over his regal bearing and his balancing fists her mother frau permanader saw further her daughter's future had troubled her for years for erika was at a disadvantage compared with other young girls of her age frau permanader not only did not go into society she was actually at war with it the conviction that the best people thought slightingly of her because of her two divorces had become almost a fixed idea and she read contempt and aversion where probably there was only indifference consul hermann hagenstrom for instance simple and liberal-minded man that he was would very likely have been perfectly glad to greet her on the street his money had only increased his joviality and good nature but she stared with her head flung back past his goose liver pate face which to use her own strong language she hated like the plague and her look of course distinctly forbade him so erika grew up outside her uncle's social circle she frequented no balls and had small chance of meeting eligible young gentlemen yet it was frau antonia's most ardent hope especially after she herself had failed in business as she said that her daughter might realize her own unfulfilled dream of a happy and advantageous marriage which should redound to the glory of the family and sink the mother's failure in final oblivion 
tony longed for this beyond everything and chiefly now for her brother's sake who had latterly shown so little optimism as a sign to him that the luck of the family was not yet lost that they were by no means at the end of their rope her second dowry the eighteen thousand dollar so magnanimously returned by herr perminator lay waiting for erica and directly frau antonia's practised glance marked the budding tenderness between her daughter and the director she began to trouble heaven with a prayer that herr weinschenk might be led to visit them he was he appeared in the first story where he was received by the three ladies mother daughter and granddaughter talked for ten minutes and promised to return another day for coffee and more leisurely conversation this too came to pass and the acquaintance progressed the director was a silesian by birth his old father in fact still lived in silesia but the family seemed not to come into consideration hugo being evidently a self-made man he had the self-consciousness of such men a not quite native rather insecure mistrustful exaggerated air his grammar was not perfect and his conversation was distinctly clumsy and his countrified frock-coat had shiny spots his cuffs with large jet cuff buttons were not quite fresh and the nail on the middle finger of his left hand had been crushed in some accident and was shrivelled and blackened the impression on the whole was rather unpleasing yet it did not prevent hugo weinschenk from being a highly worthy young man industrious and energetic with a yearly salary of twelve thousand marks current nor from being in erica grunlich's eyes handsome to boot frau perminator quickly looked him over and summed him up she talked freely with her mother and the senator it was clear to her that here was a case of two interests meeting and complementing each other director weinschenk was like erica devoid of every social connection the two were thus in a manner marked out for each other it was plainly the hand of god himself if the director who was nearing the forties his hair already sprinkled with gray desired to found a family appropriate to his station and connections here was an opening for him into one of the best circles in town calculated to advance him in his calling and consolidate his position as for erica's welfare frau perminator could feel confident that at least her own lot would be out of the question herr weinschenk had not the faintest resemblance to herr perminator and he was differentiated from bendix grunlich by his position as an old established official with a fixed salary which of course did not preclude a further career in a word much goodwill was shown on both sides herr weinschenk's visits followed each other in quick succession and by january january of the year eighteen sixty seven he permitted himself to make a brief and manly offer for erica grunlich's hand from now on he belonged to the family he came on children's day and was received civilly by the relatives of his betrothed he must soon have seen that he did not fit in very well but he concealed the fact under an increased assurance of manner while the frau consul uncle eustace and the senator though hardly the broad street budenbrokes practised a tactful complaisance toward the socially awkward hard-working official and tact was needed for pauses would come at the family table when director weinschenk tried to make conversation by asking if orange marmalade was a pudding when he gave out the opinion that romeo and juliet was a piece by schiller when his manner with erica's cheek or arm became too roguish 
he uttered his views frankly and cheerfully rubbing his hands like a man whose mind is free from care and leaning back sidewise against the arm of his chair some one always needed to fill in the pause by a sprightly or diverting remark he got on best with the senator who knew how to steer a safe course between politics and business his relations with gerda budenbroek were hopeless this lady's personality put him off to such a degree that he was incapable of finding anything to talk about with her for two minutes on end the fact that she played the violin made a strong impression upon him and he finally confined himself on each thursday afternoon encounter to the jovial inquiry well how's the fiddle after the third time however the frau senator refrained from reply christian on the other hand used to look at his new relative down his nose and the next day imitate him and his conversation with full details the second son of the deceased consul budenbroek had been relieved of his rheumatism in unhausen but a certain stiffness of the joints was left as well as the periodic misery in the left side where all the nerves were too short and sundry other ills to which he was heir as difficulty in breathing and swallowing irregularity of the heart action and a tendency to paralysis or at least to a fear of it he did not look like a man at the end of the thirties his head was entirely bald except for vestiges of reddish hair at the back of the neck and on the temples and his small round roving eyes lay deeper than ever in their sockets and his great bony nose and his lean sallow cheeks were startlingly prominent above his heavy drooping red moustaches his trousers of beautiful and lasting english stuff flapped about his crooked emaciated legs he had come back once more to his mother's house and had a room on the corridor of the first story but he spent more of his time at the club than in meng street for life there was not made any too pleasant for him riken sieverin ida jungmann's successor who now reigned over the frau consul's household and managed the servants had a peasant's instinct for hard facts she was a thick-set country-bred creature with coarse lips and fat red cheeks she perceived directly that it was not worth while to put herself out for this idle story-teller who was silly and ill by turns whom his brother the senator the real head of the family ignored with lifted eyebrows so she quite calmly neglected christian's wants gracious herr budenbroek she would say you needn't think as i've got time for the likes of you christian would look at her with his nose all wrinkled up as if to say aren't you ashamed of yourself and go his stiff-kneed way do you think he said to tony that i have a candle to go to bed by very seldom i generally take a match the sum his mother could allow him was small hard times he would say yes times were different once why what do you suppose sometimes i've had to borrow money for tooth powder christian cried frau permanader how undignified and going to bed with a match she was shocked and outraged in her deepest sensibilities but that did not mend matters the tooth-powder money christian borrowed from his old friend andreas giesecke doctor of civil and criminal jurisprudence he was fortunate in this friendship and it did him credit for dr giesecke though as much of a rake as christian knew how to keep his dignity 
he had been elected senator the preceding winter for dr Uverdeek had sunk gently to his long rest and dr Langhals sat in his place his elevation did not affect andreas giesecke's mode of life since his marriage with frulein huneus he had acquired a spacious house in the centre of the town but as everybody knew he also owned a certain comfortable little vine-clad villa in the suburb of saint gertrude which was charmingly furnished and occupied quite alone by a still young and uncommonly pretty person of unknown origin above the house door in ornamental gilt lettering was the word quisisana by which name the retired little dwelling was known throughout the town where they pronounced it with a very soft s and a very broad a christian budenbroek as senator giesecke's best friend had obtained entry into quisisana and been successful there as formerly with aline Pufogel in hamburg and on other occasions in london valparaiso and sundry other parts of the world he told a few stories and was a little friendly and now he visited the little vine-clad house on the same footing as senator giesecke himself whether this happened with the latter's knowledge and consent is of course doubtful what is certain is that christian found there without money and without price the same friendly relaxation as dr giesecke who however had to pay for the same with his wife's money a short time after the betrothal of hugo weinschenk and erika grunlich the director proposed to his relative that he should enter the insurance office and christian actually worked for two weeks in the service of the company but the misery in his side began to get worse and his other indefinable ills as well and the director proved to be a domineering superior who did not hesitate on the occasion of a little misunderstanding to call his relative a booby so christian felt constrained to leave this post too madame permanader at this period of the family's history was in such a joyful mood that her happiness found vent in shrewd observations about life how when all was said and done it had its good side truly she bloomed anew in these weeks and their invigorating activity the manifold plans the search for suitable quarters and the feverish preoccupation with furnishings brought back with such force the memories of her first betrothal that she could not but feel young again young and boundlessly hopeful much of the graceful high spirits of girlhood returned to her ways and movements indeed she profaned the mood of one entire jerusalem evening by such uncontrollable hilarity that even leah gerhardt let the book of her ancestor fall in her lap and stared about the room with the great innocent startled eyes of the deaf erica was not to be parted from her mother the director agreed nay it was even his wish that frau antonia should live with the weinshanks at least at first and help the inexperienced erica with her housekeeping and it was precisely this which called up in her the most priceless feeling as though no bendix grunlich or alois permanader had ever existed and all the trials disappointments and sufferings of her life were as nothing and she might begin anew and with fresh hopes she bade erica be grateful to god who bestowed upon her the one man of her desire whereas the mother had been obliged to offer up her first and dearest choice on the altar of duty and reason it was erica's name which with a hand trembling with joy she inscribed in the family book next to the directors but she tony budenbroke was the real bride 
it was she who might once more ransack furniture and upholstery shops and test hangings and carpets with a practised hand she who once more found and rented a truly elegant apartment it was she who was once more to leave the pious and roomy parental mansion and cease to be a divorced wife she who might once more lift her head and begin a new life calculated to arouse general remark and enhance the prestige of the family even was it a dream dressing gowns appeared upon the horizon two dressing gowns for erica and herself of soft woven stuff with close rows of velvet trimming from neck to hem the weeks fled by the last weeks of erica grunlich's maidenhood the young pair had made calls in only a few houses for the director a serious and preoccupied man with no social experience intended to devote what leisure he had to intimate domesticity there was a betrothal dinner in the great salon of the house in fisher's lane at which besides thomas and gerda there were present the bridal pair and henrietta friederica and fifi budenbroke and some close friends of the senator and the director continually pinched the bare shoulders of his fiancee rather to the disgust of the other guests and the wedding day drew near the marriage was solemnized in the columned hall as on that other occasion when it was frau grunlich who wore the myrtle frau stutt from belfounder street the same who moved in the best circles helped to arrange the folds of the bride's white satin gown and pin on the decorations the senator gave away the bride supported by christian's friend senator giesecke and two school friends of erica's acted as bridesmaids director hugo weinschenk looked imposing and manly and only trod once on erica's flowing veil on the way to the improvised altar pastor prinksheim held his hands clasped beneath his chin and performed the service with his accustomed air of sweet exultation and everything went off with dignity and according to rule when the rings were exchanged and the deep and the treble yes sounded in the hush both a trifle husky frau permanader overpowered by the past the present and the future burst into audible sobs just the unthinking unembarrassed tears of her childhood and the sisters budenbroke fifi in honor of the day was wearing a gold chain to her pince-nez smiled a little sourly as always on such occasions but mademoiselle weichbrot who had grown shorter with the lengthening years and had the oval brooch with the miniature of her mother around her thin neck sesame said with the disproportionate solemnity which hides deep emotion be happy you good child followed a banquet as solemn as solid beneath the eyes of the white olympians looking down composedly from their blue background as it drew toward its end the newly wedded pair disappeared to begin their wedding journey which was to include visits to several large cities all this was at the middle of april and in the next two weeks frau permanader assisted by the upholsterer jacobs accomplished one of her masterpieces she moved into and settled the spacious first story which she had rented in a house halfway down baker alley there in a bower of flowers she welcomed the married pair on their return and thus began tony budenbroke's third marriage yes this was really the right way to put it the senator himself one thursday afternoon when the weinschenks were not present had called it that and frau permanader quite relished the joke all the cares of the new household fell upon her but she reaped her reward in pride and pleasure one day she happened to meet on the street frau consul julken mullendorf born hagenstrom 
into whose face she looked with a challenging triumphant glance it actually dawned upon frau mullendorf that she had better speak first and she did tony waxed so important in her pride and joy when she showed off the new house to visiting relatives that little erica beside her seemed but a guest herself frau antonia displayed the house to their guests the train of her morning gown dragging behind her her shoulders up and her head thrown back carrying on her arm the key basket with its bow of satin ribbon she displayed the furniture the hangings the translucent porcelain the gleaming silver the large oil paintings these last had been purchased by the director and were nearly all still lifes of edibles or nude figures of women for such was hugo weinschenk's taste tony's every movement seemed to say see i have managed all this for the third time in my life it is almost as fine as grunlich's and much finer than permanator's the old frau consul came in a black and gray striped silk giving out a discreet odor of patchouli she surveyed everything with her pale calm eyes and without any loud expressions of admiration professed herself pleased with the effect the senator came with his wife and child he and gerda hugely enjoyed tony's blissful self-satisfaction and with difficulty prevented her from killing her adored little johann with currant bread and port wine the mrs budenbroke came and were unanimously of opinion that it was all very fine of course being modest people themselves they would not care to live in it poor lean gray patient hungry clotilde came submitted to the usual teasing and drank four cups of coffee praising everything the while in her usual friendly drawl even christian appeared now and then when there was nobody at the club drank a little glass of benedictine and talked about a project he had of opening an agency for champagne and brandy he knew the business and it was a light agreeable job in which a man could be his own master write now and then in a notebook and make thirty taller by turning over his hand then he borrowed a little money from frau permanator to buy a bouquet for the leading lady at the theatre came by god knows what train of thought to maria and the depravity in london and then lighted upon the story of the mangy dog that travelled all the way from valparaiso to san francisco in a hand satchel by this time he was in full swing and narrated with such gusto verve and irresistible drollery that he would have held a large audience spellbound he narrated like one inspired he possessed the gift of tongues he narrated in english spanish low german and hamburguese he depicted stabbing affrays in chile and pickpocketings in whitechapel he drew upon his repertory of comic songs and half sang half recited with incomparable pantomime and highly suggestive gesture i sauntered out one day in an idle sort o way and chanced to see a maid ahead o me she'd such a charmin air her back was french i'd swear and she wore her hat as rakish as could be i says my pretty dear since you and i are here perhaps you'd take me arm and walk along she turned her pretty head and looked at me and said you just get on my lad and hold your tongue from this he went off on an account of a performance at the rents circus in hamburg and reproduced a turn by a troupe of english vaudeville artists in such a way that you felt you were actually present there was the usual hubbub behind the curtain shouts of open the door will you quarrels with the ringmaster and then in a broad lugubrious english-german a whole string of stories 
the one about the man who swallowed a mouse in his sleep and went to the vet who advised him to swallow a cat and the one about my grandmother lively old girl she was who on her way to the railway station encounters all sorts of adventures ending with the train pulling out of the station in front of the nose of the lively old girl and then christian broke off with a triumphant orchestra and made as if he had just waked up and was very surprised that no music was forthcoming but quite suddenly he stopped his face changed his motions relaxed his deep little round eyes began to stray moodily about he rubbed his left side with his hand and seemed to be listening to uncanny sounds within himself he drank another glass of liqueur which relieved him a little then he tried to tell another story but broke down in a fit of depression frau permanader who in these days was uncommonly prone to laugh and had enjoyed the performance hugely accompanied her brother to the door in rather a prankish mood adieu herr agent said she minnesinger ninnysinger old goose come again soon she laughed full-throatedly behind him and went back into her house but christian did not mind he did not even hear her so deep was he in thought well he said to himself i'll go over to quisisana for a bit his hat a little awry leaning on his stick with the nun's bust for a handle he went slowly and stiffly down the steps end of section seventy two section seventy three of budenbrooks by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part eight chapter two in the spring of eighteen sixty eight one evening towards ten o'clock frau permanader entered the first story of her brother's house senator budenbroek sat alone in the living-room which was done in olive green rep with a large round centre table and a great gas lamp hanging down over it from the ceiling he had the berlin financial gazette spread out in front of him on the table and was reading it with a cigarette held between the first and second fingers of his left hand and a gold pince-nez on his nose he had now for some time been obliged to use glasses for reading he heard his sister's footsteps as she passed through the dining-room took off his glasses and peered into the darkness until tony appeared between the portieres and in the circle of light from the lamp oh is it you how are you back from Pupenrade? how are your friends evening tom thanks armgard is very well are you here alone yes i'm glad you have come i ate my dinner all alone to-night like the pope i don't count mamselle jungmann because she's always popping up to look after hanno gerda is at the casino christian fetched her to hear tamayo play the violin bless and save us as mother says yes i've noticed lately that gerda and christian get on quite well together yes i have too since he came back for good she seems to have taken to him she sits and listens to him when he tells about his troubles dear me i suppose he entertains her she said to me lately there is nothing of the burgher about christian thomas he is even less of a burgher than you are yourself burgher tom what did she mean why it seems to me there is no better burgher on top of the earth than you are oh well she didn't mean it just in that sense take off your things and sit down a while my child how splendid you look the country air did you good i'm in very good form she said as she took off her mantle and the hood with lilac silk ribbons and sat down with dignity in an easy chair by the table my sleep and my digestion both improved very much in this short time the fresh milk and the farm sausages and hams one thrives like the cattle and the crops 
and the honey tom i have always considered honey one of the very best of foods a pure nature product one knows just what one's eating yes it was really very sweet of armgard to remember an old boarding-school friendship and send me the invitation herr von meibohm was very polite too they urged me to stay a couple of weeks longer but i know erica is rather helpless without me especially now with little elizabeth how is the child doing nicely tom she's really not bad at all for four months even if henrietta and frederica and fifi did say she wouldn't live and weinschenk how does he like being a father i never see him except on thursdays oh he is just the same you know he is a very good hard-working man and in a way a model husband he never stops in anywhere but comes straight home from the office and spends all his free time with us but you see tom we can speak quite openly just between ourselves he requires erica to be always lively always laughing and talking because when he comes home tired and worried from the office he needs cheering up and his wife must amuse him and divert him idiot murmured the senator what well the bad thing about it is that erica is a little bit inclined to be melancholy she must get it from me tom sometimes she's very serious and quiet and thoughtful and then he scolds and grumbles and complains and really to tell the truth is not at all sympathetic you can't help seeing that he is a man of no family and never enjoyed what one would call a refined bringing up to be quite frank a few days before i went to Pupinrada, he threw the lid of the soup tureen on the floor and broke it because the soup was too salt how charming oh no it wasn't not at all but we must not judge god knows we are all weak creatures and a good capable industrious man like that heaven forbid no tom a rough shell with a sound kernel inside is not the worst thing in this life i've just come from something far sadder than that i can tell you armgard wept bitterly when she was alone with me you don't say is herr von meibohm yes tom that is what i wanted to tell you we sit here visiting but i really came to-night on a serious and important errand well what is the trouble with herr von meibohm he's a very charming man ralph von meibohm thomas but he's very wild a hale fellow well met with everybody he gambles in rostock and he gambles in varnamunda and his debts are like the sands of the sea nobody could believe it just living a couple of weeks at Pupanrada the house is lovely everything looks flourishing there is milk and sausage and ham and all that in great abundance so it is hard to measure the actual situation but their affairs are in frightful disorder armgard confessed it to me with heart-breaking sobs very sad you may well say so but as i had already suspected it turned out that i was not invited over there just for the sake of my beaux yeux how so i will tell you tom herr von meibohm needs a large sum of money immediately he knew the old friendship between his wife and me and he knew that i am your sister so in his extremity he put his wife up to it and she put me up to it you understand the senator passed his fingertips across his hair and screwed up his face a little i think so he said your serious and important business evidently concerns an advance on the Pupanrada harvest if i am not mistaken but you have come to the wrong man i think you and your friends in the first place i have never done any business with herr von meibohm and this would be a rather strange way to begin in the second place though in the past grandfather father and i myself have made advances on occasion to the landed gentry 
it was always when they offered a certain security either personally or through their connections but to judge from the way you have just characterized herr von meibaum and his prospects i should say there can be no security in his case you are mistaken tom i have let you have your say but you are mistaken it is not a question of an advance at all my bohm has to have thirty-five thousand marks current heavens and earth five and thirty thousand marks current to be paid within two weeks the knife is at his throat to be plain he has to sell at once immediately in the blade oh the poor chap the senator shook his head as he stood playing with his pince-nez on the tablecloth that is a rather unheard-of thing for our sort of business he went on i have heard of such things mostly in hesse where a few of the landed gentry are in the hands of the jews who knows what sort of cut-throat it is that has poor herr von meibohm in his clutches jews cut-throats cried frau permanader astonished beyond measure but it's you we are talking about tom thomas budenbroek suddenly threw down his pince-nez on the table so that it slid along on top of the newspaper and turned toward his sister with a jerk me he said but only with his lips for he made no sound then he added aloud go to bed tony you are tired out why tom that is what Ida young man used to say to us when we were just beginning to have a good time but i assure you i was never wider awake in my life than now coming over here in the dead of night to make armgard's offer to you or rather indirectly ralph von meibohm's and i will forgive you for making a proposal which is the product of your naivete and the meibohm's helplessness helplessness naivete thomas i don't understand you i am very far from understanding you you are offered an opportunity to do a good deed and at the same time the best stroke of business you ever did in your life oh my darling child you are talking the sheerest nonsense cried the senator throwing himself back impatiently in his chair i beg your pardon but you make me angry with your ridiculous innocence can't you understand that you are asking me to do something discreditable to engage in underhand manoeuvres why should i go fishing in troubled waters why should i fleece this poor landowner why should i take advantage of his necessity to do him out of a year's harvest at a usurious profit to myself oh is that the way you look at it said frau permanader quite taken aback and thoughtful but she recovered in a moment and went on but it is not at all necessary to look at it like that tom how are you forcing him when it is he who comes to you he needs the money and would like the matter arranged in a friendly way and under the rose that is why he traced out the connection between us and invited me to visit in short he has made a mistake in his calculations about me and the character of my firm i have my own traditions we have been in business a hundred years without touching that sort of transaction and i have no idea of beginning at this late day certainly tom you have your traditions and nobody respects them more than i do and i know father would not have done it god forbid who says he would but silly as i am i know enough to know that you are quite a different sort of man from father and since you took over the business it has been different from what it was before that is because you were young and had enterprise and brains but lately i am afraid you have let yourself get discouraged by this or that piece of bad luck and if you are no longer having the same success you once did it is because you have been too cautious and conscientious and let slip your chances for good coups when you had them oh my dear child stop please you irritate me said the senator sharply and turned away let us change the subject 
yes you are vexed tom i can see it you were from the beginning and i have kept on on purpose to show you you are wrong to feel yourself insulted but i know the real reason why you are vexed it is because you are not so firmly decided not to touch the business i know i am silly but i have noticed about myself and about other people too that we are most likely to get angry and excited in our opposition to some idea when we ourselves are not quite certain of our own position and are inwardly tempted to take the other side very fine said the senator bit his cigarette holder and was silent fine no it's very simple one of the simplest things life has taught me but let it go tom i won't urge you don't imagine that i think i could persuade you i know i don't know enough i'm only a silly female it's a pity well never mind it interested me very much on the one hand i was shocked and upset about the mybombs but on the other i was pleased for you i said to myself tom has been going about lately feeling very down in the mouth he used to complain but now he does not even complain any more he has been losing money and times are poor and all that just now when god has been good to me and i am feeling happier than i have for a long time so i thought this would be something for him a stroke of luck a good coup it would offset a good deal of misfortune and show people that luck is still on the side of the firm of johann budenbroek and if you had undertaken it i should have been so proud to have been the means for you know it has always been my dream and my one desire to be of some good to the family name well never mind it is settled now what i feel vexed about is that my bomb has to sell in any case and if he looks around in the town here he will find a purchaser and it will be that rascal hermann hagenstrom oh yes he probably would not refuse it the senator said bitterly and frau permanator answered three times one after the other you see you see you see Thomas Budenbroke suddenly began to shake his head and laugh angrily. We are silly. We sit here and work ourselves up, at least you do, over something that is neither here nor there. So far as I know, I have not even asked what the thing is about, what Herr von Maibohm actually has to sell. I don't know, Pupenrada. Oh, you would have had to go there, she said eagerly it's not far from here to rostock and from there it's no distance at all and as for what he has to sell pupenrada is a large estate i know for a fact that it grows more than a thousand sacks of wheat but i don't know details about rye oats or barley there might be five hundred sacks of them more or less everything is of the best i can say that but i can't give you any figures i'm such a goose tom you would have to go over a pause ensued no it is not worth wasting words over the senator said decidedly he folded his pince-nez and put it into his pocket buttoned up his coat and began to walk up and down the room with firm and rapid strides which studiously betrayed no sign that he was giving the subject any further consideration he paused by the table and turned toward his sister drumming lightly on the surface with his bent forefinger as he said i'll tell you a little story my dear tony which will illustrate my attitude toward this affair i know your weakness for the nobility and the mecklenburg nobility in particular please don't mind if one of these gentry gets wrapped a bit you know there is now and then one among them who doesn't treat the merchant classes with any great respect though perfectly aware that he can't do without them such a man is too much inclined to lay stress on the superiority to a certain extent undeniable of the producer over the middleman in short he sometimes acts as if the merchant 
were like a peddling jew to whom one sells old clothes quite conscious that one is being overreached i flatter myself that in my dealings with these gentry i have not usually made the impression of a morally inferior exploiter to tell the truth the boot has sometimes been on the other foot i have run across men who were far less scrupulous than i am but in one case it only needed a single bold stroke to bring me into social relations the man was the lord of gross poggendorf of whom you have surely heard i had considerable dealings with him some while back count strelitz a very smart appearing man with a square eye-glass i could never make out why he did not cut himself patent leather top boots and a riding whip with a gold handle he had a way of looking down at me from a great height with his eyes half shut and his mouth half open my first visit to him was very telling we had had some correspondence i drove over and was ushered by a servant into the study where count strelitz was sitting at his writing-table he returns my bow half gets up finishes the last lines of a letter then he turns to me and begins to talk business looking over the top of my head i lean on the sofa table cross my arms and my legs and enjoy myself i stand five minutes talking after another five minutes i sit down on the table and swing my leg we get on with our business and at the end of fifteen minutes he says to me very graciously won't you sit down beg pardon i say oh don't mention it i've been sitting for some time did you say that really cried frau perminator enchanted she had straightway forgotten all that had gone before and lived for the moment entirely in the anecdote i've been sitting for some time oh that is too good well and i assure you that the count altered his tune he shook hands when i came and asked me to sit down in the course of time we became very friendly but i have told you this in order to ask you if you think i should have the right or the courage or the inner self-confidence to behave in the same way to herr von meibohm if when we met to discuss the bargain he were to forget to offer me a chair frau perminator was silent good she said then and got up you may be right and as i said i'm not going to press you you know what you must do and what leave undone and that's an end of it if you only feel that i spoke in good part you do don't you all right good night tom or no wait i must go and say how do you do to the good ida and give hanno a little kiss i'll look in again on my way out with that she went end of section seventy three Section seventy four of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann, translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part eight, chapter three. She mounted the stairs to the second story, left the little balcony on her right, went along the white and gold balustrade and through an antechamber the door of which stood open on the corridor and from which a second exit to the left led into the senator's dressing-room here she softly turned the handle of the door opposite and went in it was an unusually large chamber the windows of which were draped with flowered curtains the walls were rather bare aside from a large black-framed engraving above edith's bed representing giacomo meyerbeer surrounded by the characters in his operas there was nothing but a few english colored prints of children with yellow hair and little red frocks pinned to the window hangings ida jungmann sat at the large extension table in the middle of the room darning hanno's stockings the faithful prussian was now at the beginning of the fifties she had begun early to grow gray but her hair had never become quite white having remained a mixture of black and gray 
her erect bony figure was as sturdy and her brown eyes as bright clear and unwearied as twenty years ago well ida you good soul said frau perminator in a low but lively voice for her brother's little story had put her in good spirits and how are you you old stand by you what's that tony stand by is it and how do you come to be here so late i've been with my brother on pressing business unfortunately it didn't turn out is he asleep she asked and gestured with her chin toward the little bed on the left wall its head close to the door that led into the parents sleeping chamber Shh, said ida yes he is asleep frau perminator went on her tiptoes toward the little bed cautiously raised the curtain and bent to look down at her sleeping nephew's face the small johann budenbroek lay on his back his little face in its frame of long light brown hair turned toward the room he was breathing softly but audibly into the pillow only the fingers showed beneath the too long too wide sleeves of his nightgown one of his hands lay on his breast the other on the coverlet with the bent fingers jerking slightly now and then the half-parted lips moved a little too as if forming words from time to time a pained expression mounted over the little face beginning with a trembling of the chin making the lips and the delicate nostrils quiver and the muscles of the narrow forehead contract the long dark eyelashes did not hide the blue shadows that lay in the corners of the eyes he is dreaming said frau perminator moved she bent over the child and gently kissed his slumbering cheek then she composed the curtains and went back to the table where ida in the golden light from the lamp drew a fresh stocking over her darning ball looked at the hole and began to fill it in you are darning ida funny i can't imagine you doing anything else yes yes tony the boy tears everything now he has begun to go to school but he is such a quiet gentle child yes he is but even so does he like going to school oh no tony he would far rather have gone on here with me and i should have liked it better too the masters haven't known him since he was a baby the way i have they don't know how to take him when they are teaching him it is often hard for him to pay attention and he gets tired so easily poor darling have they whipped him yet no indeed sakes alive how could they have the heart if the boy once looked at them how was it the first time he went did he cry yes indeed he did he cries so easily not loud but sort of to himself and he held your brother by the coat and begged to be allowed to stop at home oh my brother took him did he yes that is a hard moment ida i remember it like yesterday i howled i do assure you i howled like a chained-up dog i felt dreadfully and why because i had had such a good time at home i noticed at once that all the children from the nice houses wept and the others not at all they just stared and grinned at us goodness what is the matter with him ida she turned in alarm toward the little bed where a cry had interrupted her chatter it was a frightened cry and it repeated itself in an even more anguished tone the next minute and then three four five times more one after another oh 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 it became a loud desperate protest against something which he saw or which was happening to him the next moment little johann sat upright in bed stammering incomprehensibly and staring with wide open strange golden brown eyes into a world which he and he alone could see that's nothing said ida it is the pavor it is sometimes much worse than that 
she put her work down calmly and crossed the room with her long heavy stride to hanaud's bed she spoke to him in a low quieting voice laid him down and covered him again oh i see the pavor repeated frau permenader what will he do now will he wake up but hanaud did not waken at all though his eyes were wide and staring and his lips still moved in my little garden go said hanaud mumblingly all my onions water he is saying his piece explained Ida Jungmann, shaking her head there there little darling go to sleep now little man stands stands there he begins to sneeze he sighed suddenly his face changed his eyes half closed he moved his head back and forth on the pillow and said in a low plaintive sing-song the moon it shines the baby cries the clock strikes twelve god help all suffering folk to close their eyes but with the words came so deep a sob that tears rolled out from under his lashes and down his cheeks and wakened him he put his arms around ida looked about him with tear-wet eyes murmured something in a satisfied tone about aunt tony turned himself a little in his bed and then went quietly off to sleep how very strange said frau permenader as ida sat down at the table once more what was all that they are in his reader answered fraulein jungmann it says underneath the boy's magic horn they are all rather queer he has been having to learn them and he talks a great deal about that one with the little man do you know it it is really rather frightening it is a little dwarf that gets into everything eats up the broth and breaks the pot steals the wood stops the spinning wheel teases everybody and then at the end he asks to be prayed for it touched the child very much he has thought about it day in and day out and two or three times he said you know ida he doesn't do that to be wicked but only because he is unhappy and it only makes him more unhappy still but if any one prays for him then he does not need to do it any more even to-night when his mamma kissed him good-night before she went to the concert he asked her to pray for the little man and did he pray too not aloud but probably to himself he hasn't said much about the other poem it is called the nursery clock he has only wept he weeps so easy poor little lad and it is so hard for him to stop but what is there so sad about it how do i know he has never been able to say any more than the beginning of it the part that makes him cry in his sleep and that about the wagoner who gets up at three from his bed of straw that always made him weep too frau permenader laughed emotionally and then looked serious i'll tell you ida it's no good it isn't good for him to feel everything so much the wagoner gets up at three from his bed of straw why of course he does that's why he is a wagoner i can see already that the child takes everything too much to heart it consumes him i feel sure we must speak seriously with grabo but there that is just what it is she went on folding her arms putting her head on one side and tapping the floor nervously with her foot grabo is getting old and aside from that good as he is and he really is a very good man a perfect angel so far as his skill is concerned i have no such great opinion of it ida and may god forgive me if i am wrong take this nervousness of hanno's his starting up at night and having such frights in his sleep grabo knows what it is and all he does is to tell us the latin name of it pavor nocturnus dear knows that is very enlightening of course 
no he is a dear good man and a great friend of the family and all that but he is no great light an important man looks different he shows when he is young that there is something in him grabo lived through forty-eight he was a young man then do you imagine he was the least bit thrilled over it over freedom and justice and the downfall of privilege and arbitrary power he is a cultivated man but i am convinced that the unheard-of laws concerning the press and the universities did not interest him in the least he has never behaved even the least little bit wild never jumped over the traces he has always had just the same long mild face and always prescribed pigeon and french bread and when anything is serious a teaspoon of tincture of althea good night ida now i think there are other doctors in the world too bad i have missed gerda yes thanks there is a light in the corridor good night when frau permanator opened the dining-room door in passing to call a good night to her brother in the living-room she saw that the whole story was lighted up and that thomas was walking up and down with his hands behind his back End of section seventy four Section seventy five of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann, translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part eight, chapter four. The senator, when he was alone again, sat down at the table, took out his glasses, and tried to resume his reading but in a few minutes his eyes had roved from the printed page and he sat for a long time without changing his position gazing straight ahead of him between the portieres into the darkness of the salon his face when he was alone changed so that it was hardly recognizable the muscles of his mouth and cheeks otherwise obedient to his will relaxed and became flabby like a mask the look of vigor alertness and amiability which now for a long time had been preserved only by constant effort fell from his face and betrayed an anguished weariness instead the tired worried eyes gazed at objects without seeing them they became red and watery he made no effort to deceive even himself and of all the dull confused and rambling thoughts that filled his mind he clung to only one the single despairing thought that thomas budenbroek at forty-three years was an old worn-out man he rubbed his hand over his eyes and forehead drawing a long deep breath mechanically lighted another cigarette though he knew they were bad for him and continued to gaze through the smoke haze into the darkness what a contrast between that relaxed and suffering face and the elegant almost military style of the hair and beard the stiffened and perfumed moustaches the meticulously shaven cheeks and chin and the careful hair-dressing which sedulously hid a beginning thinness the hair ran back in two longish bays from the delicate temples with a narrow parting on top over the ears it was not long and waving but kept short-cut now in order not to betray how gray it had grown he himself felt the change and knew it could not have escaped the eyes of others the contrast between his active elastic movements and the dull pallor of his face not that he was in reality less of an important and indispensable personage than he always had been his friends said and his enemies could not deny that senator budenbroek was the burgomaster's right hand burgomaster longhaus was even more emphatic on that point than his predecessor uverdeek had been but the firm of johann budenbroek was no longer what it had been this seemed to be common property so much so that herr stutt discussed it with his wife over their bacon broth and thomas budenbroek groaned over the fact 
at the same time it was true that he himself was mainly responsible he was still a rich man and none of the losses he had suffered even the severe one of the year sixty six had seriously undermined the existence of the firm but the notion that his luck and his consequence had fled based though it was more upon inward feelings than upon outward facts brought him to a state of lowness and suspicion he entertained of course as before and set before his guests the normal and expected number of courses but as never before he began to cling to money and in his private life to save in small and petty ways he had a hundred times regretted the building of his new house which he felt had brought him nothing but bad luck the summer holidays were given up and the little city garden had to take the place of mountains or seashore the family meals were by his express and emphatic command of such simplicity as to seem absurd by contrast with the lofty splendid dining-room with its extent of parquetry floors and its imposing oak furniture for a long time now there had been dessert only on sundays his own appearance was as elegant as ever but the old servant anton carried to the kitchen the news that the master only changed his shirt now every other day as the washing was too hard on the fine linen he knew more than that he knew that he was to be dismissed gerda protested three servants were few enough to do the work of so large a house as it should be done but it was no use old anton who had so long sat on the box when thomas budenbroke drove down to the senate was sent away with a suitable present such decrees as these were in harmony with the joyless state of affairs in the firm that fresh enterprising spirit with which young thomas budenbroke had taken up the reins that was all gone now and his partner herr friedrich wilhelm marcus who with his small capital could not have had a prepondering influence in any case was by nature lacking in initiative herr marcus's pedantry had so increased in the course of years that it had become a distinct eccentricity it took him a quarter of an hour of stroking his moustaches casting side glances and giving little coughs just to cut his cigar and put the tip in his pocket-book evenings when the gas-light made every corner of the office as bright as day he still used a tallow candle on his own desk every half-hour he would get up and go to the tap and put water on his head one morning there had been an empty sack untidily left under his desk he took it for a cat and began to shoo it out with loud imprecations to the joy of the office staff no he was not the man to give any quickening impulse to the business in the face of his partner's present lassitude mortification and a sort of desperate irritation often seized upon the senator as now when he sat and stared wearily into the darkness bringing home to himself the petty retail transactions and the penny-wise policies to which the firm of johann budenbroke had lately sunk but after all was it not best thus misfortune too has its time he thought is it not better while it holds sway to keep one's self still to wait in quiet and assemble one's inner powers why must this proposition come up just now to shake him untimely out of his canny resignation and make him a prey to doubts and suspicions was the time come was this a sign should he feel encouraged to stand up and strike a blow he had refused with all the decisiveness he could put into his voice to think of the proposition but had that settled it it seemed not 
since here he sat and brooded over it we are most likely to get angry in our opposition to some idea when we ourselves are not quite certain of our own position a deucedly sly little person tony was what had he answered her he had spoken very impressively he recollected about underhand manoeuvres fishing in troubled waters fleecing the poor landowner usury and so on very fine but really one might ask if this were just the right time for so many large words consul hermann hagenstrom would not have thought of them and would not have used them was he thomas budenbroek a man of action a business man or was he a finicking dreamer yes that was the question it had always been as far back as he could remember the question life was harsh and business with its ruthless unsentimentality was an epitome of life did thomas budenbroek like his father stand firmly on his two feet in face of this hard practicality of life often enough even far back in the past he had seen reason to doubt it often enough from his youth onwards he had sternly brought his feelings into line to inflict punishment to take punishment and not to think of it as punishment but as something to be taken for granted should he never completely learn that lesson he recalled the catastrophe of the year eighteen sixty six and the inexpressibly painful emotions which had then overpowered him he had lost a large sum of money in the affair but that had not been the unbearable thing about it for the first time in his career he had fully and personally experienced the ruthless brutality of business life and seen how all better gentler and kindlier sentiments creep away and hide themselves before the one raw naked dominating instinct of self-preservation he had seen that when one suffers a misfortune in business one is met by one's friends and one's best friends not with sympathy not with compassion but with suspicion cold cruel hostile suspicion but he had known all this before why should he be surprised at it and in stronger and hardier hours he had blushed for his own weakness for his own distress and sleepless nights for his revulsion and disgust at the hateful and shameless harshness of life how foolish all that was how ridiculous such feelings had been how could he entertain them unless indeed he were a feeble visionary and not a practical business man at all ah how many times had he asked himself that question and how many times had he answered it in strong and purposeful hours with one answer in weak and discouraged ones with another but he was too shrewd and too honest not to admit after all that he was a mixture of both all his life he had made the impression on others of a practical man of action but in so far as he legitimately passed for one he with his fondness for quotations from goethe was it not because he deliberately set out to do so he had been successful in the past but was that not because of the enthusiasm and impetus drawn from reflection and if he were now discouraged if his powers were lamed god grant it was only for a time was not his depression the natural consequence of the conflict that went on within himself whether his father grandfather and great-grandfather would have bought the pupenrata harvest in the blade was not the point after all the thing was that they were practical men more naturally more vigorously more impeccably practical 
than he was himself he was seized by a great unrest by a need for movement space and light he shoved back his chair went into the salon and lighted several burners of the chandelier over the centre table he stood there pulling slowly and spasmodically at the long ends of his moustaches and vacantly gazing about the luxurious room together with the living room it occupied the whole front of the house it had light ornate furniture and looked like a music room with the great grand piano gerda's violin case the etagere with music books the carved music stand and the bas-reliefs of singing cupids over the doors the bow window was filled with palms senator budenbroek stood for two or three minutes motionless then he went back through the living room into the dining room and made light there also he stopped at the sideboard and poured a glass of water either to be doing something or to quiet his heart then he moved quickly on through the house lighting up as he went the smoking room was furnished in dark colors and wainscoted he absently opened the door of the cigar cabinet and shut it again and at the table lifted the lid of a little oak box which had playing cards score cards and other such things in it he let some of the bone counters glide through his fingers with a rattling sound clapped the lid shut and began again to walk up and down a little room with a small stained glass window opened into the smoking room it was empty except for some small light serving tables of the kind which fit one within another on one of them a liqueur cabinet stood from here one entered the dining room with its great extent of parquetry flooring and its four high windows hung with wine-colored curtains looking out into the garden it also occupied the whole breadth of the house it was furnished by two low heavy sofas covered with the same wine-colored material as the curtains and by a number of high-backed chairs standing stiffly along the walls behind the fire screen was a chimney-place its artificial coals covered with shining red paper to make them look glowing on the marble mantel-shelf in front of the mirror stood two towering chinese vases the whole story was now lighted by the flame of single gas jets and looked like a party the moment after the last guest is gone the senator measured the room throughout its length and then stood at one of the windows and looked down into the garden the moon stood high and small between fleecy clouds and the little fountain splashed in the stillness over the overhanging boughs of the walnut tree thomas looked down on the pavilion which enclosed his view on the little glistening white terrace with the two obelisks the regular gravel paths and the freshly turned earth of the neat borders and beds but this whole minute and punctilious symmetry far from soothing him only made him feel the more exasperated he held the catch of the window leaned his forehead on it and gave rein to his tormenting thoughts again what was he coming to he thought of a remark he had let fall to his sister something he had felt vexed with himself the next minute for saying it seemed so unnecessary he was speaking of count strelitz and the landed aristocracy and he had expressed the view that the producer had a social advantage over the middleman what was the point of that it might be true and it might not but was he thomas budenbroek called upon to express such ideas was he called upon even to think them should he have been able to explain to the satisfaction of his father his grandfather or any of his fellow townsmen how he came to be expressing or indulging in such thoughts a man who stands firm and confident in his own calling whatever it may be recognizes only it understands only it values only it 
then he suddenly felt the blood rushing to his face as he recalled another memory from farther back in the past he saw himself and his brother christian walking around the garden of the meng street house involved in a quarrel one of those painful regrettable heated discussions christian with artless indiscretion had made a highly undesirable but compromising remark which a number of people had heard and thomas furiously angry irritated to his last degree had called him to account at bottom christian had said at bottom every business man was a rascal well was that foolish and trifling remark in point of fact so different from what he himself had just said to his sister he had been furiously angry then had protested violently but what was it that sly little tony said when we ourselves are not quite certain of our own position no said the senator suddenly aloud lifted his head with a jerk and let go the window fastening he fairly pushed himself away from it that settles it he said he coughed for the sound of his own voice in the emptiness made him feel unpleasant he turned and began to walk quickly through all the rooms his hands behind his back and his head bowed that settles it he repeated it will have to settle it i am wasting time i am sinking into a morass i'm getting worse than christian it was something to be glad of at least that he was in no doubt where he stood it lay then in his own hands to apply the corrective relentlessly let us see now let us see what sort of offer was it they had made the Pupinrada harvest in the blade i will do it he said in a passionate whisper even stretching out one hand and shaking the forefinger i will do it it would be he supposed what one would call a coup an opportunity to double a capital of say forty thousand marks current though that was probably an exaggeration yes it was a sign a signal to him that he should rouse himself it was the first step the beginning that counted and the risk connected with it was a sort of offset to his moral scruples if it succeeded then he was himself again then he would venture once more then he would know how to hold fortune and influence fast within his grip no messrs strunk and hagenstrom would not be able to profit by this occasion unfortunately for them there was another firm in the place which thanks to personal connections had the upper hand in fact the personal was here the decisive factor it was no ordinary business to be carried out in the ordinary way coming through tony as it had it bore more the character of a private transaction and would need to be carried out with discretion and tact hermann hagenstrom would hardly have been the man for the job he thomas budenbroke as a business man was taking advantage of the market and he would by god when he sold know how to do the same on the other hand he was doing the hard-pressed landowner a favor which he was called upon to do by reason of tony's connection with the mybombs the thing to do was to write to write this evening not on the business paper with the firm name but on his own personal letter paper with senator budenbroke stamped across it he would write in a courteous tone and ask if a visit in the next few days would be agreeable but it was a difficult business none the less slippery ground upon which one needed to move with care well so much the better for him his step grew quicker his breathing deeper he sat down a moment sprang up again and began roaming about through all the rooms he thought it all out again he thought about herr marcus 
Hermann Hagenstrom, Christian, and Tony, he saw the golden harvests of Pupenrada wave in the breeze, and dreamed of the upward bound the old firm would take after this coup, scornfully repulsed all his scruples and hesitations, put out his hand and said, I'll do it. Frau Permanator opened the door and called out good-bye. He answered her without knowing it. Gerda said good-night to Christian at the house door and came upstairs, her strange deep-set eyes wearing the expression that music always gave them. The senator stopped mechanically in his walk, asked mechanically about the concert and the Spanish virtuoso, and said he was ready to go to bed. But he did not go. He took up his wanderings again. He thought about the sacks of wheat and rye and oats and barley which should fill the lofts of the lion, the walrus, the oak, and the linden. He thought about the price he intended to ask. Of course it should not be an extravagant price. He went softly at midnight down into the counting-house, and by the light of Herr Marcus's tallow candle wrote a letter to Herr von Maibohm of Pupenrade, a letter which as he read it through, his head feeling feverish and heavy, he thought was the best and most tactful he had ever written. That was the night of May 27th. The next day he indicated to his sister, treating the affair in a light, semi-humorous way, that he had thought it all over, and decided that he could not just refuse Herr von Maibohm out of hand, and leave him at the mercy of the nearest swindler. On the 30th of May he went to Rostock, whence he drove, in a hired wagon, out to the country. His mood, for the next few days, was of the best. His step elastic and free, his manners easy. He teased Clotilde, laughed heartily at Christiane, joked with Tony, and played with Hanno in the little gallery for a whole hour on Sunday, helping him to hoist up miniature sacks of grain into a little brick-red granary, and imitating the hollow drawling shouts of the workmen. And at the Burgess's meeting of the 3rd of June, he made a speech on the most tiresome subject in the world, something connected with taxation, which was so brilliant and witty that everybody agreed with it unanimously, and Consul Hagenstrom, who had opposed him, became almost a laughing stock. End of section 75《セクション76 of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann》Translated by Helen Tracy Lowe Porter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Read by Bruce Peary Part 8 Chapter 5 Was it forgetfulness, or was it intention, which would have made Senator Budenbrook pass over in silence a certain fact had not his sister tony the devotee of the family papers announced it to all the world the fact namely that in those documents the founding of the firm of johann budenbroek was ascribed to the date of the seventh of july seventeen sixty eight the hundredth anniversary of which was now at hand Thomas seemed almost disturbed when tony in a moving voice called his attention to the fact his good mood had not lasted. All too soon he had fallen silent again, more silent than before. He would leave the office in the midst of work, seized with unrest, and roam about the garden, sometimes pausing as if he felt confined in his movements, sighing and covering his eyes with his hand. He said nothing, gave his feelings no vent. To whom should he speak, then? When he told his partner of the Pupenrada matter, Herr Marcus had, for the first time in his life, been angry with him, and had washed his hands of the whole affair. 
but thomas betrayed himself to his sister tony when they said good-bye on the street one thursday evening and she alluded to the pupenrada harvest he gave her hand a single quick squeeze and added passionately oh tony if i had only sold it already he broke off abruptly and they parted leaving frau permanader dismayed and anxious the sudden hand pressure had something despairing the low words betrayed pent-up feeling but when tony as chance offered tried to come back to the subject he wrapped himself in silence the more forbidding because of his inward mortification over having given way his inward bitterness at being he felt feeble and inadequate to the situation in hand he said now slowly and fretfully oh my dear child i wish we might ignore the whole affair ignore it tom impossible unthinkable do you think you could suppress the fact do you imagine the whole town would forget the meaning of the day i don't say it is possible i only say i wish it were it is pleasant to celebrate the past when one is gratified with the present and the future it is agreeable to think of one's forefathers when one feels at one with them and conscious of having acted as they would have done if the jubilee came at a better time but just now i feel small inclination to celebrate it you must not talk like that tom you don't mean it you know perfectly that it would be a shame to let the hundredth anniversary of the firm of johann budenbroek go by without a sign or a sound of rejoicing you are a little nervous now and i know why though there is really no reason for it but when the day comes you will be as moved as all the rest of us she was right the day could not be passed over in silence it was not long before a notice appeared in the papers calling attention to the coming anniversary and giving a detailed history of the old and estimable firm but it was really hardly necessary in the family eustace kruger was the first to mention the approaching event on the thursday afternoon and frau permanader saw to it that the venerable leather portfolio was solemnly brought out after dessert was cleared away and the whole family by way of foretaste perused the dates and events in the life of the first johann budenbroek hanno's great-great-grandfather when he had varioloid and when genuine smallpox when he fell out of the third-story window on to the floor of the drying-house and when he had fever and delirium she read all that aloud with pious fervour not content with that she must go back into the sixteenth century to the oldest budenbroke of whom there was knowledge to the one who was councillor in grabau and the rostock tailor who had been very well off and had so many children living and dead what a splendid man she cried and began to rummage through yellow papers and read letters and poems aloud on the morning of the seventh of july herr wenzel was naturally the first with his congratulations well herr center many happy returns he said gesturing freely with razor and strop in his red hands a hundred years and nearly half of it i may say i have been shaving in the respected family oh yes one goes through a deal with the family when one sees the head of it the first thing in the morning the deceased herr consul was always the most talkative in the morning too wenzel he would ask me wenzel what do you think about the rye should i sell or do you think it will go up again yes wenzel and i can't think of these years without you either your calling as i've often said to you has a certain charm about it when you have made your rounds you are wiser than anybody you have had the heads of nearly all the great houses under your hand and know the mood of each one all the others can envy you that for it is really valuable information 
it's a good bit of truth in that herr senator but what about the herr senator's own mood if i may be so bold to ask herr senator's looking a trifle pale again this morning am i well i have a headache and so far as i can see it will get worse before it gets better for i suspect they'll put a good deal of strain on it to-day i'm afraid so herr senator the interest is great the interest is very great just look out a window when i'm done with you hosts of flags and down at the bottom of the street the wulenweber and the friederike uverdijk with all their pennons flying well let's be quick then Vincent. there's no time to lose evidently the senator did not don his office jacket as he usually did of a morning but put on at once a black cutaway coat with a white waistcoat and light-coloured trousers there would certainly be visits he gave a last glance in the mirror a last pressure of the tongs to his moustache and turned with a little sigh to go the dance was beginning if only the day were well over would he have a single minute to himself a single minute to relax the muscles of his face all day long he should certainly have to receive with tact and dignity the congratulations of a host of people find just the right word and just the right tone for everybody be serious hearty ironic jocose and respectful by turns and from afternoon late into the night there would be the dinner at the rat's keller it was not true that his head ached he was only tired already though he had just risen with his nerves refreshed by sleep he felt his old indefinable burden upon him why had he said his head ached as though he always had a bad conscience where his own health was concerned why why however there was no time now to brood over the question he went into the dining-room where gerda met him gaily she too was already arrayed to meet their guests in a plaid skirt a white blouse and a thin silk zouave jacket over it the colour of her heavy hair she smiled and showed her white teeth so large and regular whiter than her white face her eyes those close-set enigmatic brown eyes were smiling too to-day i've been up for hours you can tell from that how excited i am she said and how hearty my congratulations are well well so the hundred years made an impression on you too tremendous but perhaps it is only the excitement of the celebration what a day look at that for instance she pointed to the breakfast table all garlanded with garden flowers that is fraulein jungmann's work but you are mistaken if you think you can drink tea now the family is in the drawing-room already waiting to make a presentation something in which i too have had a share listen thomas this is of course only the beginning of a stream of callers at first i can stand it but at about midday i shall have to withdraw i am sure the barometer has fallen a little but the sky is still the most staring blue it makes the flags look lovely of course and the whole town is flagged but it will be frightfully hot come into the salon breakfast must wait you should have been up before now the first excitement will have to come on an empty stomach the Frau Consul, Christian, Clotilde, Ida Jungmann, Frau Permanader, and Hanno were assembled in the salon, the last two supporting, not without difficulty, the family present, a great commemorative tablet. The Frau Consul, deeply moved, embraced her eldest born. This is a wonderful day, my dear son, a wonderful day she repeated we must thank god unceasingly with all our hearts for his mercies for all his mercies she wept 
the senator was attacked by weakness in her embrace he felt as though something within him freed itself and flew away his lips trembled an overwhelming need possessed him to lay his head upon his mother's breast to close his eyes in her arms to breathe in the delicate perfume that rose from the soft silk of her gown to lie there at rest seeing nothing more saying nothing more he kissed her and stood erect putting out his hand to his brother who greeted him with the absent-minded embarrassment which was his usual bearing on such occasions clotilde drawled out something kindly ida jungmann confined herself to making a deep bow while she played with the silver watch-chain on her flat bosom come here tom said frau permanader uncertainly we can't hold it any longer can we hanno she was holding it almost alone for hanno's little arms were not much help and she looked what with her enthusiasm and her effort like an enraptured martyr her eyes were moist her cheeks burned and her tongue played with a mixture of mischief and nervousness on her upper lip here i am said the senator what in the world is this come let me have it we'll lean it against the wall he propped it up next to the piano and stood looking at it surrounded by the family in a large heavy frame of carved nutwood were the portraits of the four owners of the firm under glass there was the founder johann budenbroek taken from an old oil painting a tall grave old gentleman with his lips firmly closed looking severe and determined above his lace jabot there was the broad and jovial countenance of johann budenbroek the friend of jean jacques hofstede there was consul johann budenbroek in a stiff choker collar with his wide wrinkled mouth and large aquiline nose his eyes full of religious fervor and finally there was thomas budenbroek himself as a somewhat younger man the four portraits were divided by conventionalized blades of wheat heavily gilded and beneath likewise in figures of brilliant gilt the dates seventeen sixty eight to eighteen sixty eight above the whole in the tall gothic hand of him who had left it to his descendants was the quotation my son attend with zeal to thy business by day but do none that hinders thee from thy sleep at night the senator his hands behind his back gazed for a long time at the tablet yes yes he said abruptly and his tone was rather mocking an undisturbed night's rest is a very good thing then seriously if perhaps a little perfunctorily thank you very much my dear family it is indeed a thoughtful and most beautiful gift what do you think where shall we put it shall we hang it in my private office yes tom over the desk in your office answered frau permanader and embraced her brother then she drew him into the bow window and pointed under a deep blue sky the two-colored flag floated above all the houses right down fisher's lane from broad street to the wharf where the wohlenwever and the friederike uverdijk lay under full flag in their owner's honor the whole town is the same said frau permanader and her voice trembled i've been out and about already even the hagenstroms have a flag they couldn't do otherwise i'd smash in their window he smiled and they went back to the table together and here are the telegrams tom the first ones to come the personal ones of course the others have been sent to the office they opened a few of the dispatches from the family in hamburg from the frankfurt budenbroeks from herr arnoldson in amsterdam from jurgen kruger in wismar suddenly frau permanader flushed deeply he is a good man in his way she said and pushed across to her brother the telegram she had just opened it was signed permanader 
but time is passing said the senator and looked at his watch i'd like my tea will you come in with me the house will be like a beehive after a while his wife who had given a sign to eat a young man held him back just a minute thomas you know hanno has to go to his lessons he wants to say a poem to you first come here hanno and now just as if no one else were here you remember don't be excited it was the summer holidays of course but little hanno had private lessons in arithmetic in order to keep up with his class somewhere out in the suburb of st gertrude in a little ill-smelling room a man in a red beard with dirty fingernails was waiting to discipline him in the detested tables but first he was to recite to papa a poem painfully learned by heart with Ida Jungmann's help in the little balcony on the second floor he leaned against the piano in his blue sailor suit with the big white v front and the wide linen collar with a big sailor's knot coming out beneath his thin legs were crossed his body and head a little inclined in an attitude of shy unconscious grace two or three weeks before his hair had been cut as not only his fellow pupils but the master as well had laughed at it but his head was still covered with soft abundant ringlets growing down over the forehead and temples his eyelids drooped so that the long brown lashes lay over the deep blue shadows and his closed lips were a little wry he knew well what would happen he would begin to cry would not be able to finish for crying and his heart would contract as it did on sundays in st mary's when herr pfuhl played on the organ in a certain piercingly solemn way it always turned out that he wept when they wanted him to do something when they examined him and tried to find out what he knew as papa so loved to do if only mamma had not spoken of getting excited she meant to be encouraging but he felt it was a mistake there they stood and looked at him they expected and feared that he would break down so how was it possible not to he lifted his lashes and sought ida's eyes she was playing with her watch-chain and nodded to him in her usual honest crabbed way he would have liked to cling to her and have her take him away to hear nothing but her low soothing voice saying there little hanno be quiet you need not say it well my son let us hear it said the senator shortly he had sat down in an easy chair by the table and was waiting he did not smile he seldom did on such occasions very serious with one eyebrow lifted he measured little hanno with cold and scrutinizing glance hanno straightened up he rubbed one hand over the piano's polished surface gave a shy look at the company and somewhat emboldened by the gentle looks of grandmamma and aunt tony brought out in a low almost a hard voice the shepherd's sunday hymn by uhland oh my dear child not like that called out the senator don't stick there by the piano and cross your hands on your tummy like that stand up speak out that's the first thing here stand here between the curtains now hold your head up let your arms hang down quietly at your sides hanno took up his position on the threshold of the living-room and let his arms hang down obediently he raised his head but his eyes the lashes drooped so low that they were invisible they were probably already swimming in tears this is the day of our he began very low his father's voice sounded loud by contrast when he interrupted one begins with a bow my son and then much louder begin again please shepherd sunday hymn it was cruel 
the senator was probably aware that he was robbing the child of the last remnant of his self-control but the boy should not let himself be robbed he should have more manliness by now shepherd sunday him he repeated encouragingly remorselessly but it was all up with hanno his head sank on his breast and the small blue-veined right hand tugged spasmodically at the brocaded portiere i stand alone on the vacant plain he said but could get no further the mood of the verse possessed him an overmastering self-pity took away his voice and the tears could not be kept back they rolled out from beneath his lashes suddenly the thought came into his mind if he were only ill a little ill as on those nights when he lay in bed with a slight fever and a sore throat and ida came and gave him a drink and put a compress on his head and was kind he put his head down on the arm with which he clung to the poor chair and sobbed well said the senator harshly there's no pleasure in that he stood up irritated what are you crying about though it is certainly a good enough reason for tears that you haven't the courage to do anything even for the sake of giving me a little pleasure are you a little girl what will become of you if you go on like that will you always be drowning yourself in tears every time you have to speak to people i never will speak to people never thought hanno in despair think it over till this afternoon finished the senator and went into the dining-room Ida young man knelt by her fledgling and dried his eyes and spoke to him half consoling half reproachful the senator breakfasted hurriedly and the frau consul tony clotilde and christian meanwhile took their leave they were to dine with gerda as likewise were the Krugers, the Weinshanks, and the three Mrs. Budenbroke from Broad Street, while the senator, willy-nilly, must be present at the dinner in the Ratzkeller. He hoped to leave in time to see his family again at his own house. Sitting at the begarlanded table, he drank his hot tea out of a saucer, hurriedly ate an egg, and on the steps took two or three puffs of a cigarette grobleben wearing his woolen scarf in defiance of the july heat with a boot over his left forearm and the polish brush in his right a long drop pendant from his nose came from the garden into the front entry and accosted his master at the foot of the stairs where the brown bear stood with his tray many happy returns herr senator many happy and one is rich and great and the t'other's poor yes yes grobleben you're right that's just how it is and the senator slipped a piece of money into the hand with the brush and crossed the entry into the anteroom of the office in the office the cashier came up to him a tall man with honest faithful eyes to convey in carefully selected phrases the good wishes of the staff the senator thanked him in a few words and went on to his place by the window he had hardly opened his letters and glanced into the morning paper lying there ready for him when a knock came on the door leading into the front entry and the first visitors appeared with their congratulations it was a delegation of granary laborers who came straddling in like bears the corners of their mouths drawn down with befitting solemnity and their caps in their hands their spokesman spat tobacco juice on the floor pulled up his trousers and talked in great excitement about a hundred year and many more hundred year the senator proposed to them a considerable increase in their pay for the week and dismissed them the office staff of the revenue department came in a body to congratulate their chief as they left they met in the doorway a number of sailors with two pilots at the head from the Wullenwever and the friederike uverdijk the two ships belonging to the firm which happened at the time to be in port 
then there was a deputation of grain porters in black blouses knee breeches and top hats and single citizens too were announced from time to time herr stutt from belfounders street came with a black coat over his flannel shirt and iverson the florist and sundry other neighbors there was an old postman with watery eyes earrings and a white beard an ancient oddity whom the senator used to salute on the street and call him herr postmaster he came stood in the doorway and cried out i bain't come for that herr senator i knows as everybody gets summat as comes here to-day but i bain't come for that and so i tells ye he received his piece of money with gratitude none the less there was simply no end to it at half-past ten the servant came from the house to announce that the frau senator was receiving guests in the salon thomas budenbroke left his office and hurried upstairs at the door of the salon he paused a moment for a glance into the mirror to order his cravat and to refresh himself with a whiff of the eau de cologne on his handkerchief his body was wet with perspiration but his face was pale his hands and feet cold the reception in the office had nearly used him up entirely he drew a long breath and entered the sunlit room to be greeted at once by consul Huneus, the lumber dealer and multimillionaire, his wife their daughter and the latter's husband senator dr giesecke these had all driven in from travamunda like many others of the first families of the town who were spending july in a cure which they interrupted only for the budenbroke jubilee they had not been sitting for three minutes in the elegant armchairs of the salon when consul uverdeek son of the deceased burgomaster and his wife who was a kistenmacher were announced when consul huneus made his adieus his place was taken by his brother who had a million less money than he but made up for it by being a senator now the ball was open the tall white door with the relief of the singing cupids above it was scarcely closed for a moment there was a constant view from within of the great staircase upon which the light streamed down from the skylight far above and of the stairs themselves full of guests either entering or taking their leave but the salon was spacious the guests lingered in groups to talk and the number of those who came was for some time far greater than the number of those who went away soon the maid-servant gave up opening and shutting the door that led into the salon and left it wide open so that the guests stood in the corridor as well there was the drone and buzz of conversation in masculine and feminine voices there were handshakings bows jests and loud jolly laughter which reverberated among the columns of the staircase and echoed from the great glass panes of the skylight senator budenbroke stood by turns at the top of the stairs and in the bow window receiving the congratulations which were sometimes mere formal murmurs and sometimes loud and hearty expressions of goodwill burgomaster dr longhals a heavily built man of elegant appearance with a shaven chin nestling in a white neckcloth short gray mutton chops and a languid diplomatic air was received with general marks of respect consul eduard kistenmacher the wine merchant his wife who was a mullendorf and his brother and partner stephan senator budenbroke's loyal friend and supporter with his wife the rudely healthy daughter of a landed proprietor arrive and pay their respects the widowed frau senator mullendorf sits throned in the centre of the sofa in the salon while her children consul august mullendorf and his wife julken born hagenstrom mingle with the crowd consul hermann hagenstrom supports his considerable weight on the balustrade breathes heavily into his red beard and talks with senator dr kramer the chief of police 
whose brown beard mixed with gray frames a smiling face expressive of a sort of gentle slyness state attorney moritz hagenstrom smiling and showing his defective teeth is there with his beautiful wife the former fraulein putwarken of hamburg good old dr grabo may be seen pressing senator budenbroek's hand for a moment in both of his to be displaced next moment by contractor folkt pastor prinksheim in secular garb only betraying his dignity by the length of his frock coat comes up the steps with outstretched arms and a beaming face and herr friedrich wilhelm marcus is present of course those gentlemen who come as delegates from any body such as the senate the board of trade or the assembly of burgesses appear in frock coats it is half past eleven the heat is intense the lady of the house withdrew a quarter of an hour ago suddenly there is a hubbub below the vestibule door a stamping and shuffling of feet as of many people entering together and a ringing noisy voice echoes through the whole house everybody rushes to the landing blocks up the doors to the salon the dining-room and the smoking-room and peers down below is a group of fifteen or twenty men with musical instruments headed by a gentleman in a brown wig with a grey nautical beard and yellow artificial teeth which he shows when he talks what is happening it is consul peter dulman of course he is bringing the band from the theatre and mounts the stairs in triumph swinging a packet of programmes in his hand the serenade in honour of the hundredth anniversary of the firm of johann budenbroek begins in these impossible conditions with the notes all running together the chords drowning each other the loud grunting and snarling of the big bass trumpet heard above everything else it begins with now let us all thank god goes over into the adaptation of offenbach's la belle Hélène, and winds up with a potpourri of folk songs quite an extensive program and a pretty idea of Dulemans. they congratulate him on it and nobody feels inclined to break up until the concert is finished they stand or sit in the salon and the corridor they listen and talk thomas budenbroek stood with stefan kistenmacher senator dr giesecke and contractor folkt beyond the staircase near the open door of the smoking-room and the flight of stairs up to the second story he leaned against the wall now and then contributing a word to the conversation and for the rest looking out into space across the balustrade it was hotter than ever and more oppressive but it would probably rain to judge from the shadows that drove across the skylight there must be clouds in the sky they were so many and moved so rapidly that the changeful flickering light on the staircase came in time to hurt the eyes every other minute the brilliance of the gilt chandelier and the brass instruments below was quenched to blaze out the next minute as before once the shadows lasted a little longer and six or seven times something fell with a slight crackling sound upon the panes of the skylight hailstones no doubt then the sunlight streamed down again there is a mood of depression in which everything that would ordinarily irritate us and call up a healthy reaction merely weighs us down with a nameless heavy burden of dull chagrin thus thomas brooded over the breakdown of little johann over the feelings which the whole celebration aroused in him and still more over those which he would have liked to feel but could not he sought again and again to pull himself together to clear his countenance to tell himself that this was a great day which was bound to heighten and exhilarate his mood 
and indeed the noise which the band was making the buzz of voices the sight of all these people gathered in his honour did shake his nerves did together with his memories of the past and of his father give rise in him to a sort of weak emotionalism but a sense of the ridiculous of the disagreeable hung over it all the trumpery music spoiled by the bad acoustics the banal company chattering about dinners and the stock market and this very mingling of emotion and disgust heightened his inward sense of exhaustion and despair at a quarter after twelve when the musical program was drawing to a close an incident occurred which in no wise interfered with the prevailing good feeling but which obliged the master of the house to leave his guests for a short time it was of a business nature at a pause in the music the youngest apprentice in the firm appeared coming up the great staircase overcome with embarrassment at sight of so many people he was a little stunted fellow and he drew his red face down as far as possible between his shoulders and swung one long thin arm violently back and forth to show that he was perfectly at his ease in the other hand he had a telegram he mounted the steps looking everywhere for his master and when he had discovered him he passed with blushes and murmured excuses through the crowds that blocked his way his blushes were superfluous nobody saw him without looking at him or breaking off their talk they slightly made way and they hardly noticed when he gave his telegram to the senator with a scrape and the latter turned a little away from kistenmacher folkt and giesecke to read it nearly all the telegrams that came to-day were messages of congratulation still during business hours they had to be delivered at once the corridor made a bend at the point where the stairs mounted to the second story and then went on to the back stairs where there was another a side entrance into the dining-room opposite the stairs was the shaft of the dumb waiter and at this point there was a sizable table where the maids usually polished the silver the senator paused here turned his back to the apprentice and opened the dispatch suddenly his eyes opened so wide that anyone seeing him would have started in astonishment and he gave a deep gasping intake of breath which dried his throat and made him cough he tried to say very well but his voice was inaudible in the clamour behind him very well he repeated but the second word was only a whisper as his master did not move or turn round or make any sign the humpbacked apprentice shifted from one foot to the other then made his outlandish scrape again and went down the back stairs senator budenbroke still stood at the table his hands holding the dispatch hung weakly down in front of him he breathed in difficult short breaths through his mouth his body swayed back and forth and he shook his head meaninglessly as if stunned that little bit of hail he said that little bit of hail he repeated it stupidly but gradually his breathing grew longer and quieter the movement of his body less his half-shut eyes clouded over with a weary broken expression and he turned around slowly nodding his head opened the door into the dining-room and went in with bent head he crossed the wide polished floor and sat down on one of the dark red sofas by the window here it was quiet and cool the sound of the fountain came up from the garden and a fly buzzed on the pane there was only a dull murmur from the front of the house he laid his weary head on the cushion and closed his eyes that's good that's good he muttered half aloud drawing a deep breath of 
relief and satisfaction oh that is good he lay five minutes thus with limbs relaxed and a look of peace upon his face then he sat up folded the telegram put it in his breast pocket and rose to rejoin his guests but in the same minute he sank back with a disgusted groan upon the sofa the music it was beginning again an idiotic racket meant to be a gallop with the drum and cymbals marking a rhythm in which the other instruments all joined either ahead of or behind time a naive insistent intolerable hullabaloo of snarling crashing and feebly piping noises punctuated by the silly tootling of the piccolo end of section 76section seventy seven of budenbrooks by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part eight chapter six oh bach sebastian bach dear lady cried edmund Fool, herr edmund Fool, the organist of st mary's as he strode up and down the salon with great activity while gerda smiling her head on her hand sat at the piano and hanno listened from a big chair his hands clasped round his knees certainly as you say it was he through whom the victory was achieved by harmony over counterpoint he invented modern harmony assuredly but how need i tell you how by progressive development of the contrapuntal style you know it as well as i do harmony ah no by no means counterpoint my dear lady counterpoint whither i ask you would experiments in harmony have led while i have breath to speak i will warn you against mere experiments in harmony his zeal as he spoke was great and he gave it free rein for he felt at home in the house every wednesday afternoon there appeared on the threshold his bulky square high-shouldered figure in a coffee-coloured coat whereof the skirts hung down over his knees while awaiting his partner he would open lovingly the beckstein grand piano arrange the violin parts on the stand and then prelude a little softly and artistically with his head sunk in high contentment on one shoulder an astonishing growth of hair a wilderness of tight little curls red-brown mixed with grey made his head look big and heavy though it was poised easily upon a long neck with an extremely large adam's apple that showed above his low collar the straight bunchy moustaches of the same colour as the hair were more prominent than the small snub nose his eyes were brown and bright with puffs of flesh beneath them when he played they looked as though their gaze passed through whatever was in their way and rested on the other side his face was not striking but it had at least the stamp of a strong and lively intelligence his eyelids were usually half drooped and he had a way of relaxing his lower jaw without opening his mouth which gave him a flabby resigned expression like that sometimes seen on the face of a sleeping person the softness of his outward seeming however contrasted strongly with the actual strength and self-respect of his character edmund Fool was an organist of no small repute whose reputation for contrapuntal learning was not confined within the walls of his native town his little book on church music was recommended for private study in several conservatories and his fugues and chorales were played now and then where an organ sounded to the glory of god these compositions as well as the voluntaries he played on sundays at st mary's were flawless impeccable full of the relentless severe logicality of the strenge 
such beauty as they had was not of this earth and made no appeal to the ordinary layman's human feeling what spoke in them what gloriously triumphed in them was a technique amounting to an ascetic religion a technique elevated to a lofty sacrament to an absolute end in itself edmund Fool had small use for the pleasant and the agreeable and spoke of melody it must be confessed in slighting terms but he was no dry pedant notwithstanding he would utter the name of palestrina in the most dogmatic awe-inspiring tone but even while he made his instrument give out a succession of archaistic virtuosities his face would be all aglow with feeling with rapt enthusiasm and his gaze would rest upon the distance as though he saw there the ultimate logicality of all events issuing in reality this was the musician's look vague and vacant precisely because it abode in the kingdom of a purer profounder more absolute logic than that which shapes our verbal conceptions and thoughts his hands were large and soft apparently boneless and covered with freckles his voice when he greeted gerda budenbroek was low and hollow as though a bite were stuck in his throat good morning honored lady he rose a little from his seat bowed and respectfully took the hand she offered while with his own left he struck the fifths on the piano so firmly and clearly that she seized her stradivarius and began to tune the strings with practised ear the g minor concerto of bach herr Pfuhl. the whole adagio still goes badly i think and the organist began to play but hardly were the first chords struck when it invariably happened that the corridor door would open gently and without a sound little johann would steal across the carpet to an easy chair where he would sit his hands clasped round his knees motionless and listen to the music and the conversation well hanno so you want a little taste of music do you said gerda in a pause and looked at her son with her shadowy eyes in which the music had kindled a soft radiance then he would stand up and put out his hand to herr Pfuhl with a silent bow and herr Pfuhl would stroke with gentle affection the soft light brown hair that hung gracefully about brow and temples listen now my child he would say with mild impressiveness and the boy would look at the adam's apple that went up and down as the organist spoke and then go back to his place with his quick light steps as though he could hardly wait for the music to begin again they played a movement of haydn some pages of mozart a sonata of beethoven then while gerda was picking out some music with her violin under her arm a surprising thing happened herr Pfuhl, edmund Pfuhl, organist at st mary's glided over from his easy interlude into music of an extraordinary style while a sort of shamefaced enjoyment showed upon his absent countenance a burgeoning and blooming a weaving and singing rose beneath his fingers then softly and dreamily at first but ever clearer and clearer there emerged in artistic counterpoint the ancestral grandiose magnificent march motif amounting to a climax a complication a transition and at the resolution of the dominant the violin chimed in fortissimo it was the overture to die meistersinger gerda budenbroek was an impassioned wagnerite but herr Pfuhl was an equally impassioned opponent so much so that in the beginning she had despaired of winning him over on the day when she first laid some piano arrangements from tristan on the music rack he played some twenty-five beats and then sprung up from the music-stool to stride up and down the room with disgust painted upon his face 
i cannot play that my dear lady i am your most devoted servant but i cannot that is not music believe me i have always flattered myself that i knew something about music but this is chaos this is demagogy blasphemy insanity madness it is a perfumed fog shot through with lightning it is the end of all honesty in art i will not play it and with the words he had thrown himself again on the stool and with his adam's apple working furiously up and down with coughs and sighs had accomplished another twenty-five beats but then he shut the piano and cried out oh fie fie no this is going too far forgive me dear lady if i speak frankly what i feel you have honoured me for years and paid me for my services and i am a man of modest means but i must lay down my office i assure you if you drive me to it by asking me to play these atrocities look the child sits there listening would you then utterly corrupt his soul but let him gesture as furiously as he would she brought him over slowly by easy stages by persistent playing and persuasion fool she would say be reasonable take the thing calmly you are put off by his original use of harmony beethoven seems to you so pure clear and natural by contrast but remember how beethoven himself affronted his contemporaries who were brought up in the old way and bach my good heavens you know how he was reproached for his want of melody and clearness you talk about honesty but what do you mean by honesty in art is it not the antithesis of hedonism and if so then that is what you have here just as much as in bach i tell you fool this music is less foreign to your inner self than you think it is all juggling and sophistry begging your pardon he grumbled but she was right after all the music was not so impossible as he thought at first he never it is true quite reconciled himself to tristan though he eventually carried out gerda's wish and made a very clever arrangement of the liebestod for violin and piano he was first won over by certain parts of die meistersinger and slowly a love for this new art began to stir within him he would not confess it he was himself aghast at the fact and would pettishly deny it when the subject was mentioned but after the old masters had had their due gerda no longer needed to urge him to respond to a more complex demand upon his virtuosity with an expression of shamefaced pleasure he would glide into the weaving harmonies of the leitmotif after the music however there would be a long explanation of the relation of this style of music to that of the schlingersatz and one day herr pfuhl admitted that while not personally interested in the theme he saw himself obliged to add a chapter to his book on church music the subject of which would be the application of the old key system to the church and folk music of richard wagner hanno sat quite still his small hands clasped round his knees his mouth as usual a little twisted as his tongue felt out the hole in a back tooth he watched his mother and herr pfuhl with large quiet eyes and thus so early he became aware of music as an extraordinarily serious important and profound thing in life he understood only now and then what they were saying and the music itself was mostly far above his childish understanding yet he came again and sat absorbed for hours a feat which surely faith love and reverence alone enabled him to perform when only seven he began to repeat with one hand on the piano certain combinations of sound that made an impression on him 
his mother watched him smiling improved his chords and showed him how certain tones would be necessary to carry one chord over into another and his ear confirmed what she told him after gerda budenbroek had watched her son a little she declared that he must have piano lessons i hardly think she told herr pfuhl that he is suited for solo work and on the whole i am glad for it has its bad side apart from the dependence of the soloist upon his accompanist which can be very serious too if i did not have you for instance there is always the danger of yielding to more or less complete virtuosity you see i know whereof i speak i tell you frankly that for the soloist a high degree of ability is only the first step the concentration on the tone and phrasing of the treble which reduces the whole polyphony to something vague and indefinite in the consciousness must surely spoil the feeling for harmony unless the person is more than usually gifted and the memory as well which is most difficult to correct later on i love my violin and i have accomplished a good deal with it but to tell you the truth i place the piano higher what i mean is this familiarity with the piano as a means of summarizing the richest and most varied structures as an incomparable instrument for musical reproduction means for me a clearer more intimate and comprehensive intercourse with music listen fool i would like to have you take him if you will be so good i know there are two or three people here in the town who give lessons women i think but they are simply piano teachers you know what i mean i feel that it matters so little whether one is trained upon an instrument and so much whether one knows something about music i depend upon you and you will see you will succeed with him he has the budenbroek hand the budenbrokes can all strike the ninths and tenths only they have never set any store by it she concluded laughing and herr pfuhl declared himself ready to undertake the lessons from now on he came on mondays as well as wednesdays and gave little hanno lessons while gerda sat beside them he went at it in an unusual way for he felt that he owed more to his pupil's dumb and passionate zeal than merely to employ it in playing the piano a little the first elementary difficulties were hardly got over when he began to theorize in a simple way with graphic illustrations and to give his pupil the foundations of the theory of harmony and hanno understood for it was all only a confirmation of what he had always known as far as possible herr pfuhl took into consideration the eager ambition of the child he spent much thought upon the problem how best to lighten the material load that weighed down the wings of his fancy he did not demand too much finger dexterity or practice of scales what he had in mind and soon achieved was a clear and lively grasp of the key system on hanno's part an inward comprehensive understanding of its relationships out of which would come at no distant day the quick eye for possible combinations the intuitive mastery over the piano which would lead to improvisation and composition he appreciated with a touching delicacy of feeling the spiritual needs of this young pupil who had already heard so much and directed it toward the acquisition of a serious style he would not disillusionize the deep solemnity of his mood by making him practice commonplaces he gave him chorales to play and pointed out the laws controlling the development of one chord into another gerda sitting with her embroidery or her book just beyond the portieres followed the course of the lessons 
you outstrip all my expectations she told herr pfuhl later on but are you not going too fast aren't you getting too far ahead your method seems to me eminently creative he has already begun to try to improvise a little but if the method is beyond him if he hasn't enough gift he will learn absolutely nothing he has enough gift herr pfuhl said and nodded sometimes i look into his eyes and see so much lying there but he holds his mouth tight shut in later life when his mouth will probably be shut even tighter he must have some kind of outlet a way of speaking she looked at him at this square-built musician with the red-brown hair the pouches under his eyes the bushy moustaches and the inordinate adam's apple and then she put out her hand and said thank you pfuhl you mean well by him and who knows yet how much you are doing for him hanno's feeling for his teacher was one of boundless gratitude and devotion at school he sat heavy and hopeless unable despite strenuous coaching to understand his tables but he grasped without effort all that herr pfuhl told him and made it his own if he could make more his own that which he had already owned before edmund pfuhl like a stout angel in a tail-coat took him in his arms every monday afternoon and transported him above all his daily misery into the mild sweet grave consoling kingdom of sound the lessons sometimes took place at herr pfuhl's own house a roomy old gabled dwelling full of cool passages and crannies in which the organist lived alone with an elderly housekeeper sometimes too little budenbroek was allowed to sit up with the organist at the sunday service in st mary's which was quite a different matter from stopping below with the other people in the nave high above the congregation high above pastor prinxheim in his pulpit the two sat alone in the midst of a mighty tempest of rolling sound which at once set them free from the earth and dominated them by its own power and hanno was sometimes blissfully permitted to help his master control the stops when the chorale was finished herr pfuhl would slowly lift his fingers from the keyboard so that only the bass and the fundamental would still be heard in lingering solemnity and after a meaningful pause the well-modulated voice of pastor prinxheim would rise up from under the sounding-board in the pulpit then it happened not infrequently that herr pfuhl would quite simply begin to make fun of the preacher his artificial enunciation his long exaggerated vowels his sighs his crude transitions from sanctity to gloom hanno would laugh too softly but with heartfelt glee for those two up there were both of the opinion which neither of them expressed that the sermon was silly twaddle and that the real service consisted in that which the pastor and his congregation regarded merely as a devotional accessory namely the music herr pfuhl in fact had a constant grievance in the small understanding there was for his accomplishments down there among the senators consuls citizens and their families and thus he liked to have his small pupil by him to whom he could point out the extraordinary difficulties of the passages he had just played he performed marvels of technique he had composed a melody which was just the same read forward or backward and based upon it a fugue which was to be played crab fashion but after performing this wonder nobody knows the difference he said and folded his hands in his lap with a dreary look shaking his head hopelessly while pastor prinxheim was delivering his sermon he whispered to hanno that was a crab fashion imitation johann you don't know what that is yet 
it is the imitation of a theme composed backward instead of forward a very very difficult thing later on i will show you what an imitation in the strenge satz involves as for the crab i would never ask you to try that it isn't necessary but do not believe those who tell you that such things are trifles without any musical value you will find the crab in musicians of all ages but exercises like that are the scorn of the mediocre and the superficial musician humility hanno humility is the feeling one should have don't forget it on his eighth birthday april fifteenth eighteen sixty nine hanno played before the assembled family a fantasy of his own composition it was a simple affair a motif entirely of his own invention which he had slightly developed when he showed it to herr pfuhl the organist of course had some criticism to make what sort of theatrical ending is that johann it doesn't go with the rest of it in the beginning it is all pretty good but why do you suddenly fall from b major into the six four chord on the fourth note with a minor third these are tricks and you tremolo here too where did you pick that up i know of course you have been listening when i played certain things for your mother change the end child then it will be quite a clean little piece of work but it appeared that hanno laid the greatest stress precisely on this minor chord and this finale and his mother was so very pleased with it that it remained as it was she took her violin and played the upper part and varied it with runs in demi semi quavers that sounded gorgeous hanno kissed her out of sheer happiness and they played it together to the family on the fifteenth of april the frau consul frau permanader christian clotilde herr and frau consul kruger herr and frau director weinschenk the broad street budenbrokes and theresa weichbrot were all bidden to dinner at four o'clock with the senator and his wife in honor of hanno's birthday and now they sat in the salon and looked at the child perched on the music stool in his sailor suit and at the elegant foreign appearance his mother made as she played a wonderful cantilena on the g string and then with profound virtuosity developed a stream of purling foaming cadences the silver on the end of her bow gleamed in the gaslight hanno was pale with excitement and had hardly eaten any dinner but now he forgot all else in his absorbed devotion to his task which would alas be all over in ten minutes the little melody he had invented was more harmonic than rhythmic in its structure there was an extraordinary contrast between the simple primitive material which the child had at his command and the impressive impassioned almost over-refined method with which that material was employed he brought out each leading note with a forward inclination of the little head he sat far forward on the music stool and strove by the use of both pedals to give each new harmony an emotional value in truth when hanno concentrated upon an effect the result was likely to be emotional rather than merely sentimental he gave every simple harmonic device a special and mysterious significance by means of retardation and accentuation his surprising skill in effects was displayed in each chord each new harmony by a suddenly introduced pianissimo and he sat with lifted eyebrows swaying back and forth with the whole upper part of his body then came the finale hanno's beloved finale which crowned the elevated simplicity of the whole piece soft and clear as a bell sounded the e minor chord tremolo pianissimo amid the purling flowing notes of the violin it swelled it broadened it slowly slowly rose suddenly in the forte he introduced the discord c sharp which led back 
to the original key and the stradivarius ornamented it with its welling and singing he dwelt on the dissonance until it became fortissimo but he denied himself and his audience the resolution he kept it back what would it be this resolution this enchanting satisfying absorption into the b major chord a joy beyond compare a gratification of overpowering sweetness peace bliss the kingdom of heaven only not yet not yet a moment more of striving hesitation suspense that must become well-nigh intolerable in order to heighten the ultimate moment of joy once more a last the final tasting of this striving and yearning this craving of the entire being this last forcing of the will to deny oneself the fulfilment and the conclusion in the knowledge that joy when it comes lasts only for the moment the whole upper part of hanno's little body straightened his eyes grew larger his closed lips trembled he breathed short spasmodic breaths through his nose at last at last joy would no longer be denied it came it poured over him he resisted no more his muscles relaxed his head sank weakly on his shoulder his eyes closed and a pathetic almost an anguished smile of speechless rapture hovered about his mouth while his tremolo among the rippling and rustling runs from the violin to which he now added runs in the bass glided over into b major swelled up suddenly into forte and after one brief resounding burst broke off it was impossible that all the effect which this had upon hanno should pass over into his audience frau permanader for instance had not the slightest idea what it was all about but she had seen the child's smile the rhythm of his body the beloved little head swaying enraptured from side to side and the sight had penetrated to the depths of her easily moved nature how the child can play oh how he can play she cried hurrying to him half weeping and folding him in her arms gerda tom he will be a meyerbeer a mozart a as no third name of equal significance occurred to her she confined herself to showering kisses on her nephew who sat there still quite exhausted with an absent look in his eyes that's enough tony the senator said softly please don't put such ideas into the child's head End of section seventy seven section seventy eight of budenbrokes by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part eight chapter seven thomas budenbroke was in his heart far from pleased with the development of little johann long ago he had led gerda arnoldson to the altar and all the philistines had shaken their heads he had felt strong and bold enough then to display a distinguished taste without harming his position as a citizen but now the long-awaited heir who showed so many physical traits of the paternal inheritance did he after all belong entirely to the mother's side he had hoped that one day his son would take up the work of the father's lifetime in his stronger more fortunate hands and carry it forward but now it almost seemed that the son was hostile not only to the surroundings and the life in which his lot was cast but even to his father as well gerda's violin playing had always added to her strange eyes which he loved to her heavy dark red hair and her whole exotic appearance one charm the more but now that he saw how her passion for music strange to his own nature utterly even at this early age possessed the child 
he felt in it a hostile force that came between him and his son of whom his hopes would make a budenbrook a strong and practical-minded man with definite impulses after power and conquest in his present irritable state it seemed to him that this hostile force was making him a stranger in his own house he could not himself approach any nearer to the music practised by gerda and her friend herr pfuhl gerda herself exclusive and impatient where her art was concerned made it cruelly hard for him never had he dreamed that music was so essentially foreign to his family as now it seemed his grandfather had enjoyed playing the flute and he himself always listened with pleasure to melodies that possessed a graceful charm a lively swing or a tender melancholy but if he happened to express his liking for any such composition gerda would be sure to shrug her shoulders and say with a pitying smile how can you my friend a thing like that without any musical value whatever he hated this musical value it was a phrase which had no meaning for him save a certain chilling arrogance it drove him on in hanno's presence to self-assertion more than once he remonstrated angrily this constant harping on musical values my dear strikes me as rather tasteless and opinionated to which she rejoined thomas once for all you will never understand anything about music as an art and intelligent as you are you will never see that it is more than an after-dinner pleasure and a feast for the ears in every other field you have a perception of the banal in music not but it is the test of musical comprehension what pleases you in music a sort of insipid optimism which if you met with it in literature would make you throw down the book with an angry or sarcastic comment easy gratification of each unformed wish prompt satisfaction before the will is even roused that is what pretty music is like and it is like nothing else in the world it is mere flabby idealism he understood her that is he understood what she said but he could not follow her could not comprehend why melodies which touched or stirred him were cheap and worthless while compositions which left him cold and bewildered possessed the highest musical value he stood before a temple from whose threshold gerda sternly waved him back and he watched while she and the child vanished within he betrayed none of his grief over this estrangement though the gulf seemed to widen between him and his little son the idea of suing for his child's favor seemed frightful to him during the day he had small time to spare at meals he treated him with a friendly cordiality that had at times a tonic severity well comrade he would say giving him a tap or two on the back of the head and seating himself opposite his wife well and how are you studying and playing the piano eh good but not too much piano else you won't want to do your task and then you won't go up at easter not a muscle betrayed the anxious suspense with which he waited to see how hanno took his greeting and what his reply would be nothing revealed his painful inward shrinking when the child merely gave him a shy glance of the gold-brown shadowy eyes a glance that did not even reach his father's face and bent again over his plate it was monstrous for him to brood over this childish clumsiness it was his fatherly duty to occupy himself a little with the child so while the plates were changed he would examine him and try to stimulate his sense for facts how many inhabitants were there in the town what streets led from the trava to the upper town what were the names of the granaries that belonged to the firm out with it now speak up but hanno was silent 
not with any idea of wounding or annoying his father but these inhabitants these streets and granaries which were normally a matter of complete indifference to him became positively hateful when they were made the subject of an examination however lively he was beforehand however gaily he had laughed and talked with his father his mood would go down to zero at the first symptom of an examination and his resistance would collapse entirely his eyes would cloud over his mouth take on a despondent droop and he would be possessed by a feeling of profound regret at the thoughtlessness of papa who surely knew that such tests came to nothing and only spoiled the whole meal-time for everybody with eyes swimming in tears he looked down at his plate ida would nudge him and whisper to him the streets the granaries oh that was all useless perfectly useless she did not understand he did know the names at least some of them it would have been easy to do what papa asked if only he were not possessed and prevented by an overpowering sadness a severe word from his father and a tap with the fork against the knife rest brought him to himself with a start he cast a glance at his mother and ida and tried to speak but the first syllables were already drowned in sobs that's enough shouted the senator angrily keep still you needn't tell me you can sit there dumb and silly all the rest of your life and the meal would be finished in uncomfortable silence when the senator felt troubled about hanno's passionate preoccupation with his music it was this dreaminess this weeping this total lack of freshness and energy that he fixed upon all his life the boy had been delicate his teeth had been particularly bad and had been the cause of many painful illnesses and difficulties it had nearly cost him his life to cut his first set the gums showed a constant tendency to inflammation and there were abscesses which mademoiselle jungmann used to open with a needle at the proper time now his second teeth were beginning to come in and the suffering was even greater he had almost more pain than he could bear and he spent many sleepless feverish nights his teeth when they came were as white and beautiful as his mother's but they were soft and brittle and crowded each other out of shape when they came in so that little hanno was obliged for the correction of all these evils to make the acquaintance early in life of a very dreadful man no less than herr brecht the dentist in mill street even this man's name was significant it suggested the frightful sensation in hanno's jaw when the roots of a tooth were pulled lifted and wrenched out the sound of it made hanno's heart contract just as it did when he cowered in an easy-chair in herr brecht's waiting-room with the faithful young man sitting opposite and looked at the pictures in a magazine while he breathed in the sharp-smelling air of the room and waited for the dentist to open the door of the operating-room with his polite and horrible won't you come in please this operating-room possessed one strange attraction a gorgeous parrot with venomous little eyes which sat in a brass cage in the corner and was called for unknown reasons josephus he used to say sit down one moment please in a voice like an old fishwife's and though the hideous circumstances made this sound like mockery yet hanno felt for the bird a curious mixture of fear and affection imagine a parrot a big bright-colored bird that could talk and was called josephus he was like something out of an enchanted forest like grimm's fairy tales which ida read aloud to him and when herr brecht opened the door his invitation was repeated by josephus in such a way that somehow hanno was laughing when he went into the operating-room and sat down in the queer big chair by the window next the treadle machine 
Herr Brecht looked a good deal like Josephus. His nose was of the same shape, above his grizzled moustaches. The bad thing about him was that he was nervous, and dreaded the tortures he was obliged to inflict. "'We must proceed to extraction, Fräulein,' he would say, growing pale. Hanno himself was in a pale cold sweat, with staring eyes, incapable of protesting or running away, in short in much the same condition as a condemned criminal. He saw Herbrecht with the forceps in his sleeve bend over him, and noticed that little beads were standing out on his bald brow, and that his mouth was twisted. When it was all over, and Hanno, pale and trembling, spat blood into the blue basin at his side, Herr Brecht, too, had to sit down and wipe his forehead and take a drink of water. They assured little Johann that this man would do him good and save him suffering in the end. But when Hanno weighed his present pains against the positive good that had accrued from them, he felt that the former far outweighed the latter, and he regarded these visits to Mill Street as so much unnecessary torture. They removed four beautiful white molars which had just come in to make room for the wisdom teeth expected later. This required four weeks of visits in order not to subject the boy to too great a strain. It was a fearful time, a long drawn out martyrdom in which dread of the next visit began before the last one with its attendant exhaustion was fairly over. When the last tooth was drawn, Hanno was quite worn out and was ill in bed for a week. This trouble with his teeth affected not only his spirits, but also the functioning of all his other organs. When he could not chew, he did not digest, and there came attacks of gastric fever, accompanied by fitful heart action, according as the heart was either weakened or too strongly stimulated and there were spells of giddiness, while the pavor nocturnus, that strange affliction beloved of Dr. Grabo, continued unabated. Hardly a night passed that little Johann did not start up in bed, wringing his hands with every mark of unbearable anguish, and crying out piteously for help, as though someone were trying to choke him, or some other awful thing were happening. In the morning he had forgotten it all. Dr. Grabo's treatment consisted of giving fruit juice before the child went to bed, which had absolutely no effect. The physical arrests and the pains which Hanno suffered made him old for his age. He was what is called precocious, and though this was not very obvious, being restrained in him, as it were, by his own unconscious good taste, Still, it expressed itself at times in the form of a melancholy superiority. "'How are you, Hanno?' somebody would ask, his grandmother or one of the Broad Street Budenbrokes, a little resigned curl of the lip or a shrug of the shoulders in their blue sailor suit would be the only answer. "'Do you like to go to school?' "'No,' answered Hanno, with quiet candor. He did not consider it worth while to try to tell a lie in such cases. No, but one has to learn writing, reading, arithmetic. And so on, said little Johann. No, he did not like going to school, the old monastic school with its cloisters and vaulted classrooms. He was hampered by his illnesses, and often absent-minded, for his thoughts would linger among his harmonic combinations, or upon the still unraveled marvel of some piece which he had heard his mother and Herr Pfuhl playing, and all this did not help him on in the sciences. These lower classes were taught by assistant masters and seminarists, for whom he entertained mingled feelings a dread of possible future punishments and a secret contempt for their social inferiority their spiritual limitations and their physical unkemptness herr Tietke, 
a little grey man in a greasy black coat who had taught at the school even in the time of the deceased marcellus stengel who squinted abominably and sought to remedy this defect by wearing glasses as thick and round as a ship's portholes herr Tietke told little johann how quick and industrious his father had been at figures herr Tietke had severe fits of coughing and spat all over the floor of his platform hanno had among his schoolmates no intimates save one but this single bond was very close even from his earliest school days his friend was a child of aristocratic birth but neglected appearance a certain count moln whose first name was kai kai was a lad of about hanno's height dressed not in a sailor suit but in shabby clothes of uncertain color with here and there a button missing and a great patch in the seat his arms were too long for the sleeves of his coat and his hands seemed impregnated with dust and earth to a permanent gray color but they were unusually narrow and elegant with long fingers and tapering nails his head was to match neglected uncombed and none too clean but endowed by nature with all the marks of pure and noble birth the carelessly parted hair reddish blond in color waved back from a white brow and a pair of light blue eyes gleamed bright and keen from beneath the cheekbones were slightly prominent while the nose with its delicate nostrils and slightly aquiline curve and the mouth with its short upper lip were already quite unmistakable and characteristic hanno budenbroek had seen the little count once or twice even before they met at school when he took his walks with ida northward from the castle gate some distance outside the town nearly as far as the first outlying village lay a small farm a tiny almost valueless property without even a name the passer-by got the impression of a dunghill a quantity of chickens a dog hut and a wretched kennel-like building with a sloping red roof this was the manor-house and therein dwelt kai's father count eberhard moln he was an eccentric hardly ever seen by anybody busy on his dunghill with his dogs his chickens and his vegetable patch a large man in top boots with a green frieze jacket he had a bald head and a huge gray beard like the tail of a turnip he carried a riding whip in his hand though he had no horse to his name and wore a monocle stuck into his eye under the bushy eyebrow except him and his son there was no count moln in all the length and breadth of the land any more the various branches of a once rich proud and powerful family had gradually withered off until now there was only an aunt with whom kai's father was not on terms she wrote romances for the family story papers under a dashing pseudonym the story was told of count eberhardt that when he first withdrew to his little farm he devised a means of protecting himself from the importunities of peddlers beggars and busybodies he put up a sign which read here lives count moln he wants nothing buys nothing and gives nothing away when the sign had served its purpose he removed it motherless for the countess had died when her child was born and the housework was done by an elderly female little kai grew up like a wild animal among the dogs and chickens and here hanno budenbroek had looked at him shyly from a distance as he leaped like a rabbit among the cabbages romped with the dogs and frightened the fowls by turning somersaults they met again in the schoolroom where hanno probably felt again his first alarm at the little count's unkempt exterior but not for long a sure instinct had led him to pay no heed to the outward negligence 
had shown him instead the white brow the delicate mouth the finely shaped blue eyes which looked with a sort of resentful hostility into his own and hanno felt sympathy for this one alone among all his fellows but he would never by himself have taken the first steps he was too timid for that without the ruthless impetuosity of little kai they might have remained strangers after all the passionate rapidity of his approach even frightened hanno at first the neglected little count sued for the favor of the quiet elegantly dressed hanno with a fiery aggressive masculinity impossible to resist kai could not it is true help hanno with his lessons his untamed spirits were as hostile to the tables as was little budenbroek's dreamy abstractedness but he gave him everything he had glass bullets wooden tops even a broken lead pistol which was his dearest treasure during the recess he told him about his home and the puppies and chickens and walked with him at midday as far as he dared though either young man with a packet of sandwiches was always waiting for her fledgling at the school gate it was from ida that kai heard little budenbroek's nickname he took it up and never called him henceforth by anything else one day he demanded that hanno instead of going to the mill wall should take a walk with him to his father's house to see the baby guinea pigs fraulein jungmann finally yielded to the teasing of the two children they strolled out to the noble domain viewed the dunghill the vegetables the fowls dogs and guinea pigs and even went into the house where in a long low room on the ground floor count eberhardt sat in defiant isolation reading at a clumsy table he asked crossly what they wanted ida jungmann could not be brought to repeat the visit she insisted that if the two children wished to be together kai could visit hanno instead so for the first time with honest admiration but no trace of shyness kai entered hanno's beautiful home after that he went often soon nothing but the deep winter snows prevented him from making the long way back again for the sake of a few hours with his friend they sat in the large playroom in the second story and did their lessons together there were long sums that covered both sides of the slate with additions subtractions multiplications and divisions and had to come out to zero in the end otherwise there was a mistake and they must hunt and hunt till they had found the little beast and exterminated him then they had to study grammar and learn the rules of comparison and write down very neat tidy examples underneath thus horn is transparent glass is more transparent light is most transparent they took their exercise books and conned sentences like the following i received a letter saying that he felt aggrieved because he believed that you had deceived him the fell intent of this sentence so full of pitfalls was that you should write e i where you ought to write i e and contrariwise they had in fact done that very thing and now it must be corrected but when all was finished they might put their books aside and sit on the window ledge while ida read to them the good soul read about cinderella about the prince who could not shiver and shake about rumpelstiltskin about rapunzel and the frog prince in her deep patient voice her eyes half shut for she knew the stories by heart she'd read them so often she wet her finger and turned the page automatically but after a while kai who possessed the constant craving to do something himself to have some effect on his surroundings would close the book and begin to tell stories himself 
it was a good idea for they knew all the printed ones and eda needed a rest sometimes too kai's stories were short and simple at first but they expanded and grew bolder and more complicated with time the interesting thing about them was that they never stood quite in the air but were based upon a reality which he presented in a new and mysterious light hanno particularly liked the one about the wicked enchanter who tortured all human beings by his malignant art who had captured a beautiful prince named josephus and turned him into a green and red parrot which he kept in a gilded cage but in a far distant land the chosen hero was growing up who should one day fearlessly advance at the head of an invincible army of dogs chickens and guinea pigs and slay the base enchanter with a single sword thrust and deliver all the world in particular hanno budenbroke from his clutches then josephus would be restored to his proper form and returned to his kingdom in which kai and hanno would be appointed to high offices senator budenbroke saw the two friends together now and then as he passed the door of the playroom he had nothing against the intimacy for it was clear that the two lads did each other good hanno gentled tamed and ennobled kai who loved him tenderly admired his white hands and for his sake let ida jungmann wash his own with soap and a nail-brush and if hanno could absorb some of his friend's wild energy and spirits it would be welcome for the senator realized keenly the constant feminine influence that surrounded the boy and knew that it was not the best means for developing his manly qualities the faithful devotion of the good ida could not be repaid with gold she had been in the family now for more than thirty years she had cared for the previous generations with self-abnegation but hanno she carried in her arms lapped him in tender care and loved him to idolatry she had a naive unshakable belief in his privileged station in life which sometimes went to the length of absurdity in whatever touched him she showed a surprising even an unpleasant effrontery suppose for instance she took him with her to buy cakes at the pastry shop she would poke among the sweets on the counter and select a piece for hanno which she would coolly hand him without paying for it the man should feel himself honored indeed and before a crowded show window she would ask the people in front in her west prussian dialect pleasantly enough but with decision to make a place for her charge he was so uncommon in her eyes that she felt there was hardly another child in the world worthy to touch him in little kai's case the mutual preference of the two children had been too strong for her probably she was a little taken by his name too but if other children came up to them on the mill wall as she sat with hanno on a bench fraulein jungmann would get up almost at once make some excuse or other it was late or there was a draught and take her charge away the pretexts she gave to little johann would have led him to believe that all his contemporaries were either scrofulous or full of evil humours and that he himself was a solitary exception which did not tend to increase his already deficient confidence and ease of manner senator budenbroke did not know all the details but he saw enough to convince him that his son's development was not taking the desired course if he could only take his upbringing into his own hands and mould his spirit by daily and hourly contact but he had not the time he perceived the lamentable failure of his occasional efforts he knew they only strained the relations between father and son 
in his mind was a picture which he longed to reproduce it was a picture of hanno's great-grandfather whom he himself had known as a boy a clear-sighted man jovial simple sturdy humorous why could not little johann grow up like that if only he could suppress or forbid the music which was surely not good for the lad's physical development absorbed his powers and took his mind from the practical affairs of life that dreamy nature did it not almost at times border on irresponsibility one day some three-quarters of an hour before dinner hanno had gone down alone to the first story he had practised for a long time on the piano and now was idling about in the living-room he half lay half sat on the chaise longue tying and untying his sailor's knot and his eyes roving aimlessly about caught sight of an open portfolio on his mother's nutwood writing-table it was the leather case with the family papers he rested his elbow on the sofa cushion and his chin in his hand and looked at the things for a while from a distance papa must have had them out after second breakfast and left them there because he was not finished with them some of the papers were sticking in the portfolio some loose sheets lying outside were weighted with a metal ruler and the large gilt-edged notebook with the motley paper lay there open hanno slipped idly down from the sofa and went to the writing-table the book was open at the budenbroke family tree set forth in the hand of his various forebears including his father complete with rubrics parentheses and plainly marked dates kneeling with one knee on the desk chair leaning his head with its soft waves of brown hair on the palm of his hand hanno looked at the manuscript sidewise carelessly critical a little contemptuous and supremely indifferent letting his free hand toy with mamma's gold and ebony pen his eyes roved all over these names masculine and feminine some of them in queer old-fashioned writing with great flourishes written in faded yellow or thick black ink to which little grains of sand were sticking at the very bottom in papa's small neat handwriting that ran so fast over the page he read his own name under that of his parents justus johann kaspar born april fifteenth eighteen sixty one he liked looking at it he straightened up a little and took the ruler and pen still rather idly let his eye travel once more over the whole genealogical host then with absent care mechanically and dreamily he made with the gold pen a beautiful clean double line across the entire page the upper one heavier than the lower just as he had been taught to embellish the page of his arithmetic book he looked at his work with his head on one side and then moved away after dinner the senator called him up and surveyed him with his eyebrows drawn together what is this where did it come from did you do it hanno had to think a minute whether he really had done it and then he answered yes what for what is the matter with you answer me what possessed you to do such a mischievous thing cried the senator and struck hanno's cheek lightly with the rolled-up notebook and little johann stammered retreating with his hand to his cheek i thought i thought there was nothing else coming end of section seventy eight Section seventy nine of Budenbrokes by Thomas Mann, translated by Helen Tracy Low Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part eight, chapter eight A. 
nowadays when the family gathered at table on thursdays under the calmly smiling gaze of the immortals on the walls they had a new and serious theme it called out on the faces of the female budenbrocks at least the broad street ones an expression of cold restraint but it highly excited frau permanader as her manner and gestures betrayed she tossed back her head stretched out her arms before her or flung them above her head as she talked and her voice showed by turns anger and dismay passionate opposition and deep feeling she would pass over from the particular to the general and talk in her throaty voice about wicked people interrupting herself with the little cough that was due to poor digestion or she would utter little trumpetings of disgust tiri trishka grunlek permanader a new name had now been added to these and she pronounced it in a tone of indescribable scorn and hatred the district attorney but when director hugo weinschenk entered late as usual for he was overwhelmed with work balancing his two fists and weaving about more than ever at the waist of his frock coat and sat down at table his lower lip hanging down with its impudent expression under his moustaches then the conversation would come to a full stop and heavy silence would brood over the table until the senator came to the rescue by asking the director how his affair was going on as if it were an ordinary business dealing hugo weinschenk would answer that things were going very well very well indeed they could not go otherwise and then he would blithely change the subject he was much more sprightly than he used to be there was a certain lack of restraint in his roving eye and he would ask ever so many times about gerda budenbroek's fiddle without getting any reply he talked freely and gaily only it was a pity his flow of spirits prevented him from guarding his tongue for he now and then told anecdotes which were not at all suited to the company one in particular was about a wet nurse who prejudiced the health of her charge by the fact that she suffered from flatulence too late or not at all he remarked that his wife was flushing rosy red that thomas the frau consul and gerda were sitting like statues and the misses budenbroek exchanging glances that were fairly boring holes in each other even Riechen Severin was looking insulted at the bottom of the table, and old Consul Kruger was the single one of the company who gave even a subdued snort. What was the trouble with Director Weinschenk? This industrious, solid citizen with the rough exterior and no social graces, who devoted himself with an obstinate sense of duty to his work alone, this man was supposed to have been guilty, not once but repeatedly, of a serious fault. He was accused of, he had been indicted for, performing a business maneuver which was not only questionable but directly dishonest and criminal there would be a trial the outcome of which was not easy to guess what was he accused of it was this certain fires of considerable extent had taken place in different localities which would have cost his company large sums of money director weinschenk was accused of having received private information of such accidents through his agents and then in wrongful possession of this information of having transferred the back insurance to another firm thus saving his own the loss the matter was now in the hands of the state attorney dr moritz hagenstrom thomas said the frau consul in private to her son please explain it to me i do not understand what do you make of the affair why my dear mother 
he answered what is there to say it does not look as though things were quite as they should be unfortunately it seems unlikely to me that weinschenk is as guilty as people think in the modern style of doing business there is a thing they call usance and usance well imagine a manoeuvre not exactly open and above board something that looks dishonest to the man in the street yet perhaps quite customary and taken for granted in the business world that is usance the boundary line between usance and actual dishonesty is extremely hard to draw well if weinschenk has done anything he shouldn't he has probably done no more than a good many of his colleagues who will not get caught but i don't see much chance of his being cleared perhaps in a larger city he might be but here everything depends on cliques and personal motives he should have borne that in mind in selecting his lawyer it is true that we have no really eminent lawyer in the whole town nobody with superior oratorical talent who knows all the ropes and is first in dubious transactions all our jurists hang together they have family connections in many cases they eat together they work together and they are accustomed to considering each other in my opinion it would have been clever to take a town lawyer but what did weinschenk do he thought it necessary and this in itself makes his innocence look doubtful to get a lawyer from berlin a dr breslauer who is a regular rake an accomplished orator and up to all the tricks of the trade he has the reputation of having got so and so many dishonest bankrupts off scot-free he will conduct this affair with the same cleverness for a consideration but will it do any good i can see already that our town lawyers will band together to fight him tooth and nail and that dr hagenstrom's hearers will already be prepossessed in his favor as for the witnesses well weinschenk's own staff won't be any too friendly to him i'm afraid what we indulgently call his rough exterior he would call it that himself too has not made him many friends in short mother i am looking forward to trouble it will be a pity for erica if it turns out badly but i feel most for tony you see she is quite right in saying that hagenstrom is glad of the chance the thing concerns all of us and the disgrace will fall on us too for weinschenk belongs to the family and eats at our table as far as i am concerned i can manage i know what i have to do in public i shall act as if i had nothing whatever to do with the affair i will not go to the trial although i am sorry not to for breslauer is sure to be interesting and in general i must behave with complete indifference to protect myself from the imputation of wanting to use my influence but tony i don't like to think what a sad business a conviction will be for her she protests vehemently against envious intrigues and calumniators and all that but what really moves her is her anxiety lest after all her other troubles she may see her daughter's honorable position lost as well it is the last blow she will protest her belief in weinschenk's innocence the more loudly the more she is forced to doubt it well he may be innocent after all we can only wait and see mother and be very tactful with him and tony and erica but i'm afraid it was under these circumstances that the christmas feast drew near to which little hanno was counting the days with a beating heart and the help of a calendar manufactured by ida jungmann with the christmas tree on the last leaf
the signs of festivity increased ever since the first sunday in advent a great gaily colored picture of a certain ruprecht had been hanging on the wall in grandmamma's dining-room and one morning hanno found his covers and the rug beside his bed sprinkled with gold tinsel a few days later as papa was lying with his newspaper on the living-room sofa and hanno was reading the witch of endor out of gerrock's palm leaves an old man was announced this had happened every year since hanno was a baby and yet was always a surprise they asked him in this old man and he came shuffling along in a big coat with the fur side out sprinkled with bits of cotton wool and tinsel he wore a fur cap and his face had black smudges on it and his beard was long and white the beard and the big bushy eyebrows were also sprinkled with tinsel he explained as he did every year in a harsh voice that this sack on his left shoulder was for good children who said their prayers it contained apples and gilded nuts but that this sack on his right shoulder was for naughty children the old man was of course ruprecht perhaps not actually the real ruprecht it might even be wenzel the barber dressed up in papa's coat turned fur side out but it was as much ruprecht as possible hanno greatly impressed said our father for him as he had last year both times interrupting himself now and again with a little nervous sob and was permitted to put his hand into the sack for good children which the old man forgot to take away the holidays came and there was not much trouble over the report which had to be presented for papa to read even at christmas time the great dining-room was closed and mysterious and there were marzipan and gingerbread to eat and in the streets christmas had already come snow fell the weather was frosty and on the sharp clear air were borne the notes of the barrel organ for the italians with their velvet jackets and their black moustaches had arrived for the christmas feast the shop windows were gay with toys and goodies the booths for the christmas fair had been erected in the market-place and wherever you went you breathed in the fresh spicy odor of the christmas trees set out for sale the evening of the twenty-third came at last and with it the present giving in the house in fisher's lane this was attended by the family only it was a sort of dress rehearsal for the christmas eve party given by the frau consul in meng street she clung to the old customs and reserved the twenty-fourth for a celebration to which the whole family group was bidden which accordingly in the late afternoon assembled in the landscape room the old lady flushed of cheek and with feverish eyes arrayed in a heavy black and gray striped silk that gave out a faint scent of patchouli received her guests as they entered and embraced them silently her gold bracelets tinkling she was strangely excited this evening why mother you're fairly trembling the senator said when he came in with gerda and hanno everything will go off very easily but she only whispered kissing all three of them for jesus christ's sake and my blessed jeans indeed the whole consecrated program instituted by the deceased consul had to be carried out to the smallest detail and the poor lady fluttered about driven by her sense of responsibility for the fitting accomplishment of the evening's performance which must be pervaded with a deep and fervent joy 
she went restlessly back and forth from the pillared hall where the choir boys from st mary's were already assembled to the dining-room where rich and Severine was putting the finishing touches to the tree and the table full of presents to the corridor full of shrinking old people the poor who were to share in the presence and back into the landscape room where she rebuked every unnecessary word or sound with one of her sidelong glances it was so still that the sound of a distant hand organ faint and clear like a toy music box came across to them through the snowy streets some twenty persons or more were sitting or standing about in the room yet it was stiller than a church so still that as the senator cautiously whispered to uncle eustace it reminded one more of a funeral there was really no danger that the solemnity of the feast would be rudely broken in upon by youthful high spirits a glance showed that almost all the persons in the room were arrived at an age when the forms of expression are already long ago fixed senator thomas budenbroke whose pallor gave the lie to his alert energetic humorous expression gerda his wife leaning back in her chair the gleaming blue ringed eyes in her pale face gazing fixedly at the crystal prisms in the chandelier his sister frau permanader his cousin jurgen kruger a quiet neatly dressed official friederica henrietta and fifi the first two more long and lean the third smaller and plumper than ever but all three wearing their stereotyped expression their sharp spiteful smile at everything and everybody as though they were perpetually saying really it seems incredible lastly there was poor ashen grey clotilde whose thoughts were probably fixed upon the coming meal every one of these persons was past forty the hostess herself her brother Justus and his wife and little theresa weichbrot were all well past sixty while old frau consul budenbroek uncle gotthold's widow born stuving as well as madame kettelson now alas almost entirely deaf were already in the seventies erika weinschenk was the only person present in the bloom of youth she was much younger than her husband whose cropped graying head stood out against the idyllic landscape behind him when her eyes the light blue eyes of herr grunlich rested upon him you could see how her full bosom rose and fell without a sound and how she was beset with anxious bewildered thoughts about usance and bookkeeping witnesses prosecuting attorneys defence and judges thoughts like these unchristmas like though they were troubled everybody in the room they all felt uncanny at the presence in their midst of a member of the family who was actually accused of an offence against the law the civic wheel and business probity and who would probably be visited by shame and imprisonment here was a christmas family party at the budenbrokes with an accused man in the circle frau permanator's dignity became majestic and the smile of the mrs budenbroke more and more pointed and what of the children the scant posterity upon whom rested the family hopes were they conscious too of the slightly uncanny atmosphere the state of mind of the little elizabeth could not be fathomed she sat on her bun's lap in a frock trimmed by frau permanader with satin bows folded her small hands into fists sucked her tongue and stared straight ahead of her now and then she would utter a brief sound like a grunt and the nurse would rock her a little on her arm but hanno 
sat still on his footstool at his mother's knee and stared up like her into the chandelier christian was missing where was he at the last minute they noticed his absence the frau consul's characteristic gesture from the corner of her mouth up to her temple as though putting back a refractory hair became frequent and feverish she gave an order to mademoiselle zivarine and the spinster went out through the hall past the choir boys and the poor and down the corridor to christian's room where she knocked on the door christian appeared straightway he limped casually into the landscape room rubbing his bald brow good gracious children he said i nearly forgot the party you nearly forgot his mother repeated and stiffened yes i really forgot it was christmas i was reading a book of travel about south america dear me i've seen such a lot of christmases he added and was about to launch out upon a description of a christmas in a fifth-rate variety theatre in london when all at once the church-like hush of the room began to work upon him and he moved on tiptoe to his place wrinkling up his nose rejoice o daughter of zion sang the choir boys they had previously been indulging in such audible practical jokes that the senator had to get up and stand in the doorway to inspire respect but now they sang beautifully the clear treble sustained by the deeper voices soared up in pure exultant glorifying tones bearing all hearts along with them softening the smiles of the spinsters making the old folk look in upon themselves and back upon the past easing the hearts of those still in the midst of life's tribulations and helping them to forget for a little while hanno unclasped his hands from about his knees he looked very pale and cold played with the fringe of his stool and twisted his tongue out among his teeth he had to draw a deep breath every little while for his heart contracted with a joy almost painful at the exquisite bell-like purity of the chorale the white folding doors were still tightly closed but the spicy poignant odor drifted through the cracks and whetted one's appetite for the wonder within each year with throbbing pulses he awaited this vision of ineffable unearthly splendor what would there be for him in there what he had wished for of course there was always that unless he had been persuaded out of it beforehand the theatre then the long-desired toy theatre would spring at him as the door opened and show him the way to his place this was the suggestion which had stood heavily underlined at the top of his list ever since he had seen fidelio indeed since then it had been almost his single thought he had been taken to the opera as compensation for a particularly painful visit to herr brecht sitting beside his mother in the dress circle he had followed breathless a performance of fidelio and since that time he had heard nothing seen nothing thought of nothing but opera and a passion for the theatre filled him and almost kept him sleepless he looked enviously at people like uncle christian who was known as a regular frequenter and might go every night if he liked consul dulman gosh the broker how could they endure the joy of seeing it every night he himself would ask no more than to look once a week into the hall before the performance hear the voices of the instruments being tuned and gaze for a while at the curtain for he loved it all the seats the musicians the drop curtain even the smell of gas would his theatre be large what sort of curtain would it have 
a tiny hole must be cut in it at once there was a peep-hole in the curtain at the theatre had grandmamma or rather had mademoiselle zivarine for grandmamma could not see to everything herself been able to find all the necessary scenery for fidelio he determined to shut himself up to-morrow and give a performance all by himself and already in fancy he heard his little figures singing for he was approaching the theatre by way of his music exult jerusalem finished the choir and their voices following one another in fugue form united joyously in the last syllable the clear accord died away deep silence reigned in the pillared hall and the landscape room the elders looked down oppressed by the pause only director weinschenk's eyes roved boldly about and frau permanader coughed her dry cough which she could not suppress now the frau consul moved slowly to the table and sat among her family she turned up the lamp and took in her hands the great bible with its edges of faded gold leaf she stuck her glasses on her nose unfastened the two great leather hasps of the book opened it to the place where there was a bookmark took a sip of eau sucre and began to read from the yellowed page with the large print the christmas chapter she read the old familiar words with a simple heartfelt accent that sounded clear and moving in the pious hush and to men good will she finished and from the pillared hall came a trio of voices holy night peaceful night the family in the landscape room joined in they did so cautiously for most of them were unmusical as a tone now and then betrayed but that in no wise impaired the effect of the old hymn frau permanader sang with trembling lips it sounded sweetest and most touching to the heart of her who had a troubled life behind her and looked back upon it in the brief peace of this holy hour madame kettleson wept softly but comprehended nothing end of section seventy nine section eighty of budenbrooks by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part eight chapter eight b now the frau consul rose she grasped the hands of her grandson johann and her granddaughter elizabeth and proceeded through the room the elders of the family fell in behind and the younger brought up the rear the servants and poor joined in from the hall and so they marched singing with one accord o evergreen uncle christian sang o ever blue and made the children laugh by lifting up his legs like a jumping jack through the wide open lofty folding doors and straight into paradise the whole great room was filled with the fragrance of slightly singed evergreen twigs and glowing with light from countless tiny flames the sky-blue hangings with the white figures on them added to the brilliance there stood the mighty tree between the dark red window curtains towering nearly to the ceiling decorated with silver tinsel and large white lilies with a shining angel at the top and the manger at the foot its candles twinkled in the general flood of light like far-off stars and a row of tiny trees also full of stars and hung with comfits stood on the long white table laden with presents that stretched from the window to the door all the gas brackets on the wall were lighted too and thick candles burned in all four of the gilded candelabra in the corners of the room large objects too large to stand upon the table were arranged upon the floor 
and two smaller tables likewise adorned with tiny trees and covered with gifts for the servants and the poor stood on either side of the door dazzled by the light and the unfamiliar look of the room they marched once around it singing filed past the manger where lay the little wax figure of the christ child and then moved to their places and stood silent hanno was quite dazed his fevered glance had soon sought out the theatre which as it stood there upon the table seemed larger and grander than anything he had dared to dream of but his place had been changed it was now opposite to where he had stood last year and this made him doubtful whether the theatre was really his and on the floor beneath it was something else a large mysterious something which had surely not been on his list a piece of furniture that looked like a commode could it be meant for him come here my dear child said the frau consul and look at this she lifted the lid i know you like to play chorales herr pfuhl will show you how you must tread all the time sometimes more and sometimes less and then not lift up the hands but change the fingers so peu a peu it was a harmonium a pretty little thing of polished brown wood with metal handles at the sides gay bellows worked with a treadle and a neat revolving stool hanno struck a chord a soft organ tone released itself and made the others look up from their presence he hugged his grandmother who pressed him tenderly to her and then left him to receive the thanks of her other guests he turned to his theatre the harmonium was an overpowering dream which just now he had no time to indulge there was a superfluity of joy and he lost sight of single gifts in trying to see and notice everything at once ah here was the prompter's box a shell-shaped one and a beautiful red and gold curtain rolled up and down behind it the stage was set for the last act of fidelio the poor prisoners stood with folded hands don pizarro in enormous puffed sleeves was striking a permanent and awesome attitude and the minister in black velvet approached from behind with hasty strides to turn all to happiness it was just as in the theatre only almost more beautiful the jubilee chorus the finale echoed in hanno's ears and he sat down at the harmonium to play a fragment which stuck in his memory but he got up again almost at once to take up the book he had wished for a mythology in a red binding with a gold palace athene on the cover he ate some of the sweetmeats from his plate full of marzipan gingerbread and other goodies looked through various small articles like writing utensils and school bag and for the moment forgot everything else to examine a pen-holder with a tiny glass bulb on it when you held this up to your eye you saw like magic a broad swiss landscape mademoiselle zipherine and the maid passed tea and biscuits and while hanno dipped and ate he had time to look about every one stood talking and laughing they all showed each other their presence and admired the presence of others objects of porcelain silver gold nickel wood silk cloth and every other conceivable material lay on the table huge loaves of decorated gingerbread alternating with loaves of marzipan stood in long rows still moist and fresh all the presents made by frau permanator were decorated with huge satin bows now and then some one came up to little johann put an arm across his shoulders and looked at his presents with the overdone cynical admiration which people manufacture for the treasures of children uncle christian was the only person who did not display this grown-up arrogance he sauntered over to his nephew's place with a diamond ring on his finger a present from his mother and his pleasure in the toy theatre was as unaffected as hanno's own 
by george that's fine he said letting the curtain up and down and stepping back for a view of the scenery did you ask for it oh so you did ask for it he suddenly said after a pause during which his eyes had roved about the room as though he were full of unquiet thoughts why did you ask for it what made you think of it have you been in the theatre fidele eh? yes they give that well and you want to imitate it do you do opera yourself eh did it make such an impression on you listen son take my advice don't think too much about such things theatre and that sort of thing it's no good believe your old uncle i've always spent too much time on them and that is why i haven't come to much good i've made great mistakes you know thus he held forth to his nephew while hanno looked up at him curiously he paused and his bony emaciated face cleared up as he regarded the little theatre then he suddenly moved forward one of the figures on the stage and sang in a cracked and hollow tremolo ah what terrible transgression he sat down on the piano stool which he shoved up in front of the theatre and began to give a performance singing all the roles and the accompaniment as well and gesticulating furiously the family gathered at his back laughed nodded their heads and enjoyed it immensely as for hanno his pleasure was profound christian broke off after a while very abruptly his face clouded he rubbed his hand over his skull and down his left side and turned to his audience with his nose wrinkled and his face quite drawn there it is again he said i never have a little fun without having to pay for it it is not an ordinary pain you know it is a misery down all this left side because the nerves are too short but his relatives took his complaints as little seriously as they had his entertainment they hardly answered him but indifferently dispersed leaving christian sitting before the little theatre in silence he blinked rapidly for a bit and then got up no child said he stroking hanno's head amuse yourself with it but not too much you know don't neglect your work for it do you hear i have made a great many mistakes i think i'll go over to the club for a while he said to the elders they are celebrating there to-day too good-bye for the present and he went off across the hall on his stiff crooked legs they had all eaten the midday meal earlier than usual to-day and been hungry for the tea and biscuits but they had scarcely finished when great crystal bowls were handed round full of a yellow grainy substance which turned out to be almond cream it was a mixture of eggs ground almonds and rose-water tasting perfectly delicious but if you ate even a tiny spoonful too much the result was an attack of indigestion however the company was not restrained by fear of consequences even though frau consul begged them to leave a little corner for supper clotilde in particular performed miracles with the almond cream and lapped it up like so much porridge with heartfelt gratitude there was also wine jelly in glasses and english plum cake gradually they all moved over to the landscape room where they sat with their plates round the table hanno remained alone in the dining-room little elisabeth weinschenk had already been taken home but he was to stay up for supper for the first time in his life the servants and the poor folk had had their presents and gone Ida young man was chattering with Rick and Ziverin in the hall, although generally, as a governess, she preserved the proper distance between herself and the Frau Consul's maid. The lights of the great tree were burnt down and extinguished, the manger was in darkness, but a few candles still burned on the small trees, and now and then a twig came within reach of the flame and crackled up, increasing the pungent smell in the room 
every breath of air that stirred the trees stirred the pieces of tinsel too and made them give out a delicate metallic whisper it was still enough to hear the hand organ again sounding through the frosty air from a distant street hanno abandoned himself to the enjoyment of the christmas sounds and smells he propped his head on his hand and read in his mythology book munching mechanically the while because that was proper to the day marzipan sweetmeats almond cream and plum cake until the chest oppression caused by an overloaded stomach mingled with the sweet excitation of the evening and gave him a feeling of pensive felicity he read about the struggles of zeus before he arrived at the headship of the gods and every now and then he listened into the other room where they were going at length into the future of poor aunt clotilde clotilde on this evening was far and away the happiest of them all a smile lighted up her colourless face as she received congratulations and teasing from all sides her voice even broke now and then out of joyful emotion she had at last been made a member of the order of st john the senator had succeeded by subterranean methods in getting her admitted not without some private grumblings about nepotism on the part of certain gentlemen now the family all discussed the excellent institution which was similar to the homes in mecklenburg dobertien and ribnitz for ladies from noble families the object of these establishments was the suitable care of portionless women from old and worthy families poor clotilde was now assured of a small but certain income which would increase with the years and finally when she had succeeded to the highest class would secure her a decent home in the cloister itself little hanno stopped a while with the grown-ups but soon strayed back to the dining-room which displayed a new charm now that the brilliant light did not fairly dazzle one with its splendours it was an extraordinary pleasure to roam about there as if on a half-darkened stage after the performance and see a little behind the scenes he touched the lilies on the big fir tree with their golden stamens handled the tiny figures of people and animals in the manger found the candles that lighted the transparency for the star of bethlehem over the stable lifted up the long cloth that covered the present table and saw quantities of wrapping paper and pasteboard boxes stacked beneath the conversation in the landscape room was growing less and less agreeable inevitably irresistibly it had arrived at the one dismal theme which had been in everybody's mind but which they had thus far avoided as a tribute to the festal evening hugo weinschenk himself dilated upon it with a wild levity of manner and gesture he explained certain details of the procedure the examination of witnesses had now been interrupted by the christmas recess condemned the very obvious bias of the president dr pelander and poured scorn on the attitude which the public prosecutor dr hagenstrom thought it proper to assume toward himself and the witnesses for the defence breslauer had succeeded in drawing the sting of several of his most slanderous remarks and he had assured the director that for the present there need be no fear of a conviction the senator threw in a question now and then out of courtesy and frau permanader sitting on the sofa with elevated shoulders would utter fearful imprecations against dr moritz hagenstrom but the others were silent so profoundly silent that the director at length fell silent too for little hanno over in the dining-room the time sped by on angel's wings but in the landscape-room there reigned an oppressive silence 
which dragged on till christian came back from the club where he had celebrated christmas with the bachelors and good fellows the cold stump of a cigar hung between his lips and his haggard cheeks were flushed he came through the dining-room and said as he entered the landscape room well children the tree was simply gorgeous weinschenk we ought to have had breslauer come to see it he has never seen anything like it i am sure he encountered one of his mother's quiet reproachful side glances and returned it with an easy unembarrassed questioning look at nine o'clock the party sat down to supper it was laid as always on these occasions in the pillared hall the frau consul recited the ancient grace with sincere conviction come lord jesus be our guest and bless the bread thou gavest us to which as usual on the holy evening she added a brief prayer the substance of which was an admonition to remember those who on this blessed night did not fare so well as the budenbrook family this accomplished they all sat down with good consciences to a lengthy repast beginning with carp and butter sauce and old rhine wine the senator put two fish scales into his pocket to help him save money during the coming year christian however ruefully remarked that he hadn't much faith in the prescription and consul kruger had no need of it his pittance had long since been invested securely beyond the reach of fluctuations in the exchange the old man sat as far away as possible from his wife to whom he hardly ever spoke nowadays she persisted in sending money to jacob who was still roaming about nobody knew where unless his mother did uncle eustace scowled forbiddingly when the conversation with the advent of the second course turned upon the absent members of the family and he saw the foolish mother wipe her eyes they spoke of the frankfurt budenbrooks and the duchamps in hamburg and of pastor tibertius in riga too without any ill-will and the senator and his sister touched glasses in silence to the health of messrs grunlich and permanator for after all did they not in a sense belong to the family too the turkey stuffed with chestnuts raisins and apples was universally praised they compared it with other years and decided that this one was the largest for a long time with the turkey came roast potatoes and two kinds of compote and each dish held enough to satisfy the appetite of a family all by itself the old red wine came from the firm of mullendorf little johann sat between his parents and choked down with difficulty a small piece of white meat with stuffing he could not begin to compete with aunt tilda and he felt tired and out of sorts but it was a great thing none the less to be dining with the grown-ups and to have one of the beautiful little rolls with poppy-seed in his elaborately folded serviette and three wine-glasses in front of his place he usually drank out of the little gold mug which uncle eustace gave him but when the red white and brown meringues appeared and uncle eustace poured some oily yellow greek wine into the smallest of the three glasses his appetite revived he ate a whole red ice then half a white one then a little piece of the chocolate his teeth hurting horribly all the while then he sipped his sweet wine gingerly and listened to uncle christian who had begun to talk he told about the christmas celebrations at the club which had been very jolly it seemed good god he said just as if he were about to relate the story of johnny thunderstorm those fellows drank swedish punch just like water ugh said the frau consul shortly and cast down her eyes but he paid no heed his eyes began to wander and thought and memory became so vivid that they flickered like shadows across his haggard face do any of you know 
he asked how it feels to drink too much swedish punch i don't mean getting drunk i mean the feeling you have the next day the after effects they are very queer and unpleasant yes queer and unpleasant at the same time reason enough for describing them said the senator i say christian that does not interest us in the least said the frau consul but he paid no attention it was his peculiarity that at such times nothing made any impression on him he was silent a while and then it seemed that the thing which moved him was ripe for speech you go about feeling ghastly he said turning to his brother and wrinkling up his nose headache and upset stomach oh well you have that with other things too but you feel filthy here he rubbed his hands together his face entirely distorted you wash your hands but it does no good they feel dirty and clammy and there is grease under the nails you take a bath no good your whole body is sticky and unclean you itch all over and you feel disgusted with yourself do you know the feeling thomas you do know it don't you yes yes said the senator making a gesture of repulsion with his hand but christian's extraordinary tactlessness had so increased with the years that he never perceived how unpleasant he was making himself to the company nor how out of place his conversation was in these surroundings and on this evening he continued to describe the evil effects of too much swedish punch and when he felt that he had exhausted the subject he gradually subsided before they arrived at the butter and cheese the frau consul found occasion for another little speech to her family if she said not quite everything in the course of the years had gone as we in our short-sightedness desired there remained such manifold blessings as should fill our hearts with gratitude and love for it was precisely this mingling of trials with blessings which showed that god never lifted his hand from the family but ever guided its destinies according to his wise design which we might not seek to question and now with hopeful hearts we might drink together to the family health and to its future that future when all the old and elderly of the present company would be laid to rest and to the children to whom the christmas feast most properly belonged as director weinschenk's small daughter was no longer present little johann had to make the round of the table alone and drink severally with all the company from grandmamma to mamselle zivarine when he came to his father the senator touched the child's glass with his and gently lifted hanno's chin to look into his eyes but his son did not meet his glance the long gold-brown lashes lay deep deep upon the delicate bluish shadows beneath his eyes theresa weichbrot took his head in both her hands kissed him explosively on both cheeks and said with such a hearty emphasis that surely god must have heeded it be happy you good child an hour later hanno lay in his little bed which now stood in the antechamber next to the senator's dressing-room he lay on his back out of regard for his stomach which feeling was far from pleasant over all the things he had put into it that evening ida came out of her room in her dressing-gown waving a glass about in circles in the air in order to dissolve its contents he drank the carbonate of soda down quickly made a wry face and fell back again i think i'll just have to give it all up ida he said oh nonsense hanno just lie still on your back you see now who was it kept making signs at you to stop eating and who was it that wouldn't do it well perhaps i'll be all right when will the things come ida 
tomorrow morning first thing my dearie i wish they were here i wish i had them now yes yes my dearie but just have a good sleep now she kissed him put out the light and went away he lay quietly giving himself up to the operation of the soda he had taken but before his eyes gleamed the dazzling brilliance of the christmas tree he saw his theatre and his harmonium and his book of mythology he heard the choir boys singing in the distance rejoice jerusalem everything sparkled and glittered his head felt dull and feverish his heart affected by the rebellious stomach beat strong and irregularly he lay for long in a condition of mingled discomfort excitement and reminiscent bliss and could not fall asleep next day there would be a third christmas party at frulein weichbrot's he looked forward to it as to a comic performance in the theatre theresa weichbrot had given up her pensionnat in the past year madame kettleson now occupied the first story of the house on the mill bank and she herself the ground floor and there they lived alone the burden of her deformed little body grew heavier with the years and she concluded with christian humility and submission that the end was not far off for some years now she had believed that each christmas was her last and she strove with all the powers at her command to give a departing brilliance to the feast that was held in her small overheated rooms her means were very narrow and she gave away each year a part of her possessions to swell the heap of gifts under the tree knick-knacks paperweights emery bags needle cushions glass vases and fragments of her library miscellaneous books of every shape and size books like the secret journal of a student of himself hebel's alemannian poems krumacher's parables hanno had once received an edition of the pensee de blaise pascal in such tiny print that it had to be read with the glass bishop flowed in streams and sesame's gingerbread was very spicy but frulein weichbrot abandoned herself with such trembling emotion to the joys of each christmas party that none of them ever went off without a mishap there was always some small catastrophe or other to make the guests laugh and enhance the silent fervor of the hostess's mien a jug of bishop would be upset and overwhelm everything in a spicy sticky red flood or the decorated tree would topple off its wooden support just as they solemnly entered the room hanno fell asleep with the mishap of the previous year before his eyes it had happened just before the gifts were given out theresa weichbrot had read the christmas chapter in such impressive accents that all the vowels got inextricably commingled and then retreated before her guests to the door where she made a little speech she stood before the threshold humped and tiny her old hands clasped before her childish bosom the green silk cap ribbons falling over her fragile shoulders above her head over the door was a transparency garlanded with evergreen that said glory to god in the highest and sesame spoke of god's mercy she mentioned that this was her last christmas and ended by reminding them that the words of the apostle commended them all to joy wherewith she trembled from head to foot so much did her whole poor little body share in her emotions rejoice said she laying her head on one side and nodding violently and again i say unto you rejoice but at this moment the whole transparency with a puffing crackling spitting noise went up in flames and mademoiselle weichbrot gave a little shriek and a side-spring of unexpected picturesqueness and agility and got herself out of the way of the rain of flying sparks as hanno recalled the leap which the old spinster performed 
he giggled nervously for several minutes into his pillow. End of section 80《Section 81 of Budenbrooks by Thomas Mann, translated by Helen Tracy Lowe Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bruce Peary. Part 8, Chapter 9. Frau Permenader was going along Broad Street in a great hurry. There was something abandoned about her air. She showed almost none of the impressive bearing usual to her on the street hunted and harassed in almost violent haste she had as it were been able to save only a remnant of her dignity like a beaten king who gathers what is left of his army about him to seek safety in the arms of flight she looked pitiable indeed her upper lip that arched upper lip that had always done its share to give charm to her face was quivering now in the eyes were large with apprehension they were very bright and stared fixedly ahead of her as though they too were hurrying onward her hair came in disorder from under her close hat and her face showed the pale yellow tint which it always had when her digestion took a turn for the worse her digestion was obviously worse in these days the family noticed that on thursdays and no matter how hard every one tried to keep off the rocks the conversation always made straight for them and stuck there on the subject of hugo weinschenk's trial frau permenader herself led up to it she would call on god and her fellow men to tell her how public prosecutor moritz hagenstrom could sleep of nights for her part she could not understand it she never would her agitation increased with every word thank you i can't eat she would say and push away her plate she would elevate her shoulders toss her head and in the height of her passion fall back upon the practice acquired in her munich years of taking nothing but beer cold bavarian beer poured into an empty stomach the nerves of which were in rebellion and would revenge themselves bitterly toward the end of the meal she always had to get up and go down to the garden or the court where she suffered the most dreadful fits of nausea leaning upon ida jungmann or rickian sivarin her stomach would finally relieve itself of its contents and contract with spasms of pain which sometimes lasted for minutes and would continue at intervals for a long time it was about three in the afternoon a windy rainy january day frau permenader turned the corner at fisher's lane and hurried down the steep declivity to her brother's house after a hasty knock she went from the court straight into the bureau her eye flying across the desks to where the senator sat in his seat by the window she made such an imploring motion with her head that he put down his pen without more ado and went to her well he said one eyebrow lifted a moment thomas it's very pressing there's no time to waste he opened the baize door of his private office closed it behind him when they were both inside and looked at his sister inquiringly tom she said her voice quavering wringing her hands inside her muff you must give it to us lay it out for us you will won't you the money for the bond i mean we haven't it where should we get twenty-five thousand marks from i should like to know you will get them back you'll get them back all too soon i'm afraid you understand the thing is this in short they have reached a point where hagenstrom demands immediate arrest or else a bond of twenty-five thousand marks and Weinschenk will give you his word not to stir from the spot. Has it really come to that? the senator said, shaking his head. Yes, they have succeeded in getting that far, the villains. Frau Permenader sank upon the sofa with an impotent sob. And they will go on, they will go on to the end, Tom. Tony, 
he said and sat down sidewise by his mahogany desk crossing one leg over the other and leaning his head on his hand tell me straight out do you still have faith in his innocence she sobbed once or twice before she answered hopelessly oh no tom how could i i've seen so much evil in the world i haven't believed in it from the beginning even though i tried my very best life makes it so very hard you know to believe in any one's innocence oh no i've had doubts of his good conscience for a long time and erica has not known what to make of him she confessed it to me with tears on account of his behavior at home we haven't talked about it of course he got ruder and ruder and kept demanding all the time that erica should be lively and divert his mind and make him forget his troubles and he broke the dishes when she wasn't you can't imagine what it was like when he shut himself up evenings with his papers when anybody knocked you could hear him jump up and shout who's there they were silent but suppose he is guilty tom suppose he did do it began frau permanator afresh and her voice gathered strength he wasn't working for his own pocket but for the company and then good heavens in this life people have to realize there are other things to be taken into consideration he married into our family he is one of us now they can't just go and stick him into prison like that he shrugged his shoulders what are you shrugging your shoulders for tom do you mean that you are willing to sit down under the last and crowning insult these adventurers think they can offer us we must do something he mustn't be convicted aren't you the burgomaster's right hand my god can't the senate just pardon him if it likes you know before i came to you i nearly went to kramer to get him to implore him to intervene and take a stand in the matter he is chief of police oh child that is all just nonsense nonsense tom and erica and the child said she lifting up her muff with her two imploring hands inside she was still a moment she let her arms fall her chin began to quiver and two great tears ran down from under her drooping lids she added softly and me oh tony be brave said the senator her helplessness went through him he pushed his chair up to hers and stroked her hair in an effort to console her everything isn't over yet perhaps it will come out all right of course i will give you the money that goes without saying and breslauer's very clever she shook her head weeping no tom it will not come out all right i've no hope that it will they will convict him and put him in prison and then the hard time will come for erica and me her dowry is gone it all went to the setting out the furniture and pictures we shan't get a quarter of it back by selling and the salary was always spent we never put a penny by we will go back to mother if she will take us until he is free and then where can we go we'll just have to sit on the rocks she sobbed on the rocks oh that's just an expression a figure what i mean is it won't turn out all right i've had too much to bear i don't know how i came to deserve it all but i can't hope any more erica will be like me with grunlich and permanator but now you can see just how it is and how it all comes over you could i help it could any one help it i ask you tom she repeated drearily and looked at him with her tear-swimming eyes everything i've ever undertaken has gone wrong and turned to misfortune and i've meant everything so well god knows i have and now this too this is the last straw the very last she wept 
leaning on the arm which he gently put about her wept over her ruined life and the quenching of this last hope a week later herr director hugo weinschenk was sentenced to three and a half years imprisonment and arrested at once there was a very large crowd at the final session lawyer breslauer of berlin made a speech for the defense the like of which had never been heard before gosh the broker went about for weeks afterward bursting with enthusiasm for the masterly pathos and irony it displayed christian budenbroek heard it too and afterward got behind a table at the club with a pile of newspapers in front of him and reproduced the whole speech at home he declared that jurisprudence was the finest profession there was and he thought it would just have suited him the public prosecutor himself dr moritz hagenstrom who was a great connoisseur said in private that the speech had been a genuine treat to him but the famous advocate's talents did not prevent his colleagues from thumping him on the back and telling him he had not pulled the wool over their eyes the necessary sale followed upon the disappearance of the director and when it was over people in town began gradually to forget about hugo weinschenk but the mrs budenbroek sitting on thursday at the family table declared that they had known the first moment from the man's eyes that he was not straight that his conscience was bad and that there would be trouble in the end certain considerations which they wished now they had not regarded had led them to suppress these painful observations end of section eighty one section eighty two of budenbroek's by thomas mann translated by helen tracy low porter this librivox recording is in the public domain read by bruce peary part nine chapter one senator budenbroek followed the two gentlemen old dr grabo and young dr longhals out of the frau consul's bedchamber into the breakfast-room and closed the door may i ask you to give me a moment gentlemen he said and led them up the steps through the corridor and into the landscape room where on account of the raw damp weather the stove was already burning you will understand my anxiety he said sit down and tell me something reassuring if possible sounds my dear senator answered dr grabo leaning back comfortably his chin in his neckcloth his hat brim propped in both hands against his stomach dr longhouse put his top hat down on the carpet beside him and regarded his hands which were exceptionally small and covered with hair he was a heavy dark man with a pointed beard a pompadour haircut beautiful eyes and a vain expression there is positively no reason for serious disquiet at present dr grabo went on when we take into consideration our honored patient's powers of resistance my word i think as an old and tried counsellor i ought to know what that resistance is it is simply astonishing for her years i must say yes precisely for her years said the senator uneasily twisting his moustaches i don't say went on dr grabo in his gentle voice that your dear mother will be walking out to-morrow you can tell that by looking at her of course there's no denying that the inflammation has taken a disappointing turn in the last twenty-four hours the chill yesterday afternoon did not please me at all and to-day there is actually pain in the side and some fever oh nothing to speak of but still in short my dear senator we shall probably have to reckon with the troublesome fact that the lung is slightly affected inflammation of the lungs then asked the senator and looked from one physician to the other yes pneumonia said dr langhaus with a solemn and correct bow a slight inflammation however and confined to the right side 
answered the family physician we will do our best to localize it then there is ground for serious concern after all the senator sat quite still and looked the speaker full in the face concern oh we must be concerned to limit the affection we must ease the cough and go at the fever energetically the quinine will see to that and by the by my dear senator let me warn you against feeling alarm over single symptoms you know if the difficulty in breathing increases or there should be a little delirium in the night or a good deal of discharge to-morrow a sort of rusty-looking mucus with a little blood in it well all that is to be expected entirely regular and normal do reassure dear madame permenader on this point too she is nursing the patient with such devotion how is she feeling i quite forgot to ask how she has been in the last few days she is about as usual the senator said i have not heard of anything new she is not taking much thought for her own condition these days of course of course and apropos your sister needs rest especially at night and mademoiselle zivarine has not time to give her all the rest she needs what about a nurse my dear senator why not have one of our good gray sisters in whom you feel such an interest the mother superior would be glad to send you one you consider it necessary i am only suggesting it the sisters are invaluable their experience and calmness are always so soothing to the patient especially in an illness like this where there is a succession of disquieting symptoms well let me repeat no anxiety my dear senator and we shall see we shall see we will have another talk this evening positively said dr longhouse took his hat and got up with his colleague but the senator had not finished he had another question another test to make gentlemen he said one word more my brother christian is a nervous man he cannot stand much do you advise me to send him word should i suggest to him to come home your brother christian is not in town no he is in hamburg for a short time on business i understand dr grabo gave his colleague a glance then he laughingly shook the senator's hand and said well we'll let him attend to his business in peace no use of setting him unnecessarily if any change comes which seems to make it advisable to quiet the patient or to raise her spirits well there is plenty of time still plenty of time the gentleman traversed the pillared hall and stood on the steps a while talking about other matters politics and the agitations and changes due to the war just then ended well good times will be coming now eh herr senator money in the country and fresh confidence everywhere and the senator partially agreed with him he said that the grain trade with russia had been greatly stimulated since the outbreak of war and mentioned the dimensions to which the import trade in oats had attained though the profit it was true had been very unevenly divided the physicians took their leave and senator budenbroke turned to go back to the sick-room he revolved what dr grabo had said he had spoken with reserve he gave the impression of avoiding anything definite the single plain word was inflammation of the lungs which became no more reassuring after dr longhaus added the scientific terminology pneumonia at the frau consul's age the fact that there were two physicians coming and going was in itself disquieting grabo had arranged that very unobtrusively he intended to retire before long and as young dr langhaus would be then taking over the practice he dr grabo would be pleased if he might bring him in now and again 
when the senator entered the darkened room his mien appeared alert and his bearing energetic he was used to hiding his cares and weariness under an air of calmness and poise and the mask glided over his features as he opened the door almost as though by a single act of will frau permenader sat by the high bed the hangings of which were thrust back and held her mother's hand the old lady was propped up on pillows she turned her head as her son came in and looked searchingly with her pale blue eyes into his face a look of calm self-control yet of deliberate insistence coming as it did slightly sidewise there was almost something sinister about it too two red spots stood out upon the pallor of her cheeks but there were no signs of weakness or exhaustion the old lady was very wide awake more so in fact than those around her for after all she was the person most concerned and she mistrusted this illness she was not at all disposed to lie down and let it have its own way what did they say thomas she asked in a brisk decided voice which made her cough directly she tried to keep the cough behind her closed lips but it burst out and made her put her hand to her side they said answered the senator when the spasm was over stroking her hand they said that our dear good mother will be up again in a few days the wretched cough is responsible for your lying here the lung is of course slightly affected it's not exactly inflammation he hastened to say as he saw her narrowing gaze but even if it were that needn't necessarily be so bad it might be much worse he finished in short the lung is somewhat irritated and they may be right where is mamselle Severin? gone to the chemist's said frau permenator yes you see she has gone to the chemist's again and you look as though you might go to sleep any minute tony no it isn't good enough if only for a day or so we should have a nurse in don't you think so i will find out if my mother superior up at the gray sisters has any one free thomas said the frau consul this time in a more cautious voice so as not to let loose another cough believe me you cause a good deal of feeling by your protection of the catholic order against the black protestant sisters you have shown the catholics a distinct preference pastor pringsheim complained to me about it very strenuously a little time ago well he needn't i am convinced that the gray sisters are more faithful devoted and self-sacrificing than the black ones are the protestants aren't the real thing they all marry the first chance they get they are worldly egotistical and ordinary while the gray sisters are perfectly disinterested i am sure they are much nearer heaven and they are better for us for the very reason that they owe me some gratitude what should we have done without sister leandra when hanno had convulsions i only hope she is free and sister leandra came she put down her cloak and little handbag took off the gray veil which she wore on the street over her white one and went softly about her work in her gentle friendly way the rosary at her waist clicking as she moved she remained a day and a night with the querulous not always patient sufferer and then withdrew almost apologetic over the human weakness that enforced a little repose she was replaced by another sister but came back again after she had slept the frau consul required constant attendance at her bedside the worse her condition grew the more she bent all her thoughts and all her energies upon her illness for which she felt a naive hatred nearly all her life she had been a woman of the world with a quiet native and permanent love of life and good living yet she had filled her latter years with piety and charitable deeds 
largely out of loyalty toward her dead husband but also perhaps by reason of an unconscious impulse which bade her make her peace with heaven for her own strong vitality and induce it to grant her a gentle death despite the tenacious clutch she had always had on life but the gentle death was not to be hers despite many a sore trial her form was quite unbowed her eyes still clear she still loved to set a good table to dress well and richly to ignore events that were unpleasant and to share with complacency in the high regard that was everywhere felt for her son and now this illness this inflammation of the lungs had attacked her erect form without any previous warning without any preparation to soften the blow there had been no spiritual anticipation none of that mining and sapping of the forces which slowly painfully estranges us from life and rouses in us the sweet longing for a better world for the end for peace no the old frau consul despite the spiritual courses of her latter years felt scarce prepared to die and she was filled with agony of spirit at the thought that if this were indeed the end then this illness of itself in awful haste in the last hour must with bodily torments break down her spirit and bring her to surrender she prayed much but almost more she watched as often as she was conscious over her own condition felt her pulse took her temperature and fought her cough but the pulse was poor the temperature mounted after falling a little and she passed from chills to fever and delirium her cough increased bringing up a blood impregnated mucus and she was alarmed by the difficulty she had in breathing it was accounted for by the fact that now not only a lobe of the right lung but the whole right lung was affected with even distinct traces of a process in the left which dr langhaus looking at his nails called hepatization and about which dr grabo said nothing at all the fever wasted the patient relentlessly the digestion failed slowly inexorably the decline of strength went on she followed it she took eagerly whenever she could the concentrated nourishment which they gave her she knew the hours for her medicines better than the nurse and she was so absorbed in watching the progress of her case that she hardly spoke to any one but the physicians and displayed actual interest only when talking with them callers had been admitted in the beginning and the old ladies of her social circle pastors wives and members of the jerusalem evenings came to see her but she received them with apathy and soon dismissed them her relatives felt the difference in the old lady's greeting it was almost disdainful as though she were saying to them you can't do anything for me even when little hanno came in a good hour she only stroked his cheek and turned away her manner said more plainly than words children you are all very good but perhaps i may be dying she received the two physicians on the other hand with very lively interest and went into the details of her condition one day the gerhardt ladies appeared the descendants of powell gerhardt they came in their mantles with their flat shepherdess hats and their provision baskets from visiting the poor and could not be prevented from seeing their sick friend they were left alone with her and god only knows what they said as they sat at her bedside but when they departed their eyes and their faces were more gentle more radiant more blissfully remote than ever while the frau consul lay within with just such eyes and just such an expression quite still quite peaceful more peaceful than ever before her breath came very softly and at long intervals and she was visibly declining from weakness to weakness 
Frau Permenader murmured a strong word in the wake of the Gerhardt ladies, and sent at once for the physicians. The two gentlemen had barely entered the sick chamber when a surprising alteration took place in the patient. She stirred, she moved, she almost sat up. The sight of her trusted and faithful professional advisers brought her back to earth at a bound. She put out her hands to them and began. Welcome, gentlemen. Today, in the course of the day. The illness had attacked both lungs. Of that there was no more room for doubt. Yes, my dear senator, Dr. Grabo said, and took Thomas Budenbroek by the hand. It is now both lungs. We have not been able to prevent it. That is always serious. You know as well as I do. I would not attempt to deceive you. No matter what the age of the patient, the condition is serious. And if you ask me again today whether, in my opinion, your brother should be written to, or perhaps a telegram would be better, I should hesitate to deter you from it. How is he, by the way? A good fellow, Christian. I've always liked him immensely. But for heaven's sake, my dear senator, don't draw any exaggerated conclusions from what I say. There is no immediate danger. I am foolish to take the word in my mouth. But still, under the circumstances, you know, one must reckon with the unexpected. We are very well satisfied with your mother as a patient. She helps all she can. She doesn't leave us in the lurch. No, on my word, she is an incomparable patient. So there is still great hope, my dear sir, and we must hope for the best. But there is a moment when hope becomes something artificial and insincere. There is a change in the patient. He alters. There is something strange about him. He is not as he was in life. He speaks, but we do not know how to reply. What he says is strange. It seems to cut off his retreat back to life. It condemns him to death. And when that moment comes, even if he is our dearest upon this earth, we do not know how to wish him back. If we could bid him arise and walk, he would be as frightful as one risen from his coffin. Dreadful symptoms of the coming dissolution showed themselves, even though the organs, still in command of a tenacious will, continued to function. It had now been weeks since Frau Consul first took to her bed with a cold, and she began to have bed sores. They would not heal, and grew worse and worse. She could not sleep because of pain, coughing, and shortness of breath, and also because she herself clung to consciousness with all her might. Only for minutes at a time did she lose herself in fever. But now she began, even when she was conscious, to talk to people who had long been dead. One afternoon in the twilight she said suddenly, in a loud, fervent, anxious voice, "'Yes, my dear Jean, I am coming.' and the immediacy of the reply was such that one almost thought to hear the voice of the deceased consul calling her christian arrived he came from hamburg where he had been he said on business he only stopped a short time in the sick-room and left it his eyes roving wildly rubbing his forehead and saying it's frightful it's frightful i can't stand it any longer Pastor Prinksheim came, measured Sister Leandra with a chilling glance, and prayed with a beautifully modulated voice at the bedside. Then came the brief lightening, the flickering up of the dying flame. The fever slackened, there was a deceptive return of strength, and a few plain hopeful words that brought tears of joy to the eyes of the watchers at the bedside children we shall keep her you'll see we shall keep her after all cried thomas budenbroek she will be with us next christmas 
but even in the next night shortly after gerda and her husband had gone to bed they were summoned back to meng street by frau permanader for the mother was struggling with death a cold rain was falling and a high wind drove it against the window panes the bedchamber as the senator and his wife entered it was lighted by two sconces burning on the table and both physicians were present christian too had been summoned from his room and sat with his back to the bed and his forehead bowed in his hands they had sent for the dying woman's brother eustace kruger and he would shortly be here frau permanader and erica were sobbing softly at the foot of the bed sister leandra and mademoiselle zivarine had nothing more to do and stood gazing in sadness on the face of the dying the frau consul lay on her back supported by a quantity of pillows with both her blue-veined hands once so beautiful now so emaciated she ceaselessly stroked the coverlet in trembling haste her head in the white nightcap moved from side to side with dreadful regularity her lips were drawn inward and opened and closed with a snap at every tortured effort to breathe while the sunken eyes roved back and forth or rested with an envious look on those who stood about her bed up and dressed and able to breathe they were alive they belonged to life but they could help her no more than this to make the sacrifice that consisted in watching her die and the night wore on without any change how long can it go on like this asked thomas budenbroke in a low tone drawing dr grabot away to the bottom of the room while dr longhouse was undertaking some sort of injection to give relief to the patient frau permanader her handkerchief in her hand followed her brother i can't tell my dear senator answered dr grabot your dear mother may be released in the next few minutes or she may live for hours it is a process of strangulation an edema i know said frau permanader and nodded while the tears ran down her cheeks it often happens in cases of inflammation of the lungs a sort of watery fluid forms and when it gets very bad the patient cannot breathe any more yes i know the senator his hands folded looked over at the bed how frightfully she must suffer he whispered no dr grabot said just as softly but in a tone of authority while his long mild countenance wrinkled more than ever that is a mistake my dear friend believe me the consciousness is very clouded these are largely reflex motions which you see depend upon it and thomas answered god grant it but a child could have seen from the frau consul's eyes that she was entirely conscious and realized everything they took their places again consul kruger came and sat bowed over his cane at the bedside with reddened eyelids the movements of the patient increased this body delivered over to death was possessed by a terrible unrest an unspeakable craving an abandonment of helplessness from head to foot the pathetic imploring eyes now closed with the rustling movement of the head from side to side now opened with a heart-breaking expression so wide that the little veins of the eyeballs stood out blood-red and she was still conscious a little after three christian got up i can't stand it any more he said and went out limping and supporting himself on the furniture on his way to the door erika weinschenk and mademoiselle zivarine had fallen asleep to the monotonous sound of the raucous breathing and sat rosy with slumber on their chairs about four it grew much worse they lifted the patient and wiped the perspiration from her brow her breathing threatened to stop altogether let me sleep she managed to say give me a sleeping draught 
alas they could give her nothing to make her sleep suddenly she began again to reply to voices which the others could not hear yes jean not much longer now and then yes dear clara i am coming the struggle began afresh was this a wrestling with death ah no for it had become a wrestling with life for death on the part of the dying woman i want she panted i want i cannot let me sleep have mercy gentlemen let me sleep frau permenader sobbed aloud as she listened and thomas groaned softly clutching his head a moment with both hands but the physicians knew their duty they were obliged under all circumstances to preserve life just as long as possible and a narcotic would have effected an unresisting and immediate giving up of the ghost doctors were not made to bring death into the world but to preserve life at any cost there was a religious and moral basis for this law which they had known once though they did not have it in mind at the moment so they strengthened the heart action by various devices and even improved the breathing by causing the patient to retch by five the struggle was at its height the frau consul erect in convulsions with staring eyes thrust wildly about her with her arms as though trying to clutch after some support or to reach the hands which she felt stretching toward her she was answering constantly in every direction to voices which she alone heard and which evidently became more numerous and urgent not only her dead husband and daughter but her parents parents-in-law and other relatives who had passed before her into death seemed to summon her and she called them all by name though the names were some of them not familiar to her children yes she cried yes i am coming now at once a moment i cannot oh let me sleep at half-past five there was a moment of quiet and then over her aged and distorted features there passed a look of ineffable joy a profound and quivering tenderness like lightning she stretched up her arms and cried out with an immediate suddenness swift as a blow so that one felt there was not a second's space between what she heard and what she answered with an expression of absolute submission and a boundless and fervid devotion here i am and parted they were all amazed what was it who had called her to whose summons had she responded thus instantly someone drew back the curtains and put out the candles and dr grabo gently closed the eyes of the dead they all shivered in the autumn dawn that filled the room with its sallow light sister leandra covered the mirror of the toilet table with a cloth End of section eighty two